Section 1 of Hinduism and Buddhism, an Historical Sketch, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hinduism and Buddhism, an Historical Sketch, Volume 3, by Sir Charles Eliot. Book 6. Buddhism Outside India. Chapter 34. Expansion of Indian Influence. Introductory. The subject of this book is the expansion of Indian influence throughout Eastern Asia and the neighboring islands. That influence is clear and widespread, nay, almost universal, and it is with justice that we speak of further India, and the Dutch call their colonies Nederlands Indi. For some early chapters in the story of this expansion, the dates and details are meager. But on the whole, the investigator's chief difficulty is to grasp and marshal the mass of facts relating to the development of religion and civilization in this great region. The spread of Hindu thought was an intellectual conquest, not an exchange of ideas. On the northwestern frontier, there was some reciprocity, but otherwise the part played by India was consistently active and not receptive. The Far East counted for nothing in her internal history, doubtless because China was too distant, and the other countries had no special culture of their own. Still, it is remarkable that whereas many Hindu missionaries preached Buddhism in China, the idea of making Confucianism known in India seems never to have entered the head of any Chinese. It is correct to say that the sphere of Indian intellectual conquests was the East and North not the West. But still, Buddhism spread considerably to the West of its original home and entered Persia. Stein discovered a Buddhist monastery in the terminal marshes of the Helmud, in Seistan, and Bamiyan is a good distance from our frontier. But in Persia and its borderlands, there were powerful state religions, first Zoroastrianism, and then Islam, which disliked and hindered the importation of foreign creeds, and though we may see some resemblance between Sufis and Vedantists, it does not appear that Muslim civilization of Iran owed much to Hinduism. But in all Asia, north and east of India, excluding most of Siberia, but including the Malay archipelago, Indian influence is obvious. Though primarily connected with religion, it includes much more, such as architecture, painting, and other arts. An Indian alphabet, a vocabulary of Indian words borrowed or translated, legends and customs. The whole life of such diverse countries as Tibet, Burma, and Java would have been different had they no connection with India. In these and many other regions, the Hindus must have found a low state of civilization, but in the Far East they encountered a culture comparable with their own. There was no question of colonizing or civilizing rude races. India and China met as equals, not hostile, but also not congenial. A priest and a statesman, and the statesman made large concessions to the priest. Buddhism produced a great fermentation of controversy in Chinese thought, but though its fortunes varied, it hardly ever became, as in Burma and Ceylon, the national religion. It was, as a Chinese emperor once said, one of the two wings of a bird. The Chinese characters did not give way to an Indian alphabet, nor did the Confucian classics fall into desuetude. The subjects of Chinese and Japanese pictures may be Buddhist, the plan and ornaments of their temples Indian, yet, judged as works of art, the pictures and temples are indigenous. But for all that, one has only to compare the China of the Han with the China of the Tongs to see how great was the change wrought by India. This outgrowing of Indian influence, so long continued and so wide in extent, was naturally not the result of any one impulse. At no time can we see in India any passion of discovery, any fever of conquest, such as possessed Europe when the New World and the route to the east round the Cape were discovered. India's expansion was slow, generally peaceful, and attracted little attention at home. Partly it was due to the natural permeation and infiltration of a superior culture beyond its own borders. 
but it is equally natural that this gradual process should have been sometimes accelerated by force of arms. The Hindus produced no Tamerlanes or Babars, but a series of expeditions spread over long ages, but still not few in number, carry them to such distant goals as Ceylon, Java, and Cambodia. But the diffusion of Indian influence, especially in China, was also due to another agency, namely religious propaganda and the deliberate dispatch of missions. These missions seem to have been exclusively Buddhist, for wherever we find records of Hinduism outside India, for instance in Java and Cambodia, the presence of Hindu conquerors or colonists is also recorded. Hinduism accompanied Hindus, and sometimes spread round their settlements, but it never attempted to convert distant and alien lands. But the Buddhists had from the beginning the true evangelistic temper. They preached to all the world, and in singleness of purpose, they had no political support from India. Many, as were the charges brought against them by hostile Confucians, it was never suggested that they sought political or commercial privileges for their native land. It was this simple disinterested attitude which enabled Buddhism, though in many ways antipathetic to the Far East, to win its confidence. Ceylon is the first place where we have a record of the introduction of Indian civilization, and its entry there illustrates all the phenomena mentioned above, infiltration, colonization, and propaganda. The island is close to the continent, and communication with the Tamil country, easy. But though there has long been a large Tamil population with its own language, religion, and temples, the fundamental civilization is not Tamil. A Hindu called Vijaya, who apparently started from the region of Broch about 500 B.C., led an expedition to Ceylon and introduced a Western Hindu language. Intercourse with the North was doubtless maintained, for in the reign of Asoka, we find the king of Ceylon making overtures to him and receiving with enthusiasm the missionaries whom he sent. It is possible that southern India played a greater part in this conversion than the accepted legend indicates, for we hear of a monastery built by Mahinda near Tanjore. But still, Language, monuments, and tradition attest the reality of the connection with northern India. It is in Ahsoka's reign, too, that we first hear of Indian influence spreading northwards. His empire included Nepal and Kashmir. He sent missionaries to the reign of Himavanta, meaning apparently the southern slopes of the Himalaya, and to the Kambojas, an ambiguous race who were perhaps the inhabitants of Tibet or its borderlands. The Hindu Kush seems to have been the limit of his dominions. But tradition ascribes to this period the joint colonization of Khotan from India and China. Sinhalese and Burmese traditions also credit him with the dispatch of missionaries who converted Suvarnabhumi, or Pegu. No mention of this has been found in his own inscriptions, and European critics have treated it with not unnatural skepticism, for there is little indication that Asoka paid much more attention to the eastern frontiers of his empire. Still, I think the question should be regarded as being subjudice rather than as answered in the negative. Indian expeditions to the east probably commenced, if not in the reign of Ahsoka, at least before our era. The Chinese annals state that Indian embassies reached China by sea, about 50 BC, and the questions of Melinda allude to trade by this route. The Ramayana mentions Java, and an inscription seems to testify that a Hindu king was reigning in Champa, Anam, about 150 AD. These dates are not so precise as one could wish, but if there was a Hindu kingdom in that distant region in the second century, it was probably preceded by settlements in nearer halting places, such as the Isthmus of Kra or Java, at a considerably anterior date although the inscriptions discovered there are not earlier than the 5th century A.D. Java seems to have left some trace in Indian tradition. For instance, that proverb that those who go to Java do not come back, and it may have been an early distributing center for men and merchandise in those seas. But Ligor probably marks a still earlier halting place. It is on the same coast as the Mon kingdom of Thatan, 
which had connection with Conjeveram by sea, and was a center of Pali-Buddhism. At any rate, there was a movement of conquest and colonization in these regions, which brought with it Hinduism and Mahayanism, and established Hindu kingdoms in Java, Cambodia, Kampa, and Borneo, and another movement of Hinayanist propaganda, apparently earlier, but of which we know less. Though these expeditions, both secular and religious, probably took ship on the east coast of India, for example at Masula Patam, or the Seven Pagodas, yet their original starting point may have been in the west, such as the district of Badami, or even Gujarat, for there were trade routes across the Indian peninsula at an early date. It is curious that the early history of Burma should be so obscure, and in order not to repeat details and hypotheses, I refer the reader to the chapter dealing specifically with this country. From an early epoch, Upper Burma had connection with China and Bengal by land, and Lower Burma and Orissa and Conjeveram by sea. We know, too, that Pali Buddhism existed there in the 6th century, that it gained greatly in power in the reign of Anwarata, circa 1060, and that in subsequent centuries there was a close ecclesiastical connection with Ceylon. Siam, as a kingdom, is relatively modern, but like Burma, it has been subject to several influences. The Siamese probably brought some form of Buddhism with them when they descended from the north to their present territories. From the Cambodians, their neighbors and at one time their suzerains, they must have acquired some Hinduism and Mahayanism, but they ended up by adopting Hinayanism. The source was probably Pegu but learned men from Ligor were also welcomed and the ecclesiastical preeminence of Ceylon was accepted. We thus see how Indian influence conquered further India and the Malay archipelago, and we must now trace its flow across Central Asia to China and Japan, as well as the separate and later stream which irrigated Tibet and Mongolia. Tradition, as mentioned, ascribes to Ahsoka some connection with Khotan, and it is probably that by the beginning of our era, the lands of the Oxus and Taran have become Buddhist and acquired a mixed civilization in which the Indian factor was large. As usual, it is difficult to give precise dates, but Buddhism probably reached China by land a little before rather than after our era, and the prevalence of Gandharam art in the cities of the Tarim Basin makes it likely that their efflorescence was not far removed in time from the Gandaharan epoch in India. The discovery near Khotan of official documents written in Prakrit makes colonization as well as religious missions probable. Further, although the movements of Central Asian tribes commonly took the form of invading India, yet the current of culture was, on the whole, in the opposite direction. The Kushans and others brought with them a certain amount of Zoroastrian theology and Hellenistic art, but the compound resulting from the mixture of these elements with Buddhism was re-exported to the north and to China. I shall discuss below the grounds for believing that Buddhism was known in China before A.D. 62, the date when the Emperor Ming-Ti is said to have dispatched a mission to inquire about it. For some time, many of its chief luminaries were immigrants from Central Asia, and it made its most rapid progress in that disturbed period of the 3rd and 4th centuries, when North China was split up into contending Tartar states, which both in race and politics were closely connected with Central Asia. Communication with India by land became frequent, and there was also communication via the Malay archipelago, especially after the 5th century, when a double stream of Buddhist teachers began to pour into China by sea as well as by land. A third tributary joined them later, when Kublai, the Mongol conqueror of China, made Lanaism or Tibetan Buddhism, the state religion. Tibetan Buddhism is a form of late Indian Mahayanism, with a considerable admixture of Hinduism, exported from Bengal to Tibet, and there modified not so much in doctrine as by creation of a powerful hierarchy, curiously analogous to the Roman Church. It is unknown in southern China, and not much favored by the educated classes in the north, but the Lamaist priesthood enjoys great authority in Tibet and Mongolia and both the Ming and Qing dynasties did their best to conciliate it for political reasons. 
Lamaism has borrowed little from China and must be regarded as an invasion into northern Asia and even Europe of late Indian religion and art, somewhat modified by the strong idiosyncrasy of the Tibetan people. This northern movement was started by the desire of imitation, not of conquest. At the beginning of the 7th century, the king of Tibet, who had dealings with both India and China, sent a mission to the former to inquire about Buddhism, and in the 8th and 11th centuries, eminent doctors were summoned from India to establish the faith and then to restore it after a temporary eclipse. In Korea, Anam, and especially in Japan, Buddhism has been a great ethical, religious, and artistic force, and in this sense, those countries owe much to India. Yet there was little direct communication, and what they received came to them almost entirely through China. The ancient Champa was a Hindu kingdom analogous to Cambodia, but modern Anam represents not a continuation of this civilization, but a later descent of Chinese culture from the north. Japan was in close touch with the Chinese just at the period when Buddhism was fermenting their whole intellectual life, and Japanese thought and art grew up in the glow of this new inspiration, which was more intense than in China because there was no native antagonist of the same strength as Confucianism. In the following chapters, I propose to discuss the history of Indian influence in the various countries of Eastern Asia, taking Ceylon first, followed by Burma and Siam. Whatever may have been the origin of Buddhism in these two latter, they have had for many centuries a close ecclesiastical connection with Ceylon. Pali Buddhism prevails in all, as well as in modern Cambodia. The Indian religion which prevailed in ancient Cambodia was, however, of a different type and similar to that of Champa and Java. In treating of these Hindu kingdoms, I have wondered whether I should not begin with Java and adopt the hypothesis that the settlements established there sent expeditions to the mainland and Borneo. But the history of Java is curiously fragmentary, whereas the copious inscriptions of Cambodia and Champa combined with Chinese notices give a fairly continuous chronicle. And a glance at the map will show that if there were Hindu colonists at Ligor, it would have been much easier for them to go across the Gulf of Siam to Cambodia than via Java. I have therefore not adopted the hypothesis of expansion from Java, while also not rejecting it, nor followed any chronological method, but have treated of Cambodia first as being the Hindu state of which on the whole we know most and then of Champa and Java in comparison with it. In the later sections of this book, I consider the expansion of Indian influence in the North. The chapter on Central Asia endeavors to summarize our rapidly increasing knowledge of this meeting place of nations. Its history is closely connected with China, and naturally leads me to a somewhat extended review of the fortunes and achievements of Buddhism in that great land, and also to a special study of Tibet and of Lamaism. I have treated of Nepal elsewhere, for the history of religion is not a new province, but simply the extreme north of the Indian region where the last phase of decadent Indian Buddhism, which practically disappeared in Bengal, still remains a nominal existence. End of section one. Section 2 of Hinduism and Buddhism An Historical Sketch, Volume 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Usha Hinduism and Buddhism An Historical Sketch Volume 3 by Sir Charles Eliot Chapter 35 Ceylon 1. The island of Ceylon, perhaps the most beautiful tropical country in the world, lies near the end of the Indian peninsula but a little to the east. At one point a chain of smaller islands and rocks said to have been built by Rama as a passage for his army of monkeys leads to the mainland. It is therefore natural that the population should have relations with southern India. 
Sinhalese art, religion, and language show traces of Tamil influence, but it is somewhat surprising to find that in these and in all departments of civilization, the influence of northern India is stronger. The traditions which explain the connection of Ceylon with this distant region seem credible and the Sinhalese, who were often at war with the Tamils, were not disposed to imitate their usages, although juxtaposition and invasion brought about much involuntary resemblance. The school of Buddhism now professed in Ceylon, Burma and Siam is often called Sinhalese and, provided it is not implied that its doctrines originated in Ceylon, the epithet is correct. For the school ceased to exist in India and in the Middle Ages, both Burma and Siam accepted the authority of the Sinhalese Sangha. The Sinhalese school seems to be founded on the doctrines and scriptures accepted in the time of Asoka in Magadha and though the faith may have been codified and supplemented in its new home, I see no evidence that it underwent much corruption or even development. One is inclined at first to think that the Hindus having a continuous living tradition connecting them with Gautama who was himself a Hindu were more likely than these distant islanders to preserve the spirit of his teaching. But there is another side to the question. The Hindus being addicted to theological and metaphysical studies produced original thinkers who, if not able to found new religions, at least modified what their predecessors had laid down. If certain old texts were held in too high esteem to be neglected, the ingenuity of the commentator rarely failed to reinterpret them as favorable to the views popular in his time. But the Sinhalese had not this passion for theology. So far as we can judge of them in earlier periods, they were endowed with an amiable and receptive but somewhat indolent temperament moderate gifts in art and literature, and a moderate love and understanding of theology. Also, their chiefs claimed to have come from northern India and were inclined to accept favorably anything which had the same origin. These are exactly the surroundings in which a religion can flourish without change for many centuries and Buddhism in Ceylon acquired stability because it also acquired a certain national and patriotic flavor. It was the faith of the Sinhalese and not of the invading Tamils. Such Sinhalese kings as had the power protected the church and erected magnificent buildings for its service. If Sinhalese tradition may be believed, the first historical contact with northern India was the expedition of Vijaya, who with 700 followers settled in the island about the time of the Buddha's death. Many details of the story are obviously invented. Thus, in order to explain why Ceylon is called Sinhala, Vijaya is made the grandson of an Indian princess who lived with a lion. But though these legends inspire mistrust, it is a fact that the language of Ceylon in its earliest known form is a dialect closely connected with Pali, or rather with the spoken dialect from which ecclesiastical Pali was derived, and still more closely with the Maharashtri Prakrit of Western India. It is not, however, a derivative of this Prakrit but parallel to it and in some words presents older forms. It does not seem possible to ascribe the introduction of this language to the later mission of Mahinda for though Buddhist monks have in many countries influenced literature and the literary vocabulary, no instance is recorded of their changing the popular speech. But Vijaya is said to have conquered Ceylon and to have slaughtered many of its ancient inhabitants called Yakhas, of whom be no little except that Sinhalese contains 
some un-Aryan words probably borrowed from them. According to the Deepavamsa, Vijaya started from Barukacha or Broch, and both language and such historical facts as we know confirm the tradition that some time before the 3rd century BC, Ceylon was conquered by Indian immigrants from the west coast. It would not be unreasonable to suppose that Vijaya introduced into Ceylon the elements of Buddhism, but there is little evidence to indicate that it was a conspicuous form of religion in India in his time. Sinhalese tradition maintains that not only Gautama himself, but also the three preceding Buddhas were miraculously transported to Ceylon and made arrangements for its conversion. Gautama is said to have paid no less than three visits. All are obviously impossible and were invented to enhance the glory of the island. But the legends which relate how Panudu Vasudeva came from India to succeed Vijaya, how he subsequently had a Sakya princess brought over from India to be his wife and how her brothers established cities in Ceylon, if not true in detail or probably true in spirit, in so far as they imply that the Sinhalese kept up intercourse with India and were familiar with the principal forms of Indian religion. Thus, we are told that King Panudu Kabhaya built religious edifices for Niganutuhas, Jains, Brahmins, Paribhajakas, possibly Buddhist, and Ajivikas. When Devanampiyatissa ascended the throne 245 BC, he sent a complimentary mission bearing wonderful treasures to Ashoka with whom he was on friendly terms although they had never met. This implies that the kingdom of Magadha was known and respected in Ceylon and we hear that the mission included a Brahman. The answer attributed to Asoka will surprise no one acquainted with the inscriptions of that pious monarch. He said that he had taken refuge in the law of Buddha and advised the king of Ceylon to find salvation in the same way. He also sent magnificent presents consisting chiefly of royal insignia and Tissa was crowned for the second time, which probably means that he became not only the disciple but the vassal of Asoka. In any case, the records declare that the Indian emperor showed the greatest solicitude for the spiritual welfare of Ceylon and though they are obviously embellished, there is no reason to doubt their substantial accuracy. The Sinhalese tradition agrees on the whole with the data supplied by Indian inscriptions and Chinese pilgrims. The names of missionaries mentioned in the Deepa and Mahavamsas recur on urns found at Sanchi and on its gateways are pictures in relief which appear to represent the transfer of a branch of the bow tree in solemn procession to some destination which, though unnamed, may be conjectured to be Ceylon. The absence of Mahinda's name in Ashoka's inscriptions is certainly suspicious, but the Sinhalese chronicles give the names of other missionaries correctly and a mere augmentum excellentio cannot disprove their testimony on this important point. The principal repositories of Sinhalese tradition are the Deepavamsa, the Mahavamsa and the historical preface of Buddhaghosa's Samantha Pasadika. All later works are founded on these three, so far as concerns the conversion of Ceylon and the immediately subsequent period and the three works appear to be rearrangements of a single source known as the Atutuha Kata, Sihalatutuha Kata or the words of the Purana, ancients. These names were given to commentaries on the Tipituaka written in Sinhalese prose 
interspersed with polyvers and several of the greater monasteries had their own editions of them including a definite historical section it is probable that at the beginning of the 5th century AD and perhaps in the 4th century the old sinhalese in which the prose parts of the athakatha were written was growing unintelligible and that it was becoming more and more the fashion to use pali as the language of ecclesiastical literature for at least three writers set themselves to turn part of the traditions not into the vernacular but into pali the earliest and least artistic is the unknown author of the short chronicle called deepavamsa who wrote between 302 ad and 430 ad his work is weak both as a specimen of pali and as a narrative and he probably did little but patch together the pali verses occurring from time to time in the sinhalese prose of the athakatha somewhat later towards the end of the 5th century a certain mahanama arranged the materials out of which the deepavamsa had been formed in a more consecutive and artistic form combining ecclesiastical and popular legends his work known as the mahavamsa does not end with the reign of eluvara like the deepavamsa but describes in 15 more chapters the exploits of dutuhaga manav and his successors ending with mahasena the third writer buddhagosa apparently lived between the authors of the two chronicles his voluminous literary activity will demand our attention later but so far as history is concerned his narrative is closely parallel to the mahavamsa the historical narrative is similar in all three works after the council of pataliputra mogaliputta who had presided over it came to the conclusion that the time had come to dispatch missionaries to convert foreign countries sinhalese tradition represents this decision as emanating from mogaliputta whereas the inscriptions of ashoka imply that the king himself initiated the momentous project but the difference is small we cannot now tell to whom the great idea first occurred but it must have been carried out by the clergy with the assistance of ashoka the apostle selected for ceylon was his near relative mahinda who according to the traditions of the sinhalese made his way to their island through the air with six companions the account of chuang chuang hints at a less miraculous mode of progression for he speaks of a monastery built by mahinda somewhere near tanjore the legend tells how mahinda and his following alighted on the misakha mountain with their king devanam piyatissa had gone in the course of a hunt the monks and the royal cottage met mahinda after testing the king's intellectual capacity by some curious dialectical puzzles had no difficulty in converting him next morning he proceeded to anuradhapura and was received with all honor and enthusiasm he preached first in the palace and then to enthusiastic audiences of the general public in these discourses he dwelt chiefly on the terrible punishment awaiting sinners in future existences we need not follow in detail the picturesque account of the rapid conversion of the capital the king made over to the church the mahamegha garden and proceeded to construct a series of religious edifices in anuradhapura and its neighborhood the catalog of them is given in the mahavamsa and the most important was the mahavihara monastery which became specially famous and influential in the history of buddhism it was situated in the mahamegha garden close to the bow tree and was regarded as the citadel of orthodoxy its subsequent conflicts with the later abhegiri monastery are the chief theme of sinhalese ecclesiastical history and our version of the pali pitukas is the one which received its impri matur
Tissa is represented as having sent two further missions to India. The first went in quest of relics and made its way not only to Pataliputra but to the court of Indra, king of the gods, and the relics obtained of which the principal was the Buddha's arms bowl were deposited in Anuradhapura. The king then built the Thuparama Dagoba over them and there is no reason to doubt that the building which now bears this name is genuine. The story may therefore be true to the extent that relics were brought from India at this early period. The second mission was dispatched to bring a branch of the tree under which the Buddha had sat when he obtained enlightenment. This narrative is perhaps based on a more solid substratum of fact. The chronicles connect the event with the desire of the princess Anula to become a nun. Women could receive ordination only from ordained nuns and as these were not to be found on the island, it was decided to ask Asoka to send a branch of the sacred tree and also Mahinda's sister, Sangamitha, a religious of eminence. The mission was successful. A branch from the bow tree was detached, conveyed by Asoka to the coast with much ceremony and received in Ceylon by Tissa with equal respect. The princess accompanied it. The bow tree was planted in the Meghavana garden. It may still be seen and attracts pilgrims not only from Ceylon but from Burma and Siam. Unlike the buildings of Anuradhapura, it has never been entirely neglected and it is clear that it has been venerated as the bow tree from an early period of Sinhalese history. Botanists consider its long life, though remarkable, not impossible, since trees of this species throw up fresh shoots from the roots near the parent stem. The sculptures at Sanchi represent a branch of a sacred tree being carried in procession, though no inscription attests its destination. And Fa Xian says that he saw the tree. The author of the first part of the Mahavamsa clearly regards it as already ancient and throughout the history of Ceylon there are references to the construction of railings and terraces to protect it. Devanampiya Tissa probably died in 207 BC. In 177, the kingdom passed into the hands of Tamil monarchs who were not Buddhist, although the chroniclers praised their justice and the respect which they showed to the church. The most important of them, Elurara, reigned for 44 years and was dethroned by a descendant of Tissa called Dutuhaka Manu. The exploits of this prince are recorded at such length in the Mahavamsa 22-32 as to suggest that they form the subject of a separate popular epic in which he figured as the champion of Sinhalese against the Tamils and therefore as a devout Buddhist. On ascending the throne, he felt like Asoka, remorse for the bloodshed which had attended his early life and strove to atone for it by good works, especially the construction of sacred edifices. The most important of these were the Loha Pasada or Copper Palace and the Mahathupa or Ruvanveli Dagoba. The former was a monastery roofed or covered with copper plates. Its numerous rooms were richly decorated and it consisted of nine stories of which the four uppermost were set apart for arhats and the lower assigned to the inferior grades of monks. Perhaps the nine stories are an exaggeration. At any rate, the building suffered from fire and underwent numerous reconstructions and modifications. King Mahasena 301 AD, destroyed it and then, repenting of his errors, rebuilt it, but the ruins now representing it at Anuradhapura, which consist of stone pillars only, date from the reign of Parakrama Bahu I, about AD 1150. The immense pile known as the Ruvanveli Dagoba, though often injured by invaders in search of treasure, still exists. The somewhat dilapidated exterior is merely an outer shell. 
enclosing a smaller dagoba. This is possibly the structure erected by Dutuhaga Mano, though tradition says that there is a still smaller edifice inside. The foundation and building of the original structure are related at great length. Crowds of distinguished monks came to see the first stone laid, even from Kashmir and Alasandha. Some have identified the latter name with Alexandria in Egypt, but it probably denotes a Greek city on the Indus. But in any case, tradition represents Buddhists from all parts of India as taking part in the ceremony and thus recognizing the unity of Indian and Sinhalese Buddhism. Of great importance for the history of the Sinhalese church is the reign of Vatutuhaga Mano Abhaya who, after being dethroned by Tamils, recovered his kingdom and reigned for 12 years. He built a new monastery in Dagoba known as Abhegiri, which soon became the enemy of the Mahavihara and heterodox, if the latter is to be considered orthodox. The account of the schism given in the Mahavamsa is obscure, but the dispute resulted in the Pitukhas, which had hitherto been preserved orally, being committed to writing. The council which defined and edited the scriptures was not attended by all the monasteries of Ceylon, but only by the monks of the Mahavihara. And the text which they wrote down was their special version and not universally accepted. It included the Parivara, which was apparently a recent manual composed in Ceylon. The Mahavamsa says no more about this schism, but the Nikaya Sangrahava says that the monks of the Abhegiri monastery now embraced the doctrines of the Vajjiputtha school, one of the 17 branches of the Mahasanghikas, which was known in Ceylon as the Dhammaruchi school from an eminent teacher of that name. Many pious kings followed who built or repaired sacred edifices and Buddhism evidently flourished. But we also hear of heresy. In the 3rd century AD, King Vaharakathissa suppressed the Vetulyas. This sect was connected with the Abhegiri monastery. But though it lasted until the 12th century, I have found no Sinhalese account of its tenets. It is represented as the worst of heresies, which was suppressed by all orthodox kings, but again and again revived or was reintroduced from India. Though it always found a footing at the Abhegiri, it was not officially recognized as the creed of that monastery which, since the time of Vatutuhaga Mano, seems to have professed the relatively orthodox doctrine called Dhammaruchi. Mention is made in the Kathavattu of heretics who held that the Buddha remained in the Tusita heaven and that the law was preached on earth not by him but by Ananda and the commentary, ascribes these views to the Vetulyakas. The reticence of the Sinhalese chronicles makes it doubtful whether the Vetulyakas of Ceylon and these heretics are identical, but probably the monks of the Abhayagiri, if not strictly speaking Mahayanist, were an offshoot of an ancient sect which contained some germs of the Mahayana. Sun Shang, in his narrative, states, probably from hearsay, that the monks of the Mahavihara were Hinayanists, but that both vehicles were studied at the Abhegri. Ai Ching, on the contrary, says expressly that all the Sinhalese belong to the Aryasta Vira Nikaya. Fa Xian describes the Buddhism of Ceylon as he saw it about 412 AD, but does not apply to it the terms Hina or Mahayana. He evidently regarded the Abhegiri as the principal religious center and says it had 5,000 monks as against 3,000 in the Mahavihara. But though he dwells on the gorgeous ceremonial, the veneration of the sacred tooth, the representation of Gautama's previous lives and the images of Maitreya, 
he does not allude to the worship of avalokita and manjushri or to anything that can be called definitely mahayanist he describes a florid and somewhat superstitious worship which may have tended to regard the buddha as superhuman but the relics of gotama's body were its chief visible symbols and we have no ground for assuming that such teaching as is found in the lotus sutra was its theological basis yet we may legitimately suspect that the traditions of the abhyagiri remount to early prototypes of that teaching in the second and third centuries the court seems to have favored the mahavihara and king go to habaya banished monks belonging to the betulia sect but in spite of this a monk of the abhyagiri named sangamitha obtained his confidence and that of his son mahasena who occupied the throne from 275 to 302 ad the mahavihara was destroyed and its occupants persecuted at sangamitta's instigation but he was murdered and after his death the great monastery was rebuilt the triumph however was not complete for mahasena built a new monastery called jetavana on ground belonging to the mahavihara and asked the monks to abandon this portion of their territory they refused and according to the mahavamsa ultimately succeeded in proving their rights before a court of law but the jetavana remained as the headquarters of a sect known as sagaliyas they appear to have been moderately orthodox but to have had their own text of the vinaya for according to the commentary on the mahavamsa they separated the two vibhangas of the bhagava from the vinaya altering their meaning and misquoting their contents in the opinion of the mahavira both the abhyagiri and jetavana were schismatical but the laity appeared to have given their respect and offerings to all three impartially and the mahavamsa several times records how the same individual honored the three confraternities with the death of mahasena ends the first and oldest part of the mahavamsa and also in native opinion the grand period of sinhalese history the subsequent kings being known as the khulavamsa or minor dynasty a continuation of the chronicle takes up the story and tells of the doings of mahasena's son sirimegavanunwa judged by the standard of the mahavihara he was fairly satisfactory he rebuilt the loha pasada and caused a golden image of mahinda to be made and carried in procession this veneration of the founder of a local church remains one of the respect shown to the images of half defied abodes in tibet china and japan but the king did not neglect the abhyagiri or assign it a lower position than the mahavihara for he gave it partial custody of the celebrated relic known as the buddha's tooth which was brought to ceylon from kalinga in the ninth year of his reign and has ever since been considered the palladium of the island 2 it may not be amiss to consider here briefly what is known of the history of the buddha's relics and especially of this tooth of the minor distinctions between buddhism and hinduism one of the sharpest is this cultus hindu temples are often erected over natural objects supposed to resemble the footprint or some member of a deity and sometimes tombs receive veneration but no case appears to be known in which either hindus or jains show reverence to the bones or other fragments of a human body it is hence remarkable that relic worship should be so widespread in buddhism and appear so early in its history the earliest buddhist monuments depict figures worshiping at a stupa which is probably a reliquary and there is no reason to distrust the traditions which carry the practice back at least to the reign of asoka the principal cause for its prevalence was no doubt that 
Buddhism, while creating a powerful religious current, provided hardly any objects of worship for the faithful. It is also probable that the rudiments of a relic worship existed in the districts frequented by the Buddha. The account of his death states that after the cremation of his body, the mallas placed his bones in their council hall and honored them with songs and dances. Then, eight communities or individuals demanded a portion of the relics and over each portion a cairn was built. These proceedings are mentioned as if they were the usual ceremonial observed on the death of a great man and in the same sutta, the Buddha himself mentions four classes of men worthy of a cane or dugoba. We may perhaps conclude that in the earliest ages of Buddhism, it was usual in northeastern India to honor the bones of a distinguished man after cremation and inter them under a monument. This is not exactly relic worship, but it has in it the root of the later tree. The Pitukas contain little about the practice, but the Melinda Panha discusses the question at length and in one passage endeavors to reconcile two sayings of the Buddha. Hinder not yourselves by honoring the remains of the Tathagata and honor that relic of him who is worthy of honor. It is the first utterance rather than the second that seems to have the genuine ring of Gotama. The earliest known relics are those discovered in the stupa of Piprava on the borders of Nepal in 1898. Their precise nature and the date of the inscription describing them have been the subject of much discussion. Some authorities think that this stupa may be one of those erected over a portion of the Buddha's ashes after his funeral. Even Bhatt a most cautious and sceptical scholar admitted first that the inscription is not later than Asoka, secondly that the vase is a reliquary containing what were believed to be bones of the Buddha. Thus, in the time of Asoka, the worship of the Buddha's relics was well known and I see no reason why the inscription should not be anterior to that time. According to Buddha Gosa's Sumangala Vilasini and Sinhali's text, which though late are based on early material, Mahakasapa instigated Ajatasattu to collect the relics of the Buddha and to place them in a stupa there to await the advent of Asoka. In Asoka's time, the stupa had become overgrown and hidden by jungle. But when the king was in search of relics, its position was revealed to him. He found inside it an inscription authorizing him to disperse the contents and proceeded to distribute them among the 84,000 monasteries which he is said to have constructed. In its main outlines, this account is probable. Ajatasattu conquered the Lichivis and other small states to the north of Magadha and if he was convinced of the importance of the Buddha's relics, it would be natural that he should transport them to his capital, regarding them perhaps as talismans. Here they were neglected, though not damaged, in the reigns of Brahmanical kings and were rescued from oblivion by Asoka, who being sovereign of all India and anxious to spread Buddhism throughout his dominions, would be likely to distribute the relics as widely as he distributed his pillars and inscriptions. But later, Buddhist kings could not emulate this imperial impartiality and we may surmise that such a monarch as Kanishka would see to it that all the principal relics in northern India found their way to his capital. The bones discovered at Peshawar are doubtless those considered most authentic in his reign. Next to the tooth, the most interesting relic of the Buddha was his patra or arms bowl, which plays a part somewhat similar to that of the Holy Grail in Christian romance. The Mahavamsa states that Asoka sent it to Ceylon, but the Chinese pilgrim Fa Shen 
saw it at Peshawar about 405 AD. It was shown to the people daily at the midday and evening services. The pilgrim thought it contained about two pecks, yet such were its miraculous properties that the poor could fill it with a gift of a few flowers, whereas the rich cast in myriads of bushels and found there was still room for more. A few years later, Fashin heard a sermon in Ceylon in which the preacher predicted that the bowl would be taken in the course of centuries to Central Asia, China, Ceylon and Central India, whence it would ultimately ascend to the Tusita heaven for the use of the future Buddha. Later accounts to some extent record the fulfillment of these predictions in as much as they relate how the bowl or bowls passed from land to land, but the story of its wandering may have little foundation since it is combined with the idea that it is wafted from shrine to shrine according as the faith is nourishing or descendant. Chun Chang says that it had gone on from Peshawar to several countries and was now in Persia. A Mohammedan legend relates that it is at Kandahar and will contain any quantity of liquid without overflowing. Marco Polo says Kublai Khan sent an embassy in 1284 to bring it from Ceylon to China. The wanderings of the tooth, though almost as surprising as those of the bowl, rest on better historical evidence. But there is probably more continuity in the story than in the holy object of which it is related. For the piece of bone which is credited with being the left canine tooth of the blessed one may have been changed on more than one occasion. The Sinhalese chronicles, as mentioned, say that it was brought to Ceylon in the ninth year of Sirimegavanunwa. This date may be approximately correct for about 413 or later. Fa Shain described the annual festival of the tooth, during which it was exposed for veneration at the Abhegri monastery without indicating that the usage was recent. The tooth did not, according to Sinhalese tradition, form part of the relics distributed after the cremation of the Buddha. Seven bones, including four teeth, were accepted from that distribution and the sage Kima, taking the left canine tooth direct from the funeral pyre, gave it to the king of Kalinga, who enshrined it in a gorgeous temple at Dhantapura, where it is supposed to have remained 800 years. At the end of that period, a pious king named Guhasiva became involved in disastrous wars on account of the relic and, as the best means of preserving it, bade his daughter fly with her husband and take it to Ceylon. This, after some miraculous adventures, they were able to do. The tooth was received with great ceremony and lodged in an edifice called the Dhamma Chakka, from which it was taken every year for a temporary sojourn in the Abhegri monastery. The cultus of the tooth flourished exceedingly in the next few centuries and it came to be regarded as the talisman of the king and nation. Hence, when the court moved from Anuradhapura to Pollunarua, it was installed in the new capital. In the troubled times which followed, it changed its residence some 15 times. Early in the 14th century, it was carried off by the Tamils to southern India, but was recovered by Parakrama Bahu III and during the commotion created by the invasions of the Tamils, Chinese and Portuguese, it was hidden in various cities. In 1560, Dom Constantino de Bragancha, Portuguese Viceroy of Goa, led a crusade against Jaffna to avenge the alleged persecution of Christians and when the town was sacked a relic described as the tooth of an ape mounted in gold was found in a temple and carried off to Goa. On this, Bain Naung, king of Pegu, 
offered an enormous ransom to redeem it which the secular government wished to accept but the clergy and inquisition put such pressure on the viceroy that he rejected the proposal the archbishop of goa pounded the tooth in a mortar before the visirigal court burned the fragments and scattered the ashes over the sea but the singular result of this bigotry was not to destroy one sacred tooth but to create two the king of pegu who wished to marry a sinhalese princess sent an embassy to ceylon to arrange the match they were received by the king of kota who bore the curiously combined name of don juan dharmapala he had no daughter of his own but palmed off the daughter of a chamberlain at the same time he informed the king of pegu that the tooth destroyed at goa was not the real relic and that this still remained in his possession bai naung was induced to marry the lady and received the tooth with appropriate ceremonies but when the king of kandy heard of these doings he apprised the king of pegu of the double trick that had been played on him he offered him his own daughter a veritable princess in marriage and as her dowry the true tooth which he said was neither that destroyed at goa nor yet that sent to pegu but one in his own possession by knowing received the kandian embassy politely but rejected its proposals thinking no doubt that it would be awkward to declare the first tooth spurious after it had been solemnly installed as a sacred relic the second tooth therefore remained in kandy and appears to be that now venerated there when vimala dharma reestablished the original line of kings about 1592 it was accepted as authentic as to its authenticity it appears to be beyond doubt that it is a piece of discolored bone about 2 inches long which could never have been the tooth of an ordinary human being so that even the faithful can only contend that the buddha was of superhuman stature whether it is the relic which was venerated in ceylon before the arrival of the portuguese is a more difficult question for it may be argued with equal plausibility that the sinhalese had good reasons for hiding the real tooth and good reasons for duplicating it the strongest argument against the authenticity of the relic destroyed by the portuguese is that it was found in jaffna which had long been a tamil town whereas there is no reason to believe that the real tooth was at this time in tamil custody but although the native literature always speaks of it as unique the sinhalese appear to have produced replicas more than once for we hear of such being sent to burma and china again the offer to ransom the tooth came not from ceylon but from the king of pegu who as the sequel shows was gullible in such matters the portuguese clearly thought that they had acquired a relic of primary importance on any hypothesis one of the kings of ceylon must have deceived the king of pegu and finally vimala dharma had the strongest political reasons for accepting as genuine the relic kept at kandy since the possession of the true tooth went far to substantiate a sinhalese monarch's right to the throne the tooth is now preserved in a temple at kandy the visitor looking through a screen of bars can see on a silver table a large jeweled case shaped like a bell flowers scattered on the floor or piled on other tables fill the chamber with their heavy perfume inside the bell are six other bells of diminishing size the innermost of which covers a golden lotus containing the sacred tooth but it is only on rare occasions that the outer caskets are removed worshippers as a rule have to content themselves with offering flowers and bowing but i was informed that the priests celebrate puja daily before the relic the ceremony comprises the consecration and distribution of rice 
and is interesting as connecting the veneration of the tooth with the ritual observed in Hindu temples. But we must return to the general history of Buddhism in Ceylon. End of section 2 Recording by Usha Section 3 of Hinduism and Buddhism An Historical Sketch, Volume 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Seema Parakyat Hinduism and Buddhism An Historical Sketch, Volume 3 by Charles Eliot Chapter 35 Ceylon 3 the kings who ruled in the 5th century were devout Buddhists and builders of viharas. But the most important event of this period, not merely for the island, but for the whole Buddhist church in the south, was the literary activity of Buddhaghosa, who is said to have resided in Ceylon during the reign of Mahanama. The chief authorities for his life are a passage in the continuation of the Mahavamsa and Buddha Goshupati, a late Burmese text of about 1550, which, while adding many anecdotes, appears not to come from an independent source. The gist of their account is that he was born in a Brahmin family near Gaya and early obtained renown as a disputant. He was converted to Buddhism by a monk named Revata and began to write theological treatises. Revata, observing his intention to compose a commentary on the Pitakas, told him that only the text, Palimattam, of the scriptures was to be found in India, not the ancient commentaries, but that the Sinhalese commentaries were genuine, having been composed in that language by Mahinda. He therefore bade Buddhaghosa repair to Ceylon and translate these Sinhalese works into the idiom of Magadha, by which Pali must be meant. Buddhaghosa took this advice and there is no reason to distrust the statement of the Mahavamsa that he arrived in the reign of Mahanama, who ruled according to Giga, from 458 to 480, though the usual reckoning places him about 50 years earlier. The fact that Fashian, who visited Ceylon about 412, does not mention Buddha Gosa, is in favour of Giga's chronology. He first studied in the Mahavihara and eventually requested permission to translate the Sinhalese commentaries. To prove his competence for the task, he composed and celebrated Vishuddhimagga, and this being considered satisfactory, he took up his residence in the Gantakara Vihara and proceeded to work of translation. When it was finished, he returned to India, or according to the Thalang tradition, to Thatun. The Buddha Gosupati adds two stories of which the truth and meaning are equally doubtful. They are that Buddha Gosa burned the works written by Mahinda and that his knowledge of Sanskrit was called in question but triumphantly proved. Can there be here any allusion to a Sanskrit canon supported by the opponents of the Mahavihara? Even in its main outline, the story is not very coherent for one would imagine that if a Buddhist from Magadha went to Ceylon to translate the Sinhalese commentaries, his object must have been to introduce them among Indian Buddhists. But there is no evidence that Buddha Gosa did this, and he is for us simply a great figure in the literary and religious history of Ceylon. Burmese tradition maintains that he was a native of Thatan and returned thither when his labours in Ceylon were completed to spread the scriptures in his native language. This version of his activity is intelligible, though the evidence for it is weak. He composed a great corpus of exegetical literature which has been preserved, but since much of it is still unedited, the precise extent of his labours is uncertain. There is, however, little doubt of the authenticity of his commentaries on the four great Nikayas, on the Abhidhamma, and on the Vinaya called Samantha Pasadiga, and in them he refers to the Vishuddhi Magga as his own work. He says expressly that his explanations are founded on Sinhalese materials, which he frequently cites as the opinion of the ancients, Purana. By this word, he probably means traditions recorded in Sinhalese and attributed to Mahinda, 
but it is in any case clear that the works which he consulted were considered old in the 5th century AD. Some of their names are preserved in the Samanta Pasadiga, where he mentions the great commentary, Maha Atagata, the raft commentary, Picari so called because written on a raft, the Kurundi commentary, composed at Kurundavelu, and others. All this literature has disappeared and we can only judge of it by Buddha Gosa's reproduction, which is probably not a translation, but a selection and rearrangement. Indeed, his occasional direct quotations from the ancients or from an Atakada imply that the rest of the work is merely based on the Sinhalese commentaries. Buddha Gosa was not an independent thinker, but he makes amends for his want of originality not only by his industry and learning, but by his power of grasping and expounding the whole of an intricate subject. His Vishuddhimagga has not yet been edited in Europe, but the extracts and copious analysis which have been published indicate that it is a comprehensive restatement of Buddhist doctrine made with as free a hand as orthodoxy permitted. The Mahavamsa observes that the Theras held his works in the same estimation as the Pitakas. They are in no way coloured by the Mahayana's tenets, which were already prevalent in India, but state in its severest form the Hinayana's creed of which he is the most authoritative exponent. The Vishuddhimagga is divided into three parts, treating of conduct, Selam, meditation, Samadhi, and knowledge, Panna, the first being the necessary substratum for the religious life of which the others are the two principal branches. But though he intersperses his exposition with miraculous stories and treats exhaustively of superhuman powers, no trace of the worship of Mahayana's bodhisattvas is found in his works and as for literature, he himself is the chief authority for the genuineness and completeness of the Pali Canon as we know it. When we find it said that his works were esteemed as highly as the Pitakas, or that the documents which he translated into Pali were the words of the Buddha, the suspicion naturally arises that the Pali Canon may be in part his composition, and it may be well to review briefly its history in Ceylon. Our knowledge appears to be derived entirely from the traditions of the Mahavihara, which represent Mahinda as teaching the text of the Pitakas orally, accompanied by a commentary. If we admit the general truth of the narrative concerning Mahinda's mission, there is nothing improbable in these statements, for it would be natural that an Indian teacher should know by heart his sacred texts and the commentaries on them. We cannot of course assume that the Pitakas of Mahinda were the Pali Canon as we know it, but the inscriptions of Ashoka refer to passages which can be found in that canon and therefore parts of it at any rate must have been accepted as scripture in the 3rd century BC. But it is probable that the considerable radiation was permitted in the text, although the sense and a certain terminology were carefully guarded. It was not till the reign of Vatagamani, probably about 20 BC, that the canon was committed to writing and the Parivara composed in Ceylon was included in it. In the reign of Buddha Dasa, a learned monk named Mahadamakati is said to have translated the suttas into Sinhalese, which at this time was esteemed the proper language for letters and theology. But in the next century, a contrary tendency, probably initiated by Buddha Gosa, becomes apparent and Sinhalese works are rewritten in Pali. But nothing indicates that any part of what we call the Pali Canon underwent this process. Buddha Gosa distinguishes clearly between text and comment, between Pali and Sinhalese documents. He has a coherent history of the text beginning with the Council of Rajagaha. He discusses various readings. He explains difficult words. He treated the ancient commentaries with freedom, but there is no reason to think that he allowed himself any discretion or right of selection in dealing with the sacred texts accepted by the Mahavihara though it might be prudent to await the publication of his commentaries on all the Nikayas before asserting this unreservedly. To sum up, 
The available evidence points to the conclusion that in the time of Ashoka, texts and commentaries preserved orally were brought to Ceylon. The farmer, though in a somewhat fluid condition, was sufficiently sacred to be kept unchanged in the original Indian language. The latter were translated into the kindred, but still distinct vernacular of the island. In the next century and a half, some additions to the Pali texts were made and about 20 BC, the Mahavihara, which proved as superior to the other communities in vitality as it was in antiquity, caused written copies to be made of what is considered as the canon, including some recent works. There is no evidence that Buddha Gosa or anyone else enlarged or curtailed the canon, but the curious tradition that he collected and burned all the books written by Mahinda in Sinhalese may allude to the existence of other works which he, presumably in agreement with the Mahavihara, considered spurious. Soon after the departure of Buddha Gosa, Datusena came to the throne and held, like Dhamasoka, a convocation about the three Pitakas. This implies that there was still some doubt as to what was scripture and that the canon of the Mahavihara was not universally accepted. The Vetulyas, of whom we heard in the 3rd century AD, reappear in the 7th when they are said to have been supported by a provincial governor but not by the king Agabodi, and still more explicitly in the reign of Parakrama Bahu, c. 1160. He endeavoured to reconcile to the Mahavihara, the Abhayagiri brethren who separated themselves from the time of King Vattagamani Abhaya and the Jetavana brethren that had parted since the days of Mahasena and taught the Vetulla Pitaka and other writings as the words of Buddha which indeed were not the words of Buddha. So it appears that another recension of the canon was in existence for many centuries. Datusena, though depicted in Mahavamsa as the most orthodox monarch, embellished the Abhyagiri monastery and was addicted to sumptuous ceremonies in honour of images and relics. In an image chamber, apparently at the Abhyagiri, he set up figures of bodhisattvas by which we should perhaps understand the previous births of Gotama. He was killed by his son and Sinhali's history degenerated into a complicated story of crime and discard, in which the weaker faction generally sought the aid of the Tamils. These latter became more and more powerful and with their advance, Buddhism tended to give place to Hinduism. In the 8th century, the court removed from Anuradhapura to Polanaruva in order to escape from the pressure of the Tamils. But the picture of anarchy and decadence grows more and more gloomy until the accession of Vijayabahu in 1071, who succeeded in making himself king of all Ceylon. Though he recovered Anuradhapura, it was not made the royal residence either by himself or by his great successor Parakramabahu. This monarch, the most eminent in the long list of Ceylon sovereigns, after he had consolidated his power, devoted himself, in the words of Tennant, to the two grand objects of royal solicitude, religion and agriculture. He was lavish in building monasteries, temples and libraries, but not less generous in constructing or repairing tanks and works of irrigation. In the reign of Vijayabahu, Hardly any duly ordained monks were to be found, the succession having been interrupted and the deficiency was supplied by bringing qualified theras from Burma. But by the time of Parakrama Bahu, the old quarrels of the monasteries revived and as he was anxious to secure unity, he summoned a synod at Anuradhapura. It appears to have attained its object by recognizing the Mahavihara as a standard of orthodoxy and dealing summarily with dissensions. The secular side of monastic life also received liberal attention. Lands, revenues and guest houses were provided for the monasteries as well as hospitals. As in Burma and Siam, Brahmins were respected and the king erected a building for their use in the capital. Like Ashoka, he forbade the killing of animals. 
But the glory of Parakrama Bahu stands up in the later history of Ceylon like an isolated peak and 30 years after his death, the country had fallen almost to its previous low level of prosperity. The Tamils again occupied many districts and were never entirely dislodged as long as the Sinhalese kingdom lasted. Buddhism tended to decline, but was always the religion of the national party and was honoured with as much magnificence as their means allowed. Parakrama Bahu II, century 1240, who recovered the sacred tooth from the Tamils, is said to have celebrated splendid festivals and to have imported learned monks from the country of the Kolas. Towards the end of the 15th century, the inscriptions of Kalyani indicate that Sinhalese religion enjoyed a great reputation in Burma. A further change at birth to Buddhism was occasioned by the arrival of Portuguese in 1505. A long and horrible struggle ensued between them and the various kings among whom the distracted island was divided, until at the end of the 16th century only Kandy remained independent, the whole coast being in the hands of the Portuguese. The singular barbarities which they perpetrated throughout this struggle are vouched for by their own historians. But it does not appear that the Sinhalese degraded themselves by similar atrocities. Since the Portuguese wished to propagate Roman Catholicism as well as to extend their political rule, and used for this purpose, according to the Mahavamsa, the persuasions of gold as well as the terrors of torture, it's not surprising if many Sinhalese professed allegiance to Christianity. But when, in 1597, the greater part of Ceylon formally accepted Portuguese sovereignty, the chiefs insisted that they should be allowed to retain their own religion and customs. The Dutch first appeared in 1602 and were welcomed by the court of Kandy as allies capable of expelling the Portuguese. This they succeeded in doing by a series of victories between 1638 and 1658 and remained masters of a great part of the island until their possessions were taken by the British in 1795. Kandy, however, continued independent until 1815. At first, Dutch tried to enforce Christianity and to prohibit Buddhism within their territory but ultimately, hatred of the Roman Catholic Church made them favourable to Buddhism, and they were ready to assist those kings who desired to restore the national religion to its former splendour. Ceylon Part 4 In spite of this assistance, the centuries when the Sinhalese were contending with Europeans were not a prosperous time for Buddhism. Hinduism spread in the north, Christianity in the coastal belt, but still, it was a point of honour with most native sovereigns to protect the national religion so far as their distressed condition allowed. For the 17th century, we have an interesting account of the state of the country called An Historical Relation of the Island of Ceylon by an Englishman, Robert Knox, who was detained by the King of Kandy from 1660 to 1680. He does not seem to have been aware that there was any distinction between Buddhism and Hinduism. Though he describes the Sinhalese as idolaters, he also emphasizes the fact that Buddha, as he writes the name, is God, unto whom the salvation of souls belongs, and for whom, above all others, they have a high respect and devotion. He also describes the ceremonies of Perit and Bana, the Perahira procession, and two classes of Buddhist monks, the elders and the ordinary members of the Sangha. His narrative indicates that Buddhism was accepted as a higher religion, though men were prone to pray to deities who would save them from temporal danger. About this time, Vimala Dharma too made great efforts to improve the religious condition of the island, and finding that the true succession had again failed, arranged with the Dutch to send an embassy to Arakan, and bring back qualified theras. But apparently the steps taken were not sufficient, for when King Kidisiri Rajasiha, 1747-81, whose piety forms the theme of the last two chapters of the Mahavamsa, set about reforming the Sangha, he found that duly ordained monks were extinct and that many so-called monks had families. 
He therefore decided to apply to Dhamika, king of Ayutthaya in Siam, and like his predecessor, dispatched an embassy on a Dutch ship. Dhamika sent back a company of more than ten monks, that is more than sufficient for the performance of all ecclesiastical acts, under Abbot Upali in 1752. and another to relieve it in 1755 they were received by the king of ceylon with great honor and subsequently by the ordination which they conferred placed the succession beyond dispute but the order thus reconstituted was aristocratic and exclusive only members of the highest caste were admitted to it and the wealthy middle classes found themselves excluded from a community which they were expected to honor and maintain This led to the dispatch of an embassy to Burma in 1802 and to the foundation of another branch of the Sangha known as the Amarapura School distinct in so far as its validity depended on Burmese not Siamese ordination since ordination is for Buddhists merely self dedication to a higher life and does not confer any sacramental or sacerdotal powers the importance assigned to it may seem strange but the idea goes back to the oldest records in the vinaya and has its root in the privileges accorded to the order a bhikkhu had a right to expect much from the laity but he also had to prove his worth and the gotama's early legislation was largely concerned with excluding unsuitable candidates the solicitude for valid ordination was only the ecclesiastical form of the popular feeling that the honors and immunities of the order were conditional on its maintaining a certain standard of conduct other methods of reform might have been devised but the old injunction that a monk could be admitted only by other duly ordained monks was fairly efficacious and could not be disputed but the curious result is that though ceylon was in early times the second home of buddhism almost all if indeed not all the monks found there now derive their right to the title of bhikkhu from foreign countries the sinhala sangha is generally described as divided into four schools those of siam kelani amarapura and brahmanya of which the first two are practically identical kelani being simply a separate province of the siamese school which otherwise has its headquarters in the inland districts this school founded as mentioned above by priests who arrived in 1750 comprises about half of the whole sangha and has some pretensions to represent the hierarchy of ceylon since the last kings of kandy gave to the heads of the two great monasteries in the capital asgiri and malwate jurisdiction over the north and south of the island respectively It differs in some particulars from the Amarapura school. It only admits members of the highest caste and prescribes that monks are to wear the upper robe over one shoulder only, whereas the Amarapurans admit members of the first three castes, but not those lower in the social scale, and require both shoulders to be covered. There are other minor differences among which it is interesting to note. that the cme school object to the use of the formula i dedicate this gift to the buddha which is used in the other schools when anything is presented to the order for the use of the monks it is held that this expression was correct in the lifetime of the buddha but not after his death the two schools are not mutually hostile and members of each find a hospitable reception in the monasteries of the other The laity patronize both indifferently and both frequent the same places of pilgrimage though all of these and the majority of the temple lands belong to the sect of Siam it is wealthy aristocratic and has inherited the ancient traditions of Ceylon whereas the Amarapurans are more active and inclined to propaganda it is said they are the chief allies of the theosophists and european buddhists The Ramanya school is more recent and distinct than the others, being in some ways a reformed community. It aims at greater strictness of life, forbidding monasteries to hold property and insisting on genuine poverty. It also totally rejects the worship of Hindu deities, and its lay members do not recognize the monks of other schools. 
It is not large, but its influence is considerable. It has been said that Buddhism flourished in Ceylon only when it was able to secure the royal favour. There is some truth in this, for the Sangha does not struggle on its own behalf, but expects the laity to provide for its material needs, making a return in educational and religious services. Such a body, if not absolutely dependent on royal patronage, has at least much to gain from it. Yet this admission must not blind us to the fact that during its long and often distinguished history, Sinhalese Buddhism has been truly the national faith as opposed to the beliefs of various invaders and has also ministered to the spiritual aspirations of the nation. As Knox said in a period when it is not particularly flourishing, the Hindu gods look after worldly affairs but Buddha after the soul. When the island passed under the British rule and all religions received impartial recognition, the result was not disastrous to Buddhism. The number of bhikkhus greatly increased, especially in the latter half of the 19th century. And if in earlier periods there was an interval in which, technically speaking, the Sangha did not exist, this did not mean that interest in it ceased. For as soon as the kingdom became prosperous, the first care of the kings was to set the church in order. This zeal can be attributed to nothing but conviction and affection, for Buddhism is not a faith politically useful to an energetic and warlike prince. Ceylon Part 5 Sinhalese Buddhism is often styled primitive or original, and it may fairly be said to preserve in substance both the doctrine and practice inculcated in the earliest Pali literature. In calling this primitive, we must remember the possibility that some of this literature was elaborated in Ceylon itself. But putting the text of the Pitakas aside, it would seem that the early Sinhalese Buddhism was the same as that of Ashoka, and that it never underwent any important change. It is true that medieval Sinhalese literature is full of supernatural legends respecting the Buddha, but still he does not become a god for he has attained nirvana, and the great bodhisattvas, Avalokita and Manchusri are practically unknown. The Abhidhamata Sangaha, which is still the textbook most in use among the bhikkhus, adheres rigidly to the methods of the Abhidhamma. It contains neither devotional nor magical matter, but prescribes a course of austere mental training, based on psychological analysis and culminating in the rapture of meditation. Such studies and exercises are beyond the capacity of the majority, but no other road to salvation is officially sanctioned for the bhikkhu. It is admitted that there are no arhats now, just as Christianity has no contemporary saints. But no other ideal, such as the bodhisattva of the Mahayanist, is held up for imitation. Medieval images of Avalokita and of goddesses have, however, been found in Ceylon. This is hardly surprising, for the island was on the main road to China, Java, and Cambodia, and Mahayana's teachers and pilgrims must have continually passed through it. The Chinese biographies of that eminent tantrist, Amoka, say that he went to Ceylon in 741 and elaborated its system there before returning to China. It is said that in 1408, the Chinese being angry at the ill-treatment of envoys, whom they had sent to the Shrine of the Tooth, conquered Ceylon and made it pay tribute for 50 years. By conquest, no doubt, is meant merely a military success and not occupation. But the whole story implies possibilities of acquaintance with Chinese Buddhism. It is clear that, though the Hinayana's church was predominant throughout the history of the island, there were up to the 12th century heretical sects called Vaitulya, or Vetulyaka and Vajira, which, though hardly rivals of orthodoxy, were a thorn in its side. A party at the Abhayagiri monastery were favorably disposed to the Vaitulya sect, which, though often suppressed, recovered and reappeared, being apparently reinforced from India. This need not mean from southern India, for Ceylon had regular intercourse with the north, and perhaps the Vaitulyas were Mahayanas from Bengal. 
The Nikaya Sangrahava also mentions that in the 9th century, there was a sect called Nila Bharta Darsana, who wore blue robes and preached indulgence in wine and love. They were possibly tantras from the north, but were persecuted in southern India and never influential in Ceylon. The Mahavamsa is inclined to minimize the importance of all sects compared with the Mahavihara, but the picture given by the Nikaya Sangrahava may be more correct. It says that the Vaitulyas, described as infidel Brahmins, who had composed the Pitaka of their own, made four attempts to obtain a footing at the Abhayagiri monastery. In the 9th century, it represents King Madhpalasen as having to fly because he had embraced the false doctrine of the Vajras. These are mentioned in another passage in connection with the Vaitulyas. They are said to have composed the Gurdha Vinaya and many Tantras. They perhaps were connected with the Vajrayana, a face of Tantric Buddhism. But a few years later, King Mungain Sen set the church in order. He recognized the three orthodox schools or Nikayas called Theria, Damarusi and Sagaliya, but prescribed the others and set guards on the coast to prevent the importation of heresy. Nevertheless, the Vajiriya and Vaitulya doctrines were secretly practiced. An inscription in Sanskrit found at the Jetavana and attributed to the 9th century records the foundation of a Vihara for a hundred resident monks, 25 from each of the four Nikayas, which it appears to regard as equivalent. But in 1165, the great Parakrama Bahu held a synod to restore unity in the church. As a result, all Nikayas, even the Dhamma Rusi, which did not conform to the Mahavihara, were suppressed, and we hear no more of the Vaitulyas and Vajiriyas. Thus, there was once a Mahayanist faction in Ceylon, but it was recruited from abroad, intermittent in activity, and was finally defeated, whereas the Hinayanist tradition was national and continuous. Considering the long lapse of time, the monastic life of Ceylon has not yet deviated much in practice from the injunctions of the Vinaya. Monasteries like those of Anuradhapura, which are said to have contained thousands of monks, no longer exist. The largest now to be found, those at Kandy, do not contain more than 50, but as a rule, a pansala, as these institutions are now called, has not more than five residents and more often only two or three. Some pansalas have villages assigned to them and some let their lands and do not scruple to receive the rent. The monks still follow the ancient routine of making a daily round with a begging bowl. But the food thus collected is often given to the poor or even to animals and the inmates of the pansala eat a meal which has been cooked there. The patimokha is recited at least in part, twice a month and ordinations are held annually. The duties of bhikkhus are partly educational, partly clerical. In most villages, the children receive elementary education gratis in the pansala, and the preservation of the ancient text together with a long list of Pali and Sinhalese works produced until recent times almost exclusively by members of the Sangha is a proof that it has not neglected literature. The chief public religious observances are preaching and reading the scriptures. This latter, known as Bana, is usually accompanied by a word-for-word -word translation made by the reciter or an assistant. Such recitations may form part of the ordinary ceremonial of Uposatha days and most religious establishments have a room where they can be held, but often monks are invited to reside in a village during Vas. July to October and read Bana, and often a layman performs a pinkama or act of merit by entertaining monks for several days and inviting his neighbours to hear them recite. The recitation of the Jatakas is particularly popular, but the suttas of the Dhigha Nikaya are also often read. On special occasions, such as entry into a new house, an eclipse, or any incident which suggests that it might be well to ward off the enmity of supernatural powers, it is usual to recite a collection of texts taken largely from the Sutta Nipata and called Pirit. 
The word appears to be derived from the Pali paritha, a defense. And though the Pali scriptures do not sanction this use of the Buddha's discourses, they countenance the idea that evil may be averted by the use of formulae. Although Sinhalese Buddhism has not diverged much from the Pali scriptures in its main doctrines and discipline, yet it tolerates a superstructure of Indian beliefs and ceremonies which forbid us to call it pure except in a restricted sense. At present, there may be said to be three religions in Ceylon. Local animism, Hinduism and Buddhism are all inextricably mixed together. By local animism, I mean the worship of native spirits who do not belong to the ordinary Hindu pantheon, though they may be identified with its members. The priests of this worship are called Kapuralas and one of their principal ceremonies consists in dancing until they are supposed to be possessed by a spirit, the devil dancing of Europeans. Though this religion is distinct from ordinary Hinduism, its deities and ceremonies find parallels in the southern Tamil country. In Ceylon, it is not merely a village superstition, but possesses temples of considerable size, for instance at Badula and near Ratnapura. In the latter, there is a Buddhist shrine in the courtyard, so that the Blessed One may countenance the worship, much as the Pitakas represent him as patronizing and instructing the deities of ancient Magadha, but the structure and observances of the temple itself are not Buddhist. The chief spirit worshipped at Ratnapura and in most of these temples is Mahasaman, the god of Adam's peak. He is sometimes identified with Lakshmana, the brother of Rama and sometimes with Indra. About a quarter of the population are Tamils professing Hinduism. Hindu temples of the ordinary Dravidian type are especially frequent in the northern districts, but they are found in most parts and at Kandy, two may be seen close to the shrine of the tooth. Buddhists feel no scruple in frequenting them and the images of Hindu deities are habitually introduced into Buddhist temples. These often contain a hall, at the end of which are one or more sitting figures of the Buddha, on the right hand side a recumbent figure of him, but on the left a row of four statues representing Mahabrahma, Vishnu, Kartikeya and Mahasaman. Of these, Vishnu generally receives market attention, shown by the number of prayers written on the slips of paper which are attached to his hand. Nor is his worship found merely as a survival in the older temples. The four figures appear in the newest edifices and the image of Vishnu never fails to attract votaries. Yet, though a rigid Buddhist may regard such devotion as dangerous, it is not reasonable. For Vishnu is regarded not as a competitor, but as a very reverent admirer of the Buddha and anxious to befriend good Buddhists. Even more insidious is the pageantry which since the days of King Tissa has been the outward sign of religion. It may be justified as being merely an edifying method of venerating the memory of a great man, but when images and relics are treated with profound reverence or carried in solemn procession, it is hard for the ignorant, especially if they are accustomed to the ceremonial of Hindu temples, not to think that these symbols are divine. This ornate ritualism is not authorized in any known canonical text, but it is thoroughly Indian. Ashoka records in his inscriptions the institution of religious processions, and Suan Chuang relates how King Harsha organized a festival during which an image of the Buddha was carried on an elephant while the monarch and his ally, the king of Assam, dressed as Indra and Brahma respectively, waited on it like servants. Such festivities were congenial to the Sinhalese, as is attested by the long series of descriptions which fill the Mahavamsa down to the very last book, by what Fashian saw about 412 and by the Perahira festival celebrated today. Ceylon 6 The Buddhism of southern India resembled that of Ceylon in character, though not in history. It was introduced under the auspices of Ashoka, who mentions in his inscriptions the Kolas, Pandyas and Kerala Putras. Suan Chuang says that in the Malakuta country, somewhere near Madura or Tanjore, 
There was a stupa erected by Ashoka's orders and also a monastery founded by Mahinda. It is possible that this apostle and others labored less in Ceylon and more in South India than is generally supposed. The preeminence and continuity of Sinhalese Buddhism are due to the conservative temper of the natives who were relatively little moved by the winds of religion which blew strong in the mainland, bearing with them now Jainism, now the worship of Vishnu or Shiva. In the Tamil country, Buddhism of an Ashokan type appears to have been prevalent about the time of our era. The poem Mani Megali, which by general consent was composed in an early century AD, is Buddhist but shows no leanings to Mahayanism. It speaks of Shivaism and many other systems as flourishing but contains no hint that Buddhism was persecuted. But persecution are at least very unfavorable conditions set in. Since at the time of Swang Xuan's visit, Buddhism was in an advanced stage of decadence. It seems probable that the triumph of Shivaism began in the 3rd or 4th century and that Buddhism offered slight resistance, Jainism being the only serious competitor for the first place. But for a long while, perhaps even until the 16th century, monasteries were kept up in special centers and one of these is of peculiar importance, namely Kanchipuram or Kanjevaram. Swan Chuang found there 100 monasteries with more than 10,000 brethren, all Stavira's, and mentioned that it was the birthplace of Dharmapala. We have some further information from the Telang Chronicles, which suggests the intersecting hypothesis that the Buddhism of Burma was introduced or refreshed by missionaries from southern India. They give a list of teachers who flourished in that country, including Kagiyana and the philosopher Anuradha. Of Dharmapala, they say that he lived at the monastery of Bhadra Tita near Kanchipura and wrote 14th commentaries in Pali. One was on the Vishuddhimaga of Buddha Gosa, and it is probable that he lived shortly after that great writer and, like him, studied in Ceylon. I shall recur to this question of South Indian Buddhism in treating of Burma, but the data now available are very meagre. End of section 3 Recording by Seema Parikyat Section 4 of Hinduism and Buddhism An Historical Sketch, Volume 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Seema Until recent times, Burma remained somewhat isolated and connected with foreign countries by a few ties. The chronicles contain a record of long and generally peaceful intercourse with Ceylon. But this, though important for religion and literature, had little political effect. The Chinese occasionally invaded Upper Burma and demanded tribute, but the invasions were brief and led to no permanent occupation. On the west, Arakan was worried by the viceroys of the Mughal emperors, and on the east, the Burmese frequently invaded Siam. But otherwise, from the beginning of authentic history until the British annexation, Burma was left to itself and had not, like so many Asiatic states, to submit to foreign conquest and the imposition of foreign institutions. Yet, let it not be supposed that its annals are peaceful and uneventful. The land supplied its own complications. For of the many races inhabiting it, three, the Burmese, Telangs, and Shans, had rival aspirations and founded dynasties. Of these three races, the Burmese proper appear to have come from the northwest, for a chain of tribes speaking cognate languages is said to extend from Burma to Nepal. The Mons or Talangs are allied linguistically to the Khmers of Cambodia. Their country, sometimes called Ramanadesa, was in Lower Burma and its principal cities were Pegu and Thatan. The identity of the name Talang with Telangana or Kalinga is not admitted by all scholars, but native tradition connects the foundation of the kingdom with the east coast of India and it seems certain that such a connection existed in historical times and kept alive Hinayana's Buddhism, which may have been originally introduced by this route. 
The Shan states lie in the east of Burma on the borders of Yunnan and Laos. Their traditions carry their foundation back to the 4th and 5th century BC. There is no confirmation of this, but bodies of Shans, a race allied to the Siamese, may have migrated into this region at any date, perhaps bringing Buddhism with them or receiving it direct from China. Recent investigations have shown that there was also a fourth race, designated as Peus, who occupied territory between the Burmese and Telangs in the 11th century. They will probably prove of considerable importance for philology and early history, perhaps even for the history of some phases of Burmese Buddhism. For the religious terms found in their inscriptions are Sanskrit rather than Pali, and this suggests direct communication with China. But until more information is available, any discussion of this interesting but mysterious people involves so many hypotheses and arguments of detail that it is impossible in a work like the present. Prom was one of their principal cities, their name reappears in Piao, the old Chinese designation of Burma and perhaps also in Pagan, one form of which is Pugama. Throughout the historical period, the preeminence both in individual kings and dynastic strength rested with the Burmese, but their contests with the Shans and Telangs form an intricate story which can be related here only in outline. Though the three races are distinct and still preserve their languages, yet they conquered one another, lived in each other's capitals and shared the same ambition so that in more recent centuries no great change occurred when new dynasties came to power or territory was redistributed. The long chronicle of blood-stained but ineffectual quarrels is relived by the exploits of three great kings, Anavratha, Bainaung, and Alompra. Historically, Arakan may be detached from the other provinces. The inhabitants represent an early migration from Tagaung and were not annexed by any kingdom in Burma until 1784 AD. Tagaung, situated on the upper Irrawaddy in the Ruby Mines district, was the oldest capital of the Burmese and has a scanty history, apparently going back to the early centuries of our era. Much the same may be said of the Telang kingdom in Lower Burma. The kings of Tagong were succeeded by another dynasty connected with them which reigned at Prom. No dates can be given for these events, nor is the part which the Pews played in them clear. But it is said that the Telangs destroyed the kingdom of Prom in 742 AD. According to the tradition, the center of power moved about this time to Pagan, on the bank of the Irrawaddy, somewhat south of Mandalay. But the silence of early Chinese accounts as to Pagan, which is not mentioned before the Song dynasty, makes it probable that the later writers exaggerated its early importance, and it is only when Anavratha, king of Pagan, and the first great name in Burmese history, ascended the throne that the course of events became clear and coherent. He conquered Thetan in 1057, and transported many of the inhabitants to his own capital. He also subdued the nearer Shan states and was master of nearly all Burma as we understand the term. The chief work of his successors was to construct the multitude of pagodas, which still ornament the site of Pagan. It would seem that the dynasty gradually degenerated and that the Shans and Talangs acquired strength at its expense. Its end came in 1298 and was hastened by the invasion of Kubilai Khan. There then arose two simultaneous Shan dynasties at Panya and Sagang, which lasted from 1298 till 1364. They were overthrown by King Tadomin Paya, who is believed to have been a Shan. He founded Ava, which, whether it was held by Burmese or Shans, was regarded as the chief city of Burma until 1758. Although throughout this period, the kings of Pegu and other districts were frequently independent. During the 14th century, another kingdom grew up at Tongu in Lower Burma. Its rulers were originally Shan governors sent from Ava, but ultimately they claimed to be descendants of the last king of Pagan, and in this character, Burang or Bain Naung, 1551-1581, the second great ruler of Burma conquered Prom, Pegu, and Ava, 
His kingdom began to break up immediately after his death, but his dynasty ruled in Ava until the middle of the 18th century. During this period, Europeans first made their appearance and quarrels with Portuguese adventurers were added to native dissensions. The Shans and Telangs became turbulent and after a tumultuous interval and third great national hero, Along Paya or Along Pra came to the front. In the short space of eight years, 1752 to 1760, he gained possession of Ava, made the Burmese masters of both the northern and southern provinces, founded Rangoon and invaded both Manipur and Siam. While on the latter expedition he died, some of his successors held their court at Ava, but Bodav Paya built a new capital at Amarapura, 1783, and Mindon Min, another Red Mandalay, 1857. The dynasty came to an end in 1886 when King Thibao was deposed by the government of India and his dominions annexed. Burma II The early history of Buddhism in Burma is obscure, as in most other countries, and different writers have maintained that it was introduced from northern India, the east coast of India, Ceylon, China, or Cambodia. All these views may be in a measure true, for there is reason to believe that it was not introduced at one epoch or from one source or in one form. It is not remarkable that Indian influence should be strong among the Burmese. The wonder, rather, is that they have preserved such strong individuality in art, institutions and everyday life that no one can pass from India into Burma without feeling that he has entered a new country. This is because the mountains which separate it from eastern Bengal and run right down to the sea form a barrier still sufficient to prevent communication by rail. But from the earliest times, Indian immigrants and Indian ideas have been able to find their way both by land and sea. According to the Burmese chronicles, Tagong was founded by the Hindu prince Abhiraja in the 9th century BC and the kingdom of Arakan claims as its first ruler an ancient prince of Benares. The legends have not much more historical value than the Kshatriya genealogies, which Brahmins have invented for the kings of Manipur, but they show that the Burmese knew of India and wished to connect themselves with it. This spirit led not only to the invention of legends but to the application of Indian names to Burmese localities. For instance, Aparantaka, which really designates the district of Western India, is identified by native scholars with Upper Burma. The two merchants Thapusa and Bhalika, who were the first to salute the Buddha after his enlightenment, are said to have come from Ukkala. This is usually identified with Orissa, but Burmese tradition locates it in Burma. A system of mythical geography has thus arisen. The Buddha himself is supposed to have visited Burma as well as Ceylon in his lifetime and even to have imparted some of his power to the celebrated image which is now in the Arakan pagoda at Mandalay. Another resemblance to the Sinhali story is the evangelization of Lower Burma by Ashoka's missionaries. The Deepavamsa states that Sona and Uttara were dispatched to Suvarna Bhumi. This is identified with Ramana Desa or the district of Tatan, which appears to be a corruption of Sadhamapura. And the tradition is accepted in Burma. The skepticism with which modern scholars have received it is perhaps unmerited, but the preaching of these missionaries, if it ever took place, cannot at present be connected with other historical events. Nevertheless, the statement of the Deepa Vamsa is significant. The work was composed in the 4th century AD and taken from older chronicles. It may therefore be concluded that in the early centuries of our era, Lower Burma had the reputation of being a Buddhist country. It also appears certain that in the 11th century, when the Telings were conquered by Anavrata, Buddhist monks and copies of the Tipitaka were found there but we know little about the country in the preceding centuries. The Kalyani inscription says that before Anavrata's conquest, it was divided and decadent and during this period, there is no proof of intercourse with Ceylon, but also no disproof. One result of Anavrata's conquest of Thatan was that he exchanged religious embassies with the king of Ceylon, and it is natural to suppose that the two monarchs were moved to this step by traditions of previous communications. 
intercourse with the east coast of India may be assumed as natural and is confirmed by the presence of Sanskrit words in the old Telling and the information about southern India in Telling records, in which the city of Konjevaram, the great commentator Dharmapala, and other men of learning are often mentioned. Analogies have also been traced between the architecture of Pagan and southern India. It will be seen that such communication by sea may have brought not only Hinayanist Buddhism, but also Mahayanist and Tantric Buddhism as well as Brahmanism from Bengal and Odisha, so that it is not surprising if all these influences can be detected in the ancient buildings and sculptures of the country. Still, the most important evidence as to the character of early Burmese Buddhism is Hinayanist and furnished by inscriptions on thin golden plates and tiles found near the ancient site of Prome and deciphered by Finart. They consist of Hinayanist religious formulae, the language is Pali, the alphabet is of a South Indian type and is said to resemble closely that used in the inscriptions of the Kadamba dynasty which ruled in Kanara from the 3rd to the 6th century. It is to the latter part of this period that the inscriptions are to be attributed. They show that a form of the Hinayana, comparable so far as the brief documents permit us to judge, with the Church of Ceylon, was then known in Lower Burma and was probably the state's church. The character of the writing taken together with the knowledge of southern India, shown by the telling chronicles and the opinion of the Deepavamsa that Burma was a Buddhist country, is good evidence that Lower Burma had accepted Hinayanism before the 6th century and had intercourse with southern India. More than that, it would perhaps be rash to say. The Burmese tradition that Buddha Gosa was a native of Thatan and returned thither from Ceylon merits more attention than it has received. It can be easily explained away as patriotic fancy. On the other hand, if Buddha Gosa's object was to invigorate Hinayanism in India, the result of his really stupendous labours was singularly small, for in India his name is connected with no religious movement. But if we suppose that he went to Ceylon by way of the holy places in Magadha and returned from the Coromandel coast to Burma where Hinayanism afterwards nourished, we have at least a coherent narrative. It is noticeable that Taranatha states that in the Koki countries, among which he expressly mentions Bukham, Pagan, and Hamsawati, Pegu, Hinayanism was preached from the days of Ashoka onwards but that the Mahayana was not known until the pupils of Vishubhandu introduced it. The presence of Hinayanism in Lower Burma naturally did not prevent the arrival of Mahayanism. It has not left many certain traces, but Atisa, century thousand, a great figure in the history of Tibetan Buddhism, is reported to have studied both in Magadha and in Suvarnadipa, by which Thatran must be meant. He would hardly have done this had the clergy of Thatan been unfriendly to tantric learning. This medieval Buddhism was also, as in other countries, mixed with Hinduism. But whereas in Cambodia and Champa, Shivaism, especially the worship of the Lingam, was long the official and popular cult and penetrated to Siam, few Shivite emblems, but numerous statues of Vishnuite deities have hitherto been discovered in Burma. The above refers chiefly to Lower Burma. The history of Burmese Buddhism becomes clearer in the 11th century, but before passing to this new period, we must inquire what was the religious condition of Upper Burma in the centuries preceding it. It is clear that any variety of Buddhism or Brahmanism may have entered this region from India by land at any epoch. According to both Swan Chuang and I Ching, Buddhism flourished in Samatata, and the latter mentions images of Avalokita and the reading of the Pragna Paramita. The precise position of Samathata has not been fixed, but in any case, it was in the east of Bengal and not far from the modern Burmese frontier. The existence of early Sanskrit inscriptions at Taungu and elsewhere has been recorded, but not with as much detail as could be wished. Figures of Bodhisattvas and Indian deities are reported from Prome and in the lower Chinwen district are rocket temples resembling the caves of Barabar in Bengal. Inscriptions also show that at Prome there were kings, perhaps in the 7th century, who used the Pew language but bore Sanskrit titles. 
According to Burmese tradition, the Buddha himself visited the site of Pagan and prophesied that a king called Samuttiraya would found a city there and establish the faith. This prediction is said to have been fulfilled in 108 AD, but the notices quoted from the Burmese chronicles are concerned less with the progress of true religion than with the prevalence of heretics known as Aris. It has been conjectured that this name is a corruption of Arya, but it appears that the correct orthography is Aran, representing an original Aranyaka, that is forest priest. It is hard to say whether they were degraded Buddhists or an indigenous priesthood who in some ways imitated what they knew of Brahmanic and Buddhist institutions. They wore black robes, let their hair grow, worshipped serpents, hung up in their temples the heads of animals that had been sacrificed, and once a year they assisted the king to immolate a victim to the gnats on a mountain top. They claimed power to expiate all sins, even parricide. They lived in convents, which is their only real resemblance to Buddhist monks, but were not celibate. Hanavrata is said to have suppressed the Aris, but he certainly did not extirpate them, for an inscription dated 1468 records their existence in the Mingyan district. Also in a village near Pagan are preserved tantric frescoes representing bodhisattvas with their shaktis. In one temple is an inscription dated 1248 and requiring the people to supply the priest morning and evening with rice, beef, betel, and a jar of spirits. It is not clear whether these priests were Aris or not, but they evidently professed an extreme form of Buddhist Shaktism. Chinese influences in Upper Burma must also be taken into account. Burmese kings were perhaps among the many potentates who sent religious embassies to the Emperor Wu Ti about 525 AD, and the Ta'ang annals show an acquaintance with Burma. They describe the inhabitants as devout Buddhists, reluctant to take life or even to wear silk, since its manufacture involves the death of the silkworms. There were a hundred monasteries into which the youth entered at the age of seven, leaving at the age of twenty, if they did not intend to become monks. The Chinese writer does not seem to have regarded the religion of Burma as differing materially from Buddhism, as he knew it and some similarities in ecclesiastical terminology shown by Chinese and Burmese may indicate the presence of Chinese influence. But this influence, though possibly strong between the 6th and 10th centuries AD, and again about the time of the Chinese invasion of 1284, cannot be held to exclude Indian influence. Thus, when Anavrata came to the throne, several forms of religion probably coexisted at Pagan and probably most of them were corrupt, though it is a mistake to think of his dominions as barbarous. The reformation which followed is described by Burmese authors in considerable detail and as usual in such accounts is ascribed to the activity of one personality, the Tera Arahanta, who came from Tatan and enjoyed mm -hmm. Anavrata's confidence. The story implies that there was a party in Pagan which knew that the prevalent creed was corrupt and also looked upon Tatan and Ceylon as religious centers. As Anavrata was a man of arms rather than a theologian, we may conjecture that his motive was to concentrate in his capital the flower of learning, as known in his time, a motive which has often animated successful princes in Asia and led to the unceremonious seizure of living saints. According to the story, he broke up the communities of Aris at the instigation of Arahanta and then sent a mission to Manohari, king of Pegu, asking for a copy of the Tipitaka and for relics. He received a contemptuous reply intimating that he was not to be trusted with such sacred objects. Anavrata, in indignation, collected an army, marched against the Talayangs and ended up carrying off to Pagan not only elephant loads of scriptures and relics, but also all the telling monks and nobles with the king himself. The Pitakas were stored in a splendid pagoda and Anavrata sent to Ceylon for others which were compared with the copies obtained from Thaton in order to settle the text. For 200 years, that is from about 1060 AD until the later decades of the 13th century, Pagan was a great center of Buddhist culture not only for Burma but for the whole East, renowned alike for its architecture and its scholarship. 
The former can still be studied in the magnificent pagodas which mark its site. Towards the end of his reign, Anavrata made not very successful attempts to obtain relics from China and Ceylon and commenced the construction of the Shwav Zigon Pagoda. He died before it was completed, but his successors, who enjoyed fairly peaceful reigns, finished the work and constructed about a thousand other buildings, among which the most celebrated is the Ananda Temple erected by King Kyan Sita. Pali literature in Burma begins with a little grammatical treatise known as Karika and composed in 1064 AD by the monk Dhammasenapati, who lived in the monastery attached to his temple. A number of other works followed. Of these, the most celebrated was the Sadhaniti of Agavamsa, 1154, a treatise on the language of the Tipitaka, which became a classic not only in Burma but in Ceylon. A singular enthusiasm for linguistic studies prevailed especially in the reign of Kyokwa, century 1230, when even women are said to have been distinguished for the skill and order which they displayed in conquering the difficulties of Pali grammar. Some treatises on the Abhidhamma were also produced. Like Mohammedanism, Hinayana's Buddhism is too simple and defined to admit much variation in doctrine but its clergy are prone to violent disputes about apparently trivial questions. In the 13th century, such disputes assumed grave proportions in Burma. About 1175 AD, a celebrated elder named Uttarajiva, accompanied by his pupil Chapata, left for Ceylon. They spent some years in study at the Mahavihara and Chapata received ordination there. He returned to Pagan with four other monks and maintained that valid ordination could be conferred only through the monks of the Mahavihara, who alone had kept the succession unbroken. He with his four companions having received his ordination, he with his four companions having received this ordination claimed power to transmit it, but he declined to recognize Burmese orders. This pretension aroused a storm of opposition, especially from the telling monks. They maintained that Arahanta, who had reformed Buddhism under Anavrata, was spiritually descended from the missionaries sent by Ashoka, who were all well qualified to administer ordination as Mahinda. But Chapata was not only a man of learning and an author, but also a vigorous personality and in favour at court. He had the best of the contest and succeeded in making the telling school appear as seceders from orthodoxy. There thus arose a distinction between the Sinhalese or later school and the old Burmese school who regarded one another as schismatics. A scandal was caused in the Sinhalese community by Rahula, the ablest of Chapata's disciples who fell in love with an actress and wished to become a layman. His colleagues induced him to leave the country for decency's sake and peace was restored, but subsequently after Chapata's death, the remaining three disciples fell out on questions of discipline rather than doctrine and founded three factions, which can hardly be called schools, although they refused to keep the Uposada days together. The light of religion shone brightest at Pagan early in the 13th century when these three brethren were alive, and the Sasana Vamsha states that at least three Arhats lived in the city. But the power of Pagan collapsed under attacks from both Chinese and Shans at the end of the century, and the last king became a monk under the compulsion of Shan chiefs. The deserted city appears to have lost its importance as a religious centre for the ecclesiastical chronicles shift the scene elsewhere. The two Shan states which arose from the ruin of Pagan, namely Panya, Vijayapura, and Sageng, Jayapura, encouraged religion, encouraged religion and learning. Their existence probably explains the claim made in Siamese inscriptions of about 1300 that the territory of Siam extended to Hamsavati, or Pegu, and this contact of Burma and Siam was of great importance for it must be the origin of Pali Buddhism in Siam, which otherwise remains unexplained. After the fall of the two Shan states in 1364, Ava, or Ratnapura, which was founded in the same year, gradually became the religious center of Upper Burma and remained so during several centuries. But it did not at first supersede older towns in as much as the loss of political independence did not always involve the destruction of monasteries. Buddhism also flourished in Pegu and the Telain country where the vicissitudes of the northern kingdoms did not affect its fortunes. 
Anavrata had transported the most eminent theras of Tatan to Pagan, and the old telling school probably suffered temporarily. Somewhat later, we hear that the Sinhali school was introduced into these regions. But somewhat later, we hear that the Sinhali school was introduced into these regions by Sariputta, who had been ordained at Pagan. About the same time, two theras of Martaban, preceptors of the queen, visited Ceylon, and on returning to their own land. After being ordained at the Mahavihara, considered themselves superior to other monks, but the old Burmese school continued to exist. Not much literature was produced in the youth. Sariputta was the author of the Madat or Code, the first of a long series of law books based upon Manu. Somewhat later, Mahayasa of Thatan, century thirteen seventy, wrote several grammatical works. The most prosperous period for Buddhism in Pegu was the reign of Damaseti, also called Rama Dhipati, fourteen sixty to fourteen ninety one. He was not of the royal family, but a simple monk who helped the princess of Pegu to escape from the Burmese court where she was detained. In fourteen fifty three, this princess had become queen of Pegu, and Damaseti left his monastery to become her prime minister, son in law, and ultimately her successor. But though he had returned to the world, his heart was with the church. He was renowned for his piety and no less than for his magnificence, and is known to modern scholars as the author of the Kalyani inscriptions, which assume the proportions of a treatise on ecclesiastical laws and history. The chief purpose is to settle an intricate and highly technical question, namely the proper method of defining and consecrating a sima. This word, which means literally boundary, signifies a plot of ground within which uposatha meetings, ordinations, and other ceremonies can take place. The expression occurs in the Vinaya Pitaka, but the area there contemplated seems to be an ecclesiastical district within which the bhikkhus were obliged to meet for uposatha. The modern sima is much smaller, but more important since it is maintained that valid ordination can be conferred only within its limits. To Dharma Sethi, the question seemed momentous, for as he explains, there were in southern Burma six schools who would not meet for Uposatha. These were first the Kamboja school, identical with the Arahanta school, who claimed spiritual descent from the missionaries sent by Ashoka to Suvarna Bhumi, and then five divisions of the Sinhali school, namely the three founded by Chapata's disciples, as already related, and two more founded by the Theras of Martaban. Damaseti accordingly sent a mission to Ceylon, charged to obtain an authoritative ruling as to the proper method of consecrating a sima and conferring ordination. On their return, a locality known as the Kalyani Sima was consecrated in the manner prescribed by the Mahavihara, and during three years, all the bhikkhus of Damaseti's kingdom were reordained there. The total number reached. Fifteen thousand six hundred and sixty-six, and the king boasts that he had thus purified religion and made the school of the Mahavihara the only sect. All the other distinctions being obliterated, there can be little doubt that in the fifteenth century Burmese Buddhism had assumed the form which it still has. But was this form due to indigenous tradition or to imitation of Ceylon? Five periods merit attention. A. In the sixth century and probably several centuries earlier, Hinayanism was known in Lower Burma. The inscriptions attesting its existence are written in Pali and in a South Indian alphabet. B. Anavrata, ten ten to ten fifty two, purified the Buddhism of Upper Burma with the help of scriptures obtained from the Telang country, which were compared with other scriptures brought from Ceylon. C. About twelve hundred Chapata and his pupils, who had studied in Ceylon and received ordination there, refused to recognize the Telang monks, and two hostile schools were founded, predominant at first in Upper and Lower Burma, respectively. D. About one thousand two fifty, the Sinhali school, led by Sariputta and others, began to make conquests in Lower Burma at the expense of the Telang school. E. Two centuries later, about 1460, Damaseti of Pegu boasts that he has purified religion and made the school of the Mahavihara, that is the most orthodox form of the Sinhali school, the only sect. In connection with these data, must be taken the important statement that the celebrated tantrist Atisa studied in Lower Burma about 1000 A.D. 
Up to a certain point, the conclusion seems clear. Pali Hinayanism in Burma was old, intercourse with southern India and Ceylon tended to keep it pure, whereas intercourse with Bengal and Orissa, which must have been equally frequent, tended to import Mahayanism. In the time of Anavrata, the religion of Upper Burma probably did not deserve the name of Buddhism. He introduced in its place the Buddhism of Lower Burma, tempered by reference to Ceylon. After 1200, if not earlier, the idea prevailed that the Mahavihara was the standard of orthodoxy and that the Telang church, which probably retained some Mahayana's features, fell below it. In the 15th century, this view was universally accepted, the opposition and indeed the separate existence of the Telling Church having come to an end. But it still remains uncertain whether the earliest Burmese Buddhism came direct from Magadha or from the south. The story of Ashoka's missionaries cannot be summarily rejected, but it also cannot be accepted without hesitation. It is the Ceylon Chronicle which knows of them and communication between Burma and southern India was old and persistent. It may have existed even before the Christian era. After the fall of Pagan, Upper Burma, of which we must now speak, passed through troubled times and we hear little of religion or literature. Though Ava was founded in 1364, it did not become an intellectual centre for another century. But the reign of Narapati, 1442-1468, was ornamented by several writers of eminence among whom may be mentioned the monk poet Silavamsa and Adyavamsa, an exponent of the Abhidhamma. Then noticeable as being the first writers to publish religious works, either original or translated, in the vernacular and this practice steadily increased. In the early part of the 16th century occurred the only persecution of Buddhism known in Burma. Tohan Bua, a Shan who had become king of Ava endeavoured to exterminate the order by deliberate massacre and delivered temples, monasteries and libraries to the flames. The persecution did not last long nor extend to other districts, but it created great indignation among the Burmese and was perhaps one of the reasons why the Shan dynasty of Ava was overthrown in 1555. Bayin or Burang Nong stands out as one of the greatest personalities in Burmese history. As a Buddhist, he was zealous even to intolerance since he forced the Shans and Muslims of the northern districts and indeed all his subjects to make a formal profession to Buddhism. He also, as related elsewhere, made not very successful attempts to obtain the tooth relic from Ceylon. But it is probable that his active patronage of the faith as shown in the construction and endowment of religious buildings was exercised chiefly in Pegu, and this must be the reason why the Sasana Vamsa, which is interested chiefly in Upper Burma, says little about him. His successors showed little political capacity but encouraged religion and literature. The study of the Abhidhamma was specially flourishing in the districts of Ava and Sageng from about 1600 to 1650 and found many illustrious exponents. Besides works in Pali, the writers of this time produced numerous Burmese translations and paraphrases of Abhidhamma works, as well as edifying stories. In the latter part of the 17th century, Burma was in a disturbed condition and the Sasana Vamsa says that religion was dimmed as a moon by clouds. A national and religious revival came with the victories of Alampra, 1752 onwards, But the 18th century also witnessed the rise of a curious and not very edifying controversy which divided the Sangha for about a hundred years and spread to Ceylon. It concerned the manner in which the upper robe of a monk, consisting of a long piece of cloth, should be worn. The old practice in Burma was to wrap this cloth around the lower body from the loins to the ankles and draw the end from the back over the left shoulder and thence across the breast over the right shoulder, so that it finally hung loose behind. But about 1698 began the custom of walking with the right shoulder bare, that is to say, letting the end of the rope fall down in front on the left side. The Sangha became divided into two factions known as Ekamsika, one-shouldered, and Parupana, fully clad. 
The bitterness of the seemingly trivial controversy was increased by the fact that the Ekamsikas could produce little scriptural warrant and appeal to late authorities or the practice in Ceylon, thus neglecting sound learning. For the Vinaya frequently prescribes that the robe is to be adjusted so as to fall over only one shoulder as a mark of special respect, which implies that it was usually worn over both shoulders. In 1712 and again, about 20 years later, arbitrators were appointed by the king to hear both sides, but they had not sufficient authority or learning to give a decided opinion. The stirring political events of 1740 and the following years naturally threw ecclesiastical quarrels into the shade, but when the great Alompra had disposed of his enemies, he appeared as a modern Ashoka. The court religiously observed Uposita days and the king was popularly believed to be a bodhisattva. He was not, however, sound on the great question of ecclesiastical rest. His chaplain, Atula, belonged to the Ekamsiga party and the king, saying that he wished to go into the whole matter himself, but had not for the moment leisure, provisionally ordered the Sangha to obey Atula's ruling. But some champions of the other side stood firm. Alumbra dealt leniently with them but died during his Siamese campaign before he had time to unravel the intricacies of the Vinaya. The influence of Atullah, who must have been an astute if not learned man, continued up to the king's death and no measures were taken against the Ekamsikas, although the king, Sin Byushin, 1763-1776, persecuted a heretical sect called Paramats. His youthful successor, Singusa, was induced to hold a public disputation. The Ekamsikas were defeated in this contest and a royal decree was issued, making the Parupana discipline obligatory. But the wet question was not settled, for it came up again in the long reign, 1781-1819 to of Bodho Pea. This king has worn an evil reputation for cruelty and insensate conceit, but he was a man of vigour and kept together his great empire. His megalomania naturally detracted from the esteem won by his piety. His benefactions to the religion were lavish, the shrines and monasteries which he built innumerable. But he desired to build a pagoda larger than any in the world and during some twenty years wasted an incalculable amount of labour and money on this project still commemorated by a gigantic but unfinished mass of brickwork now in ruins. In order to supervise its erection, he left his palace and lived in Mingun, where he conceived the idea that he was Buddha, an idea which had not been entirely absent from the minds of Alompra and Sin Byu Shin. It is to the credit of the Theras that despite the danger of opposing an autocrat as cruel, as he was crazy, they refused to countenance these pretensions and the king returned to his palace as an ordinary monarch. If he could not make himself a Buddha, he at least disposed of the Ikamsika dispute and was probably influenced in his views by Nana Bhivamsa, a monk of Parupana school whom he made his chaplain, although Atula was still alive. At first, he named a commission of inquiry, the result of which was that the Ekamsikas admitted that their practice could not be justified from the scriptures but only by tradition. A royal decree was issued enjoining the observance of Parupana discipline, but two years later, Atula addressed a letter to the king in which he maintained that the Ekamsika costume was approved in a work called Kula Ghantipada composed by Moghalana, the immediate disciple of the Buddha. It was demonstrated that the text on which Atula relied was composed by a Thera named Moghalana, who lived in the 12th century and that it quoted medieval Sinhalese commentaries. After this exposure, the Ikamsika party collapsed. The king commanded, 1784, the Parupana discipline to be observed and at last the royal order received obedience. It will be observed that throughout this controversy, both sides appealed to the king as if he had the right to decide the point in dispute but that his decision had no compelling power as long as it was not supported by evidence. He could ensure toleration for views regarded by many as heretical, but was unable to force the views of one party on the other until the winning cause had publicly disproved the contentions of its opponents. On the other hand, the king had practical control of the hierarchy, for his chaplain was de facto head of the church and the appointment was strictly personal. 
It was not the practice for a king to take on his predecessor's chaplain, and the latter could not, like a Lameist or Catholic ecclesiastic, claim any permanent supernatural powers. Bodopaya did something towards organizing the hierarchy, for he appointed four elders of repute to be Sangharajas, or so to speak, bishops, with four more as assistants, and over them all his chaplain, Nana, as archbishop. Nana was a man of energy and lived in turn in various monasteries supervising the discipline and studies. In spite of the extravagances of Bodopaya, the church was flourishing and respected in his reign. The celebrated image called Mahamuni was transferred from Arakan to his capital together with a Sanskrit library. And Burma sent to Ceylon not only the monks who founded the Amarapura school but also numerous Pali texts. This prosperity continued in the reigns of Bagida, Tharavadi, and Pagan men, who were of little personal account. The first ordered the compilation of the Yazawen, a chronicle which was not original but incorporated and superseded other works of the same kind. In his reign arose a question as to the validity of grants of land, etc., for religious purposes. It was decided in the sense most favorable to the order was that such grants are perpetual and are not invalidated by the lapse of time. About 1845, there was a considerable output of vernacular literature. The Digha, the Samyutha, and Anguthara Nikayas, with their commentaries, were translated into Burmese, but no compositions in Pali are recorded. From 1852 till 1877, Burma was ruled by Mindon men, who, if not a national hero, was at least a pious, peace-loving, capable king. His chaplain, Panasami, composed the Sasana Vamsa, or Ecclesiastical History of Burma, and the king himself was ambitious to figure as a great Buddhist monarch, though with more sanity than Bodhopaya, for his chief desire was to be known as the convener of the Fifth Buddhist Council. The body so styled met from 1868 to 1871, and like the ancient Sangitis, proceeded to recite the Tipitaka in order to establish the correct text. The result may still be seen at Mandalay in the collection of buildings commonly known as the 450 pagodas, a central stupa surrounded by hundreds of small shrines, each sheltering a perpendicular tablet, on which a portion of this veritable Bible in stone is inscribed. Mindon Min also corrected the growing laxity of the bhikkhus, and the esteem in which the Burmese church was held at this time is shown by the fact that the monks of Ceylon sent a deputation to the Sangharaja of Mandalay, referring to his decision a dispute about the Sima, or ecclesiastical boundary. Mindon Min was succeeded by Thibao, who was deposed by the British. The Sangharaja maintained his office until he died in 1895. The interregnum then occurred for the appointment had always been made by the king, not by the Sangha. But when Lord Curzon visited Burma in 1901, he made arrangements for the election by the monks themselves of a superior of the whole order, and Tong Win Sayada was solemnly installed in this office by the British authorities in 1903 with the title of Thathana Beng. Burma Part Three. We may now examine briefly some sites of popular religion and institutions which are not Buddhist. It is an interesting fact that the Burmese law books or dhammatarts, which are still accepted as regulating inheritance and other domestic matters, are Indian in origin and show no traces of Sinhalese influence. Although since 1750 there has been a decided tendency to bring them into connection with authorities accepted by Buddhism. The earliest of these codes are those of Dharma Vilasa, eleven seventy four A.D., and of Vaguru, king of Martaban, in twelve eighty. They professedly base themselves on the authority of Manu, and so far as purely legal topics are concerned, correspond pretty closely with the rules of the Manava Dharma Shastra. But they omit all prescriptions which involve Brahmanic religious observances such as penance and sacrifice. Also, the theory of punishment is different and inspired by the doctrine of karma, namely that every evil deed will bring its own retribution. Hence, the Burmese courts ordain for every crime not penalties to be suffered by the criminal, but merely the payment of compensation to the party aggrieved, proportionate to the damage suffered. 
It is probable that the law books on which these codes were based were brought from the east coast of India and were of the same type as the code of Narada, which though of unquestioned Brahmanic orthodoxy is almost purely legal and has little to say about religion. A subsidiary literature embodying local decisions naturally grew up and about 1640 was summarized by a Burmese nobleman called Khangza in the Maharaja Dhamatart. He received from the king the title of Manu Raja and the name of Manu became connected with his court, though it is really based on local custom. It appears to have superseded older law books until the reign of Alompra, who remodeled the administration and caused several courts to be compiled. These also preserved the name of Manu, but he and Khaim Za are treated as the same personage. The rules of the older law books are in the main retained, but are made to depend on Buddhist texts. Later, the Hamathards became more and more decidedly Buddhist. Thus, the Moha Vichedani, 1832, does not mention Manu but presents the substance of the Manu Dhamathards as the law preached by Buddha. Direct Indian influence may be seen in another department not unimportant in an Oriental country. The court astrologers, soothsayers, and professors of kindred sciences were even in recent times Brahmins, known as Pona, and mostly from Manipur. An inscription found at Pagan and dated 1442 mentions the gift of 295 books to the Sangha, among which several have Sanskrit titles, and about 1600 we hear of Pandits learned in Veda Shastras, meaning not Vedic learning in the strict sense, but combinations of sciences and magic described as medicine, astronomy, Kama Shastras, etc. Hindu tradition was sufficiently strong at the court to make the presence of experts in the Atharva Veda seem desirable and in the capital they were in request for such services as drawing up horoscopes and invoking good luck at weddings whereas monks will not attend social gatherings. More important as a non-Buddhist element in Burmese religion is the worship of Nats or spirits of various kinds. Of the prevalence of such worship, there is no doubt, but I cannot agree with the authorities who say that it is the practical religion of the Burmese. No passing tourist can fail to see that in the literal as well as figurative sense, Burma takes its colour from Buddhism, from the gilded and vermilion pagodas and the yellow robe priests. It is impossible that so much money should be given, so many lives dedicated to a religion which has not a real hold on the hearts of the people. The worship of Nats, widespread though it be, is humble in its outward signs and is a superstition rather than a creed. On several occasions, the kings of Burma have suppressed its manifestations when they became too conspicuous. Thus, Anavrata destroyed the nut houses of Pagan and recent kings forbade the practice of firing guns at funerals to scare the evil spirits. Nats are of at least three classes or rather have three origins. Firstly, they are nature spirits similar to those revered in China and Tibet. They inhabit noticeable natural features of every kind, particularly trees, rivers and mountains. They may be specially connected with villages, houses or individuals. Though not essentially evil, they are touchy and vindictive, punishing neglect or discourtesy with misfortune and ill luck. No explanation is offered as to the origin of many gnats, but others who may be regarded as forming the second category are ghosts or ancestral spirits. In northern Burma, Chinese influence encouraged ancestor worship, but apart from this, there is a disposition equally evident in India to believe that violent and uncanny persons and those who meet with a tragic death become powerful ghosts requiring propitiation. Thirdly, there are Nats who are at least in part identified with the Indian deities recognized by early Buddhism. It would seem that the 37 Nats described in a work called Mahagita Medanigyan correspond to the 33 gods of Buddhist mythology, but that the number has been raised for unknown reasons to 37. They are spirits of undeceased heroes and there is nothing un-Buddhist in this conception for the Pitakas frequently represent deserving persons as being reborn in the heaven of the 33. The chief is Tagya, the Sakra or Indra of Hindu mythology. But the others are heroes connected with five cycles of legends based on a popular and often inaccurate version of Burmese history. Besides Tagya, Nath, we find other Indian figures such as Man Nath, Mara, and Bhyama, Nat, Brahma, 
in diagrams illustrating the Buddhist cosmology of the Burmans. A series of heavens is depicted ascending from those of the four kings and 33 gods up to the Brahma worlds and each inhabited by Nats according to their degree. Here the spirits of Burma are marshaled and classified according to Buddhist system just as were the spirits of India some centuries before. But neither in ancient India nor in modern Burma have the Devas or Nats anything to do with the serious business of religion. They have their place in temples as guardian genie and the whole band may be seen in a shrine adjoining the Shwezi Gom Pagoda at Pagan. But this interferes no more with the supremacy of the Buddha than did the deputations of spirits who, according to the scriptures, waited on him. End of section 4 Recording by Seema Section 5 of Hinduism and Buddhism A Historical Sketch, Volume 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Smiling Jade Hinduism and Buddhism a Historical Sketch, Volume 3, by Sir Charles Eliot. Burma, Parts 4 and 5 Buddhism is a real force in Burmese life and the pride of the Burmese people. Every male Burman enters a monastery when he is about 15 for a short stay. Devout parents send their sons for the four months of wars or even for this season during three successive years. But by the majority, a period of from one month to one week is considered sufficient. To omit this day in a monastery altogether would not be respectable. It is, in common esteem, the only way to become a human being, for we doubt it, a boy is a mere animal. The praises of the Buddha and the vows to lead a good life are commonly recited by the laity every morning and evening. It is the greatest ambition of most Burmans to build a pagoda and those who are able to do so, a large percentage of the population, to judge from the number of buildings, are not only sure of their reward in another birth but even now enjoy respect and receive the title of Pagoda Builder. Another proof of devotion is the existence of thousands of monasteries, perhaps on an average more than two for each large village and town, built and supported by voluntary contributions. The provision of food and domicile for their numerous inmates is no small charge on the nation, but observers are agreed that it is cheerfully paid and that the monks are worthy of what they receive. In energy and morality, they seem, as a class, superior to their brethren in Ceylon and Siam, and their services to education and learning have been considerable. Every monastery is also a school, where instruction is given to both day, boys, and boarders. The vast majority of Burmans enter such a school at the age of eight or nine and learn there reading, writing, and arithmetic. They also receive religious instructions and moral training. They commit to memory various works in Pali and Burmese and are taught the duties which they owe to themselves, society, and the state. Sir J. G. Scott, who is certainly not disposed to exaggerate the influence of Buddhism in Burma, says that the education of the monasteries far surpasses the instruction of the Anglo vernacular schools from every point of view except that of immediate success in life and the obtaining of a post under government. The most studious monks are not merely schoolmasters, but can point to a considerable body of literature which they have produced in the past and are still producing. Indeed, among the Hinayanist churches, that of Burma, 
has in recent centuries held the first place for learning. The age and continuity of Sinhalese traditions have given the Sangha of Ceylon a correspondingly great prestige, but it has more than once been recruited from Burma and in literally output, it can hardly rival the Burmese clergy. Though many disquisitions on the Vinaya have been produced in Burma, and though the Jatakas and portions of the Sutta, Pitika, especially those called Piritham, are known to everybody, yet the favorite study of theologians appear to be the Abhibhama, concerning which a multitude of handbooks and commentaries have been written. But it is worth mentioning that the Abhibhamata Sagaha composed in Ceylon about the 12th century AD is still the standard manual. Yet it would be a mistake to think of the Burmese monks as absorbed in these recondite studies. They have, on the contrary, produced a long series of works dealing with the practical things of the world, such as chronicles, law books, ethical and political treatises, and even poetry, for Silavamsa and Ratapala, whose verses are still learned by the youth of Burma, were both of them bhikkhus. The Sangha has always shown a laudable reserve in interfering directly with politics. But in former times, the king's private chaplain was a counsellor of importance and occasionally matters involving both political and religious questions were submitted to a chapter of the order. In all cases, the influence of the monks in secular matters made for justice and peace. They sometimes interceded on behalf of the condemned or represented that taxation was too heavy. In 1886, when the British annexed Burma, the head of the Sangha forbade monks to take part in the political strife, a prohibition which was all the more remarkable because King Tibba had issued proclamations saying that the object of the invasion was to destroy Buddhism. In essentials, monastic life is much the same in Burma and Ceylon, but the Burmese standard is higher, and any monk known to misconduct himself would be driven out by the lati. The monasteries are numerous, but not large, and much space is wasted. For, though the exterior suggests that they are built in several stories, the interior usually is a single hall, although it may be divided by partitions. To the eastern side is attached a chapel containing images of Gotama, before which daily devotions are performed. It is surmounted by the steeple, culminating in a T, a sort of baldacchino or sacred umbrella, placed also on the top of a dagobas and made of open metalwork hung with little bells. Monasteries are always built outside towns, and though many of them become subsequently enclosed by the growth of the larger cities, they retain spacious grounds in which there may be separate buildings, such as a library, dormitories for pupils, and a hall for performing the ordination service. The average number of inmates is six. A large establishment may house a superior, four monks, some novices, and besides them, several lay scholars. The grades are sahing, or novice, the pichin, or fully ordained monks, and ponyi, literally great glory, a monk of at least 10 years standing. Rank depends on seniority, that is to say, the greatest respect is shown 
to the monk who has observed his vows for the longest period. But there are some simple hierarchical arrangements. At the head of each monastery is a saya or superior, and all the monasteries of a large town or a country district are under the supervision of a provincial called Gaing Ok. At the head of the whole church is the Tata Nabaying, already mentioned. All these higher officials must be Pongis. Although all monks must take part in the daily round to collect alms, yet in most monasteries, it is the custom, as in Ceylon and Siam, not to eat the food collected, or at least not all of it. And though no solid nourishment is taken after midday, three morning meals are allowed, namely, one taken very early, the next served on the return from the begging round, and a third about 11.30. Two or three services are intoned before the image of the Buddha each day. At the morning ceremony, which takes place about 5.30, all the inmates of the monastery prostrate themselves before the superior and vow to observe the precepts during the day. At the conclusion of the evening service, a novice announces that a day has passed away and in a loud voice proclaims the hour, the day of the week, the day of the month and the year. The laity do not usually attend these services, but near large monasteries, there are rest houses for the entertainment of visitors and the Yuposata days are often celebrated by a pious picnic. A family or party of friends take a rest house for a day, bring a goodly store of cheroots and betel nut which are not regarded as out of place during divine service, and listen at their ease to the exposition of the law delivered by a yellow-robed monk. When the congregation includes women, he holds a large fan-leaf palm before his face, lest his eyes should behold vanity. A custom which might not be to the tastes of Western ecclesiastics is that the congregation ask questions and, if they do not understand, request the preacher to be clearer. There is little sectarianism in Burma proper, but the Swatis, an anti-clerical sect, are found in some numbers in the Shan states and are similar communities called men are still met with in Pagu and Tenasirim, though said to be disappearing. Both refuse to recognize the Sangha, monasteries or temples and perform their devotions in the open fields. Otherwise, their mode of thought is Buddhist for they hold that every man can work out his own salvation by conquering Mara, as the Buddha did, and they use the ordinary formula of worship, except that they omit all expressions of reverence to the Sangha. The orthodox Sangha is divided into two schools, known as the Mahagandhi and the Sula Gandhi. The former are the moderate easy-going majority who maintain a decent discipline but undeniably deviate somewhat from the latter of the Vinaya. The latter are a strict and somewhat militant Puritan minority who protest against such concessions to the flesh. They insist, for instance, that a monk should eat out of his begging bowl exactly as it is at the end of the morning round, and they forbid the use of silk robes, sunshades, and sandals. The Sula Gandhi also believe in free will and attach more value to the intention than the action of estimating the value of good deeds 
whereas the Mahagandhi accept good actions without inquiring into the motive and believe that all deeds are the result of karma. In Burma, all the high branches of architecture are almost exclusively dedicated to religion. Except the palace at Mandalay, there is hardly a native building of note which is not connected with a shrine or monastery. Burmese architectural forms show most analogy to those of Nepal and perhaps both preserved what was once the common style for wooden buildings in ancient India. In recent centuries, the Burmese have shown little inclination to build anything that can be called a temple, that is, a chamber containing images and the paraphernalia of worship. The commonest form of religious edifice is the dagoba or zidai. Images are placed in niches or shrines which shelter them, but only rarely as on the platform of the Shui Dagon at Rangoon, assume the proportions of rooms. This does not apply to the great temples of Pagan, built from about 1050 to 1200, but that style was not continued and except the Arakan Pagoda at Mandalay had perhaps no modern representative. Details of these buildings may be found in the works of Forshammer, Ferguson, Dibeli, and various archaeological reports. Their construction is remarkably solid. They do not, like most large buildings in India or Europe, contain halls of some size but are rather pyramids transversed by passages. But this curious disinclination to build temples of the usual kind is not due to any dislike of images. In no Buddhist country are they more common and their numbers are more noticeable because there is here no Pantheon as in China and Tibet, but images of Gautama are multiplied merely in order to obtain merit. Some slight variety in these figures is produced by the fact that the Buddhists venerate not only Gautama, but the three Buddhas who preceded him. The Sui Dagon Pagoda is reputed to contain relics of all four. Statues of them all stand in the beautiful Ananda Pagoda at Pagan, and not infrequently, they are represented by four sitting figures facing the four quarters. A gigantic group of this kind, composed of statues nearly 90 feet high, stands in the outskirts of Pagu, and in the same neighborhood is a still larger recumbent figure 180 feet long. It had been forgotten since the capture of Pagu by the Burmans in 1757 and was rediscovered by the engineers surveying the route for the railroad. It lies almost in sight of the line and is surprising by its mere size as one comes upon it suddenly in the jungle. As a work of art, it can hardly be praised. It does not suggest the Buddha on his deathbed, as is intended, but rather some huge spirit of the jungle waking up and watching the railway with indolent amusement. In Upper Burma, there are not so many large images, but as one approaches Mandalay, the pagodas add more and more to the landscape. Many are golden, and the rest are mostly white and conspicuous. They crown the hills and punctuate the windings of the valleys. Perhaps Burmese art and nature are seen at their best near Sagaing, on the bank of the Irrawaddy a mighty flood of yellow water seeping down smooth and steady, but here and there showing whirlpools that look like molten metal. From the shore rise hills of the moderate height studded with monasteries and shrines. Flights of white steps lead to the principal summits 
where golden spires gleam and everywhere are pagodas of all ages, shapes, and sizes. Like most Asiatics, the Burmese rarely repair, but build new pagodas instead of renovating the old ones. The instinct is not altogether unjust. A pagoda does not collapse like a hollow building, but understands the art of growing old. Like a tree, it may become cleft or overgrown with moss, but it remains picturesque. In the neighborhood of Sagaing, there is a veritable forest of pagodas, humble seedlings built by widows' mites, mature golden domes reared by devout prosperity, and vulnerable ruins decomposing as all compound things must do. The pagoda slaves are a curious institution connected with temples. Under the Burmese kings, persons could be dedicated to pagodas and by this process not only become slaves for life themselves, but involved in the same servitude all their prosperity, none of whom could be by any method become free. They form a low caste like the Indian Pariahs, and though the British government has abolished the legal status of slavery, the social stigma which clings to them is said to be undiminished. Art and architecture make the picture of Burma as it remains in memory, and they are the faithful reflection of the character and ways of its inhabitants, their cheerful but religious temper, their love for what is fanciful and graceful, their moderate aspirations towards what is arduous and sublime. The most striking feature of this architecture is its free use of gold and color. In no country of the world is gilding and plating with gold so lavishly employed on the exterior of buildings. The large pagodas, such as the Sui Dagon, are veritable pyramids of gold, and the roofs of the Arakan temple, as they rise above Mandalay, show tier upon tier of golden beams and plates. The brilliancy is increased by the equally lavish use of vermilion, sometimes diversified by glass mosaic. I remember once in an East African jungle, seeing a clump of flowers of such brilliant red and yellow that for a moment I thought it was a fire. Somewhat similar is the surprise with which one first gazes on these edifices. I do not know whether the epithet flamboyant can be correctly applied to them as architecture, but both in color and shape, they imitate a pile of flame for the outlines of monasteries and shrines are fanciful in the extreme. Gabled roofs with finials like tongues of fire and panels rich with carvings and freight work. The buildings of Hindu and Burmans are as different as their characters. When a Hindu temple is imposing, it is usually because of its bulk and mystery, whereas these buildings are light-hearted and fairy-like, heaps of red and yellow fruit with twining leaves and tendrils that have grown by magic. Nor is there much resemblance to Japanese architecture. There also Lacquer and gold are employed to an unusual extent, but the flourishes, horns and finials, which in Burma spring from every corner and projection, are wanting and both Japanese and Chinese artists are more sparing and reticent. They distribute ornament so as to emphasize and lead up to the more important parts of their buildings, whereas the open-handed, Splendid loving Burman puts on every panel and pillar as much decoration as it will hold. The result must be looked at as a whole and not too minutely. The best work is the wood carving which has a freedom and boldness often missing in the minute 
and crowded designs of Indian art. Still, as a rule, it is at the risk of breaking the spell that you examine the details of Burmese ornamentation. Better rest content with your first amazement on beholding these carved and pinnacled piles of gold and vermilion, where the fantastic animals and plants seem about to break into life. The most celebrated shrine in Burma is the Sri Dagon Pagoda, which attracts pilgrims from all the Buddhist world. No descriptions of it gave me any idea of its real appearance, nor can I hope that I shall be more successful in giving the reader my own impressions. The pagoda itself is a gilt, bell-shaped mass rather higher than the dome of St. Paul's and terminating in a spire. It is set in the center of a raised mound or platform, approached by lofty flights of steps. The platform, which is paved and level, is of imposing dimensions, some 900 feet long and 700 wide. Round the base of the central pagoda is a row of shrines and another row runs along the edge of the platform so that one moves, as it were, in a street of these edifices, leading here and there into side squares where are quiet retreats with palm trees and gigantic images. But when, after climbing the long staircase, one first emerges on the platform, one does not realize the topography at once and seems to have entered suddenly into Jerusalem the Golden. Right and left are rows of gorgeous, fantastic sanctuaries, all gold, vermilion, and glass mosaic, and within them sit marble figures, bland, enigmatic personages who seem to invite approach but offer no explanation of the singular scene or the part they play in it. If analyzed in detail, the artistic merits of these shrines might be found small, but the total impression is unique. The Sri Dagon has not the qualities which usually distinguish great religious buildings. It is not specially impressive by its majesty or holiness. It is certainly wanting in order and arrangement. But on entering the platform, one feels that one has suddenly passed from this life into another and different world. It is not perhaps a very elevated world, certainly not the final repose of the just or the steps of the throne of God. But it is as if you were walking in the bazaars of paradise, one of those Buddhist paradises where the souls of the moderately pure find temporary rest from the world of transmigration where the very lotus flowers are golden and the leaves of the trees are golden bells that tinkle in the perfume breeze. End of section 5「Section 6 of Hinduism and Buddhism an historical sketch volume 3 」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Victor Seremet, Bucharest, Romania, victorseremet.com Hinduism and Buddhism an historical sketch volume 3 by Sir Charles Eliot Chapter 37 Siam The Buddhism of Siam 
doesn't differ materially from that of Burma and Ceylon, but merits separate mention since it has features of its own due in some measure to the fact that Siam is still an independent kingdom ruled by a monarch who is also head of the church. But whereas for the last few centuries this kingdom may be regarded as a political and religious unit, its condition in earlier times was different, and Siamese history tells us nothing of the introduction and first diffusion of Indian religions in the countries between India and China. The people commonly known as Siamese call themselves Thai, which in the form Thai appears to be the racial name of several tribes who can be traced to the southern provinces of China. They spread thence in fan-like fashion from Laos to Assam, and uh, the middle section ultimately descended the Menam to the sea. The Siamese claim to have assumed the name Thai, free, after they threw off the yoke of the Cambodians. But this derivation is more acceptable to politics than to ethnology. The territories which they inhabited were known as Siam, Siam or Siama, which is commonly identified with the Sanskrit Siama, dark or brown. But the names Shan and A, A Hom, A Hom seem to be variants of the same word in Siama, is possibly not its origin but a learned and artificial distortion. The Lao were another division of the same race who occupied the country now called Laos before the Thai had moved into Siam. This movement was gradual and uh, until the beginning of the 12th century they merely established small principalities, the principal of which was Lampun, on the western arm of the Mekong. They gradually penetrated into the kingdoms of Swan Kalok, Sukhothai and Lavo Lopburi, which then were vassals of Cambodia. And they were reinforced by another body of Thais, which moved southwards early in the 12th century. For some time the Cambodian Empire made a successful effort to control these immigrants, but in the later part of the 13th century the Siamese definitely shook off its yoke and founded an independent state with its capital at Sukhothai. There was probably some connection between these events and the southern expeditions of Kubilai Khan who in 1254 conquered Talifu and set the Thai tribes in motion. The history of their rule in Siam may be briefly described as a succession of three kingdoms with capitals at Sukhothai, Ayutthaya and Bangkok respectively. Like the Burmese, the Siamese have annals or chronicles. They fall into two divisions, the Chronicles of the Northern Kingdom in three volumes which go down to the foundation of Ayutthaya and are admitted even by the Siamese to be mostly fabulous, and the later annals in 40 volumes which were rearranged after the sack of Ayutthaya in 1767, but claim to begin with the foundation of the city. Various opinions have been expressed as to their trustworthiness, but it is allowed by all that they must be used with caution. More authoritative, but not very early, are the inscriptions set up by various kings, of which a considerable number have been published and translated. The early history of Sukhothai and its kings is not yet beyond dispute, but a monarch called Ramaraya or Rama Kombheng played a considerable part in it. 
his identity with Paya Ruang, who is said to have founded the dynasty and city, has been both affirmed and denied. Sukhothai, at least as the designation of a kingdom, seems to be much older than his reign. It was undoubtedly understood as uh, the equivalent of the Sanskrit Sukodaya, but like Siyama, it may be an adaptation of some native word. In an important inscription found at Sukhothai and now preserved at Bangkok, which was probably composed about 1300 AD, Rama Komeng gives an account of his kingdom. On the east, it extended to the banks of the Mekong and beyond it to Chava, perhaps a name of Luang Prabang. On the south, to the sea, as far as Sri Dharma Raya or Ligor. On the west, to Hamsavati or Pegu. This last statement is important for it enables us to understand how at this period, and no doubt considerably earlier, the Siamese were acquainted with Pali Buddhism. The king states that hitherto his people had no alphabet but that he invented one. This script subsequently developed into the modern Siamese writing, which, though it presents many difficulties, is an ingenious attempt to express a language with tones and in an alphabet. The vocabulary of Siamese is not homogeneous. It comprises a, a foundation of Thai, b, a considerable admixture of Khmer words, C. An element borrowed from Malay and other languages. D. Numerous ecclesiastical and learned terms taken from Pali and Sanskrit. There are five tones which must be distinguished if either written or spoken speech is to be intelligible. This is done partly by accent and partly by dividing the 44 consonants many of which are superfluous for other purposes, into three groups, the high, middle and deep. The king also speaks of religion. The court and the inhabitants of Sukhothai were devout Buddhists. They observed the season of Vasa and celebrated the festival of Katina with processions, concerts and reading of the scriptures. In the city were to be seen statues of the Buddha and scenes carved in relief as well as large monasteries. To the west of the city was the forest monastery presented to a distinguished elder who came from Sri Dharmaraya and had studied the whole Tripitaka. The mention of this official and other suggests that there was a regular hierarchy and the king relates how he exhumed certain sacred relics and built a pagoda over them. Though there is no direct allusion to Brahmanism, stress is laid on the worship of spirits and devas on which the prosperity of the kingdom depends. The form of Buddhism described seems to have differed little from the Hinayanism found in Siam today. Whence did the Siamese obtain it? For some centuries before they were known as a nation, they probably professed some form of Indian religion. They came from the borderlands, if not from the actual territory of China, and must have been acquainted with Chinese Buddhism. Also, Burmese influence probably reached Yunnan in the 8th century, but it is not easy to say what form of religion it brought with it. Still, when the Thai entered what is now Siam, it is likely that their religion was some form of Buddhism. While they were subject to Cambodia, they must have felt the influence of Shivaism and possibly of Mahayanist Sanskrit Buddhism, but no Pali Buddhism can have come from his quarter. Southern Siam was, however, to some extent affected by another wave of Buddhism. From early times, the eastern coast of India, 
and perhaps Ceylon had intercourse not only with Burma but with the Malay Peninsula. It is proved by inscriptions that the region of Ligor, formerly known as Sri Dharmaraya, was occupied by Hindus, who were probably Buddhists, at least as early as the 4th century AD. And Buddhist inscriptions have been found on the mainland opposite Penang. The Chinese annals allude to a change in the customs of Cambodia and Ai Ching says plainly that Buddhism once nourished there but was exterminated by a wicked king, which may mean that Hinayanist Buddhism had spread thither from Ligor but was suppressed by a dynasty of Shivaites. He also says that at the end of the 7th century, Hinayanism was prevalent in the islands of the Southern Sea. An inscription of about the 4th century found in Kedah and another of the 7th or 8th from Pra Patom both contain the formula E Dharma, etc. The later inscription, and also one from Mergui, ascribed to the 11th century, seem to be in mixed Sanskrit and Pali. The Sukhothai inscription, summarized above, tells how a learned monk was brought thither from Ligor, and clearly the Pali Buddhism of northern Siam may have followed the same route, but it probably had also another more important, if not exclusive, source, namely Burma. After the reign of Anarata Pali, Buddhism was accepted in Burma and in what we now call the Shan states as the religion of civilized mankind and this conviction found its way to the not very distant kingdom of Sukhothai. Subsequently, the Siamese recognized the seniority and authority of the Sinhalese church by inviting an instructor to come from Ceylon, but in earlier times they can hardly have had direct relation with the island. We have another picture of religious life in Khmer inscription of Lidaya or Sri Suryavamsa Rama, composed in 1361 or a little later. This monarch, who is also known by many lengthy titles, appears to have been a man of learning who had studied the Tipitaka, the Vedas, the Sastragama and the Dharmanaya and erected images of Mahesvara and Vishnu as well as of the Buddha. In 1361, he sent a messenger to Ceylon charged with the task of bringing back a metropolitan or head of the Sangha learned in the Pitakas. This ecclesiastic, who is known only by his title, was duly sent and on arriving in Siam was received with the greatest honor and made a triumphal progress to Sukhothai. He is not represented as introducing a new religion. The impression left by the inscription is rather that the king and his people, being already well instructed in Buddhism, desired ampler edification from an authentic source. The arrival of the Sangharaya coincided with the beginning of Vasa and at the end of the sacred season the king dedicated a golden image of the Buddha which stood in the midst of the city and then entered the order. In doing so, he solemnly declared his hope that the merit thus acquired might make him in future lives not an emperor, an Indra or a Brahma, but a Buddha able to save mankind. He pursued his religious career with a gratifying accompaniment of miracles and many of the nobility and learned professions followed his example. But after a while a deputation waited on his majesty begging him to return to the business of his kingdom. An edifying contest ensued. The monks besought him to stay as their preceptor and guide. The laity pointed out that government was at an end and claimed his attention. The matter was referred to the Sangharaja, who decided that the king ought to return to his secular duties. 
he appears to have found little difficulty in resuming lay habits, for he proceeded to chastise the people of Luang Prabang. Two other inscriptions, apparently dating from this epoch, relate that a cutting of the bow tree was brought from Ceylon and that certain relics, perhaps from Patna, were also installed with great solemnity. To the same time are referred a series of engravings on stone, not reliefs, found in the Vatsi Jum at Sukhothai. They illustrate about 100 Jatakas, arranged for the most part according to the order followed in the Pali Canon. The facts that uh, King Shri Suryavamsa sent to Ceylon for his metropolitan and that some of the inscriptions which extol his merits are in Pali make it probable that the religion which he professed differed little from the Pali Buddhism which flourishes in Siam today and this supposition is confirmed by the general tone of his inscriptions. But still, several phrases in them have a Mahayanist flavor. He takes as his model the conduct of the Bodhisattvas described as ten-headed by Metea, and his vow to become a Buddha and save all creatures is at least twice mentioned. The Buddhas are said to be innumerable and the feet of bhikkhus are called Buddha feet. There is no difficulty in accounting for the presence of such ideas. The only question is from what quarter this Mahayanist influence came. The king is said to have been a student of Indian literature. His country, like Burma, was in touch with China and his use of the Khmer language indicates contact with Cambodia. Another inscription engraved by order of Dharmasokaraja and apparently dating from the 14th century is, is remarkable for its clear statement of the doctrine generally considered as Mahayanist that merit acquired by devotion to the Buddha can be transferred. The king states that a woman called Bunrak has transferred all her merit to the queen and that he himself makes over all his merit to his teacher, to his relations and to all beings in unhappy states of existence. At some time in this period the center of the Thai Empire changed but divergent views have been held as to the date and character of this event. It would appear that in 1350 a Siamese subsequently known as King Ramadipati, a descendant of an ancient line of Thai princes, founded Ayutthaya as a rival to Sukhothai. The site was not new, for it had long been known as Dvaravati and seems to be mentioned under that name by Ai Ching around 608 circa 680 but a new city was apparently constructed. The evidence of inscriptions indicates that Sukhothai was not immediately subdued by the new kingdom and didn't cease to be a royal residence for some time. But still Ayutthaya gradually became predominant and in the 15th century merited the title of capital of Siam. Its rise didn't affect the esteem in which Buddhism was held, and it must have contained many great religious monuments. The jungles which now cover the site of the city surround the remnants of the Wat Somarokot, in which is a gigantic bronze Buddha facing with scornful calm the ruin which threatens him. The wet charn, which lies at some distance, contains another gigantic image. A curious inscription engraved on an image of Shiva found at Sukhothai and dated 1510 AD asserts the identity of Buddhism and Brahmanism, but the popular feeling was in favor of the former. At Ayutthaya, the temples appear to be exclusively Buddhist, and Lopburi, ancient buildings originally constructed for the Brahmanic cult, have been adapted to Buddhist uses. 
It was in 1602 that the mark known as the footprint of Buddha was discovered at the place now called Prabhat. Ayutthaya was captured by the Burmese in 1568 and the king was carried into captivity, but the disaster was not permanent, for at the end of the century the power of the Siamese reached its highest point and their foreign relations were extensive. We hear that 500 Japanese assisted them to repulse a Burmese attack and that there was a large Japanese colony in Ayutthaya. On the other hand, when uh, Hideyoshi invaded Korea in 1592, the Siamese offered to assist the Chinese. Europeans appeared first in 1511 when the Portuguese took Malacca. But on the whole, the dealings of Siam with Europe were peaceful and both traders and missionaries were welcomed. The most singular episode in this international intercourse was the career of the Greek adventurer Konstantin Falcon, who in the reign of King Narai was practically foreign minister. In concert with the French missionaries, he arranged an exchange of embassies 1682 and 1685 between Narai and Louis XIV, the latter having been led to suppose that the king and people of Siam were ready to embrace Christianity. But when the French envoys broached the subject of conversion, the king replied that he saw no reason to change the religion which his countrymen had professed for 2,000 years, a chronological statement which it might be hard to substantiate. Still, great facilities were given to missionaries and further negotiations ensued, in the course of which the French received almost a monopoly of foreign trade and the right to maintain garrisons. But the death of Narai was followed by a reaction. Falcon died in prison and the French garrisons were expelled. Buddhism probably flourished at this period, for the Mahavamsa tells us that the king of Ceylon sent to Ayutthaya for monks in 1750 because religion there was pure and undefiled. Ayutthaya continued to be the capital until 1767, when it was laid in ruins by the Burmese, who thought Buddhists did not scruple to destroy or deface the temples and statues with which it was ornamented. But the collapse of the Siamese was only local and temporary. A leader of Chinese origin named Payatak Sin rallied their forces, cleared the Burmese out of the country and made Bangkok, officially described as the capital of the angels, the seat of government. But he was deposed in 1782, and one of the reasons for his fall seems to have been a too zealous reformation of Buddhism. In the troublous time following the collapse of Ayutthaya, the church had become disorganized and corrupt, but even those who desired improvement would not ascend to the powers which the king claimed over monks. A new dynasty, of which the sixth monarch is now on the throne, was founded in 1782 by Chao Paya Chakri. One of his first acts was to convoke a council for the revision of the Tipitaka and to build a special hall in which the text thus agreed on was preserved. His successor, Pra Buddha Lot La, is considered the best poet that Siam has produced and it is probably the only country in the world where this distinction has fallen to the lot of sovereign. The poet king had two sons, Pra Nan Klao, who ascended the throne after his death, and Mon Kut, who during his brother's reign remained in a monastery strictly observing the duties of a monk. He then became king and during his reign, 1851 to 1868, Siam may be said to have passed from the Middle Ages to the modern times. It is a tribute to the excellence of Buddhist discipline that a prince who spent 26 years as a monk should have emerged as neither a bigot nor an impractical mystic, but as an active, enlightened and progressive monarch. 
The equality and simplicity of monastic life disposed him to come into direct touch with his subjects and to adapt straightforward measures which might not have occurred to one who had always been surrounded by a wall of ministers. While still a monk, he founded a stricter sect which aimed at reviving the practice of the Buddha. But at the same time, he studied foreign creeds and took pleasure in conversing with missionaries. He wrote several historical pamphlets and an English grammar, and was so good a mathematician that he could calculate the occurrence of an eclipse. When he became king, he regulated the international position of Siam by concluding treaties of friendship and commerce with the principal European powers, thus showing the broad and liberal spirit in which he regarded politics. Though a better acquaintance with the ways of Europeans might have made him refuse them extraterritorial privileges. He abolished the custom which obliged everyone to keep indoors when the king went out and he publicly received petitions on every Uposata day. He legislated against slavery, gambling, drinking spirits and smoking opium and considerably improved the status of women. He also published edicts ordering the laity to inform the ecclesiastical authorities if they noticed any abuses in the monasteries. He caused the annals of Siam to be edited and issued numerous orders on archaeological and literary questions, in which, though a good Pali scholar, he deprecated the affected use of Pali words and enjoined the use of a terse and simple Siamese style, which he certainly wrote himself. He appears to have died of scientific zeal, for he caught a fatal fever on a trip which he took to witness a total eclipse of the sun. He was succeeded by his son Chulalongkorn, 1868-1911, a liberal and enlightened ruler who had the misfortune to lose much territory to the French on one side and the English on the other. For religion, his chief interest is that he published an edition of the Tipitaka. The volumes are of European style and printed in Siamese type. Various Cambodian characters were previously employed for religious works. As I have already observed, there is not much difference between Buddhism in Burma and Siam. In medieval times, a mixed form of religion prevailed in both countries and Siam was influenced by the Brahmanism and Mahayanism of Cambodia. Both seem to have derived a purer form of the faith from Pegu, which was conquered by Anavrata in the 11th century and was the neighbor of Sukhothai so long as that kingdom lasted. Both had relations with Ceylon and, while venerating her as the metropolis of the faith, also sent monks to her in the days of her spiritual decadence. But even in externals some differences are visible. The gold and vermilion of Burma are replaced in Siam by more sober but artistic tints, olive, dull purple and dark orange, and the change in the color scheme is accompanied by other changes in the buildings. A religious establishment in Siam consists of several edifices and is generally known as Wet, followed by some special designation such as Wet Chang. Bangkok is full of such establishments mostly constructed on the banks of the river or canals. The entrance is usually guarded by gigantic and grotesque figures which are often lions. But at the Wat Po in Bangkok, the tutelary demons are represented by curious caricatures of Europeans wearing tall hats. The gate leads into several courts opening out of one another and not arranged on any fixed plan. The first is sometimes surrounded by a colonnade in which are set a long line of the Buddha's 80 disciples. The most important building in a wet is known as Bot. It has a colonnade of pillars outside and is surmounted by three or four roofs, not much raised one above the other, and bearing finials of a curious shape said to represent a snake's head. 
It is also marked off by a circuit of eight stones cut in the shape of bow tree leaves, which constitute a sima or boundary. It is in the boat that ordinations and other acts of Sangha are performed. Internally it is a hall. The walls are often covered with paintings and at the end there is always a sitting figure of the Buddha, forming the apex of a pyramid, the lower steps of which are decorated with smaller images and curious ornaments, such as clocks under glass cases. The walls are often covered with paintings and at the end there is always a sitting figure of the Buddha forming the apex of a pyramid, the lower steps of which are decorated with smaller images and curious ornaments, such as clocks under glass cases. Siamese images of the Buddha generally represent him as crowned by a long flame-like ornament called Shiro Rot, probably representing the light supposed to issue from the prominence on his head. But the ornament sometimes becomes a veritable crown, terminating in a spire as do those worn by the kings of Cambodia and Siam. On the left and right of the Buddha often stand figures of Pra, Moka, La, Mog, Galana and Pra, Saribut, Sariputta. It is stated that the Siamese pray to them as saints and that the former is invoked to heal broken limbs. The Buddha, when represented in frescoes, is robed in red, but his face and hands are of gold. Besides the boat, a wat contains one or more vihans. The word is derived from vihara, but has come to mean an image house. The vihans are holes not unlike the boats, but smaller. In a large wet, there is usually one containing a gigantic recumbent image of the Buddha and they sometimes shelter Indian deities such as Yama. In most, if not in all wet, there are structures known as pra, shedi and pra, prang. The former are simply the ancient setias, called dagobas in Ceylon and zedis in Burma. They don't depart materially from the shape usual in other countries and sometimes, for instance, in the gigantic shedi at Pra Pratom. The part below the spire is a solid bell-shaped dome. But Siamese taste tends to make such buildings slender and elongate and they generally consist of stone discs of decreasing size, set one on the other in a pile which assumes in its upper parts the proportions of a flagstaff rather than of a stone building. The pra pranks, though often larger than the pra chedis, are proportionally thicker and less elongate. They appear to be derived from the Brahmanic temple towers of Cambodia, which consist of a shrine crowned by a dome. But in Siam, the shrine is often at some height above the ground and is reduced to small dimensions, sometimes becoming a mere niche. In large pra, pranks, it is approached by a flight of steps outside and above, it rises the tower, terminating in a metal spire, but whereas in pra, chedis, these spires are simple. In the pra, prangs, they bear three crescents, representing the trident of Shiva and appear like barbed arrows. A large wat is sure to contain a number of these structures and may also comprise holes for preaching, a pavilion covering a model of Buddha's footprint, tanks for ablution and a bell tower. It is said that only royal wats contain libraries and buildings called Chatamuk, which shelter a four-faced image of a Brahma. The monks are often housed in single chambers arranged around the courts of a wat, but sometimes in larger buildings outside it. The number of monks or novices living in one monastery is larger than in Burma, 
And according to the Bangkok directory, 1907 works out at an average of about 12. In the larger watts this figure is considerably exceeded. Altogether there were 50,764 monks and 10,411 novices in 1907. The province of Ayutthaya being decidedly the best provided with clergy. As in Burma, it is customary for every male to spend some time in a monastery, usually at the age of about 20, and two months is considered the minimum which is respectable. It is also common to enter a monastery for a short stay on the day when a parent is cremated. During the season of Vasa, all monks go out to collect alms, but at other seasons only a few make the daily round and the food collected, as in Burma and Ceylon, is generally not eaten. But during the dry season it is considered meritorious for monks to make a pilgrimage to Prabhat and while on the way to live on charity. They engage to some extent in manual work and occupy themselves with carpentering. As in Burma, education is in their hands, and they also act as doctors, though their treatment has more to do with charms and faith cures than with medicine. As in Burma, there are two sects, the ordinary and reformed body and the rigorous and select communion founded by Mong Kut and called Damayut. It aims at a more austere and useful life, but in outward observances the only distinction seems to be that the Damayuts hold the alms bowl in front of them in both hands, whereas the other hold it against the left hip with the left hand only. The hierarchy is well developed, but somewhat secularized, though probably not more so than it was in India under Asoka. In the official directory where the departments of the Ministry of Public Instruction are enumerated, the ecclesiastical department comes immediately after the bacteriological, the two being clearly regarded as different methods of expelling evil spirits. The higher clerical appointments are made by the king. He names four primates, one of whom is selected as chief. The primates, with 19 superior monks, form the highest governing body of the church. Below them are 12 dignitaries called gurus, who are often heads of large wats. There are also prelates who bear the Cambodian title of Burian equivalent to Mahakariya. They must have passed an examination in Pali and are chiefly consulted on matters of ceremonial. It will thus be seen that the differences between the churches of Burma, Ceylon and Siam are slight, hardly more than the local peculiarities which mark the Roman church in Italy, Spain and England. Different opinions have been expressed as to the moral tone and conduct of Siamese monks and most critics state that they are somewhat inferior to their Burmese brethren. The system by which a village undertakes to support a monk, provided that he is a reasonably competent school, master and of good character, works well. But in the larger monasteries it is admitted that there are inmates who have entered in the hope of leading a lazy life and even fugitives from justice. Still, the penalty for any grave offense is immediate expulsion by the ecclesiastical authorities and the offender is treated with extreme severity by the civil court, to which he then becomes amenable. The religious festivals of Siam are numerous and characteristic. Many are Buddhist, some are Brahmanic and some are royal. Uposata days, when pra, are observed much as in Burma, the birth, enlightenment and death of the Buddha, which are all supposed to have taken place on the 15th day of the 6th waxing moon, are celebrated during a three days festival. 
These three days are of peculiar solemnity and are spent in the discharge of religious duties, such as hearing sermons and giving alms. But at most festivals, religious observances are mingled with much picturesque but secular gaiety. In the morning, the monks don't go their usual round, and the alms bowls are arranged in a line within the temple grounds. The laity, mostly women, arrive bearing wicker trays on which are vessels containing rice and delicacies. They place a selection of these in each bowl and then proceed to the boat where they hear the commandments recited and often vow to observe for that day some which are usually binding only on monks. While the monks are eating their meal, the people repair to a river, which is rarely far distant in Siam, and pour water drop by drop, saying, May the food which we have given for the use of the holy ones be of benefit to our fathers and mothers and to all of our relatives who have passed away. This rite is curiously in harmony with the injunctions of the Tirokuda Sutam in the Kuda Kapata, which is probably an ancient work. The rest of the day is usually devoted to pious merrymaking, such as processions by day and illuminations by night. On some feasts, the laws against gambling are suspended and various games of chance are freely indulged in. Does the New Year festival called Trut or Krut Tay last three days? On the first two days, especially the second, crowds fill the temples to offer flowers before the statues of Buddha and more substantial presents of food close to the clergy. Well-to-do families invite monks to their houses and pass the day in listening to their sermons and recitations. Companies of priests are posted around the city walls to scare away evil spirits and with the same object guns are fired throughout the night. But the third day is devoted to gambling by almost the whole population except the monks. Not dissimilar is the celebration of the Songkran holidays at the beginning of the official year. The special religious observance at this feast consists in bathing the images of Buddha and in theory the same form of watery respect is extended to aged relatives and monks. In practice its place is taken by gifts of perfumes and other presents. The rainy season is preceded and ended by holidays. During this period, both monks and pious laymen observe their religious duties more strictly. Thus, monks eat only once a day and then only what is put into their bowls and laymen observe some of the minor vows. At the end of the rains come the important holidays known as Tot Katin, when robes are presented to monks. This festival has long had a special importance in Siam. Thus Rama Komeng in his inscription of AD 1292 describes the feast of Katina which lasts a month. At the present day many thousands of robes are prepared in the capital alone so as to be ready for distribution in October and November, when the king or some deputy of high rank visits every temple and makes the offering in person. During this season Bangkok witnesses a series of brilliant processions. These festivals mentioned may be called Buddhist, though their light-hearted and splendor-loving gaiety, their processions and gambling are far removed from the spirit of Gotama. Others, however, are definitely Brahmanic and in Bangkok are superintended by the Brahmans attached to the court. Since the time of Mongkut Buddhists, priests are also present as a sign that the rites, if not ordered by Buddhism, at least have its countenance. Such is the Rekna or Plowing Festival. The king is represented by the Minister of Agriculture, who formerly had the right to exact from all shops found open such taxes as he might claim for his temporary sovereignty. 
At present, he is escorted in procession to Dusit, a royal park outside Bangkok, where he breaks ground with a plow drawn by the two white oxen. Somewhat similar is the Thib Ching Cha, or Swinging Holidays, a two days festival which seems to be a harvest thanksgiving. Under the supervision of a high official, four Brahmans wearing tall conical hats swing on a board suspended from a huge frame about 100 feet high. Their object is to catch with their teeth a bag of money hanging at a little distance from the swing. When three or four sets of swingers have obtained a prize in this way, they conclude the ceremony by sprinkling the ground with holy water contained in bullock horns. Swinging is one of the earliest Indian rites, and as part of the worship of Krishna, it has lasted to the present day. Yet another Brahmanic festival is the Loi Katong, when miniature rafts and ships bearing lights and offerings are sent down the Menam to the sea. Another class of ceremonies may be described as royal inasmuch as they are religious only in so far as they invoke religion to protect royalty, such are the anniversaries of the birth and coronation of the king and the two nam, or drinking of the water of allegiance which takes place twice a year. At Bangkok, all officials assemble at the palace and their drink and sprinkle on their heads water in which swords and other weapons have been dipped, thus invoking vengeance on themselves should they prove disloyal. Jars of this water are dispatched to governors who superintend the performance of the same ceremony in the provincial capitals. It is only after the water has been drunk that officials receive their half-early salary. Monks are excused from drinking it, but the chief ecclesiastics of Bangkok meet in the palace temple and perform a service in honor of the occasion. Besides these public solemnities, there are a number of domestic festivals derived from the twelve samskaras of the Hindus. Of these, only three or four are kept up by the nations of Indochina, namely the shaving of the first hair of a child a month after birth, the giving of a name and the piercing of the ears for earrings. This last is observed in Burma and Laos, but not in Siam and Cambodia, where is substituted for it the con chuk or shaving of the top knot, which is allowed to grow until the 11th or 13th year. This ceremony, which is performed on boys and girls alike, is the most important event in the life of a young Siamese and is celebrated by well-to-do parents with lavish expenditure. Those who are indigent often avail themselves of the royal bounty. For each year a public ceremony is performed in one of the temples of Bangkok at which poor children receive the tonsure gratis. An elaborate description of the tonsure rites has been published by Jorini. They are of considerable interest as showing how closely Buddhist and Brahmanic rites are intertwined in Siamese family life. Marriages are celebrated with a feast to which monks are invited but are not regarded as religious ceremonies. The dead are usually disposed of by cremation, but are often kept some time being either embalmed or simply buried and exhumed subsequently. Before cremation, the coffin is usually placed within the grounds of a temple. The monks read suttas over it and it is said that they hold ribbons which enter into the coffin and are supposed to communicate to the corpse the merit acquired by the recitations and prayers. 3. In the preceding pages mention has often been made not only of Brahmanic rites but of Brahman priests. These are still to be found in Bangkok attached to the court and possibly in other cities. They dress in white and have preserved many Hindu usages but are said to be poor Sanskrit scholars. 
Indeed, Gerini seems to say that they use Pali in some of their recitations. Their principal duty is to officiate at court functions, but wealthy families invite them to take part in domestic rites and also to cast horoscopes and fix lucky days. It is clear that the presence of these Brahmans is no innovation. Brahmanism must have been strong in Siam when it was a province of Cambodia, but in both countries gave way before Buddhism. Many rites, however, connected with securing luck or predicting the future were too firmly established to be abolished, and as Buddhist monks were unwilling to perform them or not thought very competent, the Brahmans remained and were perhaps reinforced from time to time by new importations for there are still Brahman colonies in Ligor and other Malay towns. Siamese law books, like those of Burma, seem to be mainly adaptations of Indian Dharmasastras. On a cursory inspection, Siamese Buddhism, especially as seen in villages, seems remarkably free from alien additions. But an examination of ancient buildings of royal temples in Bangkok and the royal ceremonial suggests, on the contrary, that it is a mixed faith in which the Brahmanic element is strong. Yet though this element appeals to the superstition of the Siamese and their love of pageantry, I think that, as in Burma, it has not invaded the sphere of religion and ethics more than the Pitakas themselves allow. In art and literature, its influence has been considerable. The story of the Ramayana is illustrated on the cloister walls of the royal temple at Bangkok, and Indian mythology has supplied a multitude of types to the painter and sculptor, such as Yoma, Rat, Yama, Paya, Man, Mara, Pra, In, Indra. These are all deities known to the Pitakas, but the sculptures or images in Siamese temples also include Ganesha, Pra, Narai, Narayana or Vishnu, riding on the Garuda and Pra, Isuyen, Shiva, riding on a bull. There is a legend that a Buddha and Shiva tried which could make himself invisible to the other. At last, the Buddha sat on Shiva's head and the god, being unable to see him, acknowledged his defeat. This story is told to explain a small figure which Shiva bears on his head and recalls the legend found in the Pitakas, that the Buddha made himself invisible to Brahma but that Brahma had not the corresponding power. Lingas are still venerated in a few temples, for instance at Wet Po in Bangkok, but it would appear that the majority, those found at Pra Pratom and Lof Buri, are survivals of ancient Brahmanic worship and have a purely antiquarian importance. The Brahmanic cosmology which makes M.T. Meru the center of his universe is generally accepted in ecclesiastical treaties and paintings, though the educated Siamese may smile at it, and when the top knot of a Siamese prince is cut off, part of the ceremony consists in his being received by the king dressed as Shiva, on the summit of a mound cut in the traditional shape of M.T. Kailasa. Like the nuts of Burma, Siam has a spirit population known as Peace. The name is occasionally applied to Indian deities, but the great majority of Peace fall into two classes, namely ghosts of the dead and nature spirits which, though dangerous, don't rise above the position of good or bad fairies. In the first class are included the P. Pret, who have the characteristics as well as the name of the Indian Pretas, and also a multitude of beings who, like European ghosts, haunt houses and behave in a mysterious but generally disagreeable manner. 
The PM is apparently our nightmare. The ghosts of children dying soon after birth are up to kill their mothers and in general women are liable to be possessed by peace. The ghosts of those who have died a violent death are dangerous but it would seem that Siamese magicians know how to utilize them as familiar spirits. The better sort of ghosts are known as Chao Pi and shrines called San Chao are set up in their honor. It does not however appear that there is any hierarchy of peace like the 37 nuts of Burma. Among those bees who are not ghosts of the dead, the most important is the Pi Ruen or guardian spirit of each house. Frequently a little shrine is erected for him at the top of a pole. There are also innumerable bees in the jungle, mostly malevolent and capable of appearing either in human form or as a dangerous animal. But the tree spirits are generally benevolent and when their trees are cut down, they protect the houses that are made of them. Thus the Buddhism of Siam, like that of Burma, has a certain admixture of Brahmanism and animism. The Brahmanism is perhaps more striking than in Burma on account of the court ceremonies. The belief in spirits, though almost universal, seems to be more retiring and less conspicuous. Yet the inscription of Rama Kom Heng mentioned above asserts emphatically that the prosperity of the empire depends on due honor being shown to a certain mountain spirit. It is pretty clear that the first introduction of Hinayanist Buddhism into Siam was from southern Burma and Pegu but somewhat later Ceylon was accepted as the standard of orthodoxy. A learned Tera who knew the Sinhalese Tipitaka was imported thence, as well as a branch of Bo tree. But Siamese patriotism flattered itself by imagining that the national religion was due to personal contact with the Buddha. Although not even early legends can be cited in support of such traditions. In 1602, a mark in the rocks, now known as the Pra, but was discovered in the hills north to Ayutthaya and identified as a footprint of the Buddha, similar to that found on Adam's Peak and in other places. Burma and Ceylon both claim the honor of a visit from the Buddha, but the Siamese go further, for it is popularly believed that he died at Pratan, a little to the north of Pra Patom, on a spot marked by a slab of rock under great trees. For this reason, when the government of India presented the king of Siam with the relics found in the Biprava vase, the gift, though received with honor, aroused little enthusiasm and was placed in a somewhat secluded shrine. End of section 6「Section 7 of Hinduism and Buddhism, a historical sketch, volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cristina Ordonez, Claremont, Florida. Hinduism and Buddhism, a historical sketch, volume 3, by Sir Charles Eliot. Chapter 38, Cambodia. 1. The French protector of Cambodia corresponds roughly to the nucleus, though by no means to the whole extent of the former empire of the Khmers. The affinities of this race had given rise to considerable discussion and has been proposed to connect them with the Munda tribes of India on one side and with the Malays and Polynesians on the other. They are allied linguistically to the Mons or Talings of Lower Burma and to the Cassius of Assam, but it is not proved that they are similarly related to the Anamites. And recent investigators are not disposed to maintain the Mon and Nam family of languages proposed by Logan and others. But the undoubted similarity of the Mon and Khmer languages suggests that the ancestors of those who now speak them were one time spread over the central and western parts of Indochina, but were subsequently divided and deprived of much territory by southward invasions of Thais in the Middle Ages. 
The Khmers also call themselves Cambodia or Cambodia, and their name for their country is still either Shuruk Cambodia or Shuruk Khmer. Attempts have been made to find a Malay origin for this name, Cambodia, but native tradition regards it as a link with Indian and affirms that the race is descended from Kambu Sveyambuva and Meta or Pera, who was given to him by Shiva as wife. This legend hardly proves that the Khmer people came from India, but they undoubtedly received thence their civilization, their royal family, and a considerable number of Hindu immigrants, so that the mythical ancestor of their kings naturally came to be regarded as the progenitor of the race. The Chinese traveler Cao Ho Tao Quan says that the country known to the Chinese as Shanla is called by the natives Kampo Chi, but that the present-day dynasty call it Kampo Chi on the authority of Sanskrit works. The origin of the name Shenla is unknown. There has been much discussion respecting the relation of Shenla to the older kingdom of Fayunan, which is the name given by Chinese historians until the early part of the 7th century to a state occupying the southeastern and perhaps central portions of Indochina. It has been argued that Shenla is simply the older name of Fayunan, and on the other hand that Fayunan is a wider designation including several states, one of which, Shenla, or Cambodia, became paramount at the expense of the others. But the point seems unimportant for their religious history with which we have to deal. In religion in general, civilization both were subject to Indian influence, and it is not recorded that the political circumstances which turned Fayunan into Shenla were attended by any religious revolution. The most important fact in the history of these countries, as in Champa and Java, is the presence from early times of Indian influence as a result of commerce, colonization, or conquest. Orientalists have only recently freed themselves from the idea that the ancient Hindus, and especially their religion, were restricted to the limits of India. In medieval times, this was true. Immigration was rare, and it was only in the 19th century that the traveling Hindu became a familiar, and in some British colonies, not very welcome visitor. Even now, Hindus of the higher caste evade rather than deny the rule which forbids them to cross the ocean. But for a long while, Hindus have frequented the coast of East Africa, and in earlier centuries, their traders, soldiers, and missionaries covered considerable distances by sea. The Jatakas mentioned voyages to Babylon. Vijaya and Mahinda reached Ceylon in the 5th and 3rd centuries BC, respectively. There is no certain evidence as to the epoch when Hindus first penetrated beyond the Malay Peninsula, but Java is mentioned in the Ramayana. The earliest Sanskrit inscriptions of Champa date from our 3rd or perhaps 2nd century, and the Chinese annals of Sin indicate that a period considerably anterior to that dynasty were Hindus in Feiyunan. It is therefore safe to conclude that they must have reached these regions about the beginning of the Christian era, and, should any evidence be forthcoming, there is no reason why this date should not be put further back. At present, we can only say that the establishment of Hindu kingdoms probably implies earlier visits of Hindu traders, and that voyages to the south coast of Indochina and the archipelago were probably preceded by settlements on the Isthmus of Kra, for instance, at Lagor. The motives which prompted this eastern movement have been variously connected with religious persecution in India, missionary enterprise, commerce, and political adventure. The first is the least probable. There is little evidence for the systematic persecution of Buddhists in India, and still less for the persecution of Brahmins by Buddhists. Nor can these Indian settlements be regarded as primarily religious missions. The Brahmins have always been willing to follow and supervise the progress of Hindu civilization, but they have never shown any disposition to evangelize foreign countries apart from Hindu settlements in them. The Buddhists had this evangelistic temper, and the journeys of their missionaries doubtless stimulated other classes to go abroad, but still no inscriptions or annals suggest that the Hindu migrations to Java and Cambodia were parallel to Mahinda's mission to Ceylon. Nor is there any reason to think that they were commanded or encouraged by Indian Rayas, for no mention of their dispatches has been found in India, and no Indian state is recorded to have claimed suzerainty over these colonies. It therefore seems likely that they were founded by traders, and also by adventurers who followed existing trade routes and had their own reasons for leaving India. 
In a country where dynastic quarrels were frequent, and the younger son of Rios had a precarious tenure of life, such reasons can easily be imagined. In Cambodia, we find an Indian dynasty established after a short struggle, but in other countries, such as Java and Sumatra, Indian civilization endured because it was freely adopted by native chiefs and not because it was forced on them as a result of conquest. The inscriptions discovered in Cambodia and deciphered by the labors of French savants offer with one lacuna a fairly continuous history of the country from the 6th to the 13th centuries. For earlier periods, we depend almost entirely on Chinese accounts which are fragmentary and not interested in anything but the occasional relations of China and Fei Yunnan. The annals of the Sin dynasty already said that from 265 AD onwards, the kings of Fei Yunnan sent several embassies to the Chinese court, adding that the people have books and that their writing resembles that of the Hua. The Hua are properly speaking a tribe of Central Asia, but the expression Taoist means no more than alphabetical writing as opposed to Chinese characters, and such an alphabet can hardly have had other than an Indian origin. Originally, adds the analyst, the sovereign was a woman, but there came a stranger called Hu Wanwei, who worshipped the Davis, and had a dream in which one of them gave him a bow and ordered him to sail to Fei Yunnan. He conquered the country and married the queen, but his descendants deteriorated, and one fan soon founded another dynasty. The annals of the Qi dynasty give substantially the same story, but said that the stranger was called Hyun Tian, and that he came from Qi or Chao, an unknown locality. The same annals state that towards the end of the 5th century, the king of Fei Yunnan, who bore the family name of Xiao Shenzu, or Kodinya, and the personal name of Sheyu Pomo, traded with Canton. A Buddhist monk named Nagasena returned thence with some Cambodian merchants, and so impressed this king with his account of China that he was sent back in 484 to beg for the protection of the emperor. The king's petition and a supplementary paper by Nagasena are preserved in the annals. They seem to be an attempt to represent the country as Buddhist, while explaining that Maasvara is its tutelary deity. The Li Yang annals also state that during the Wu dynasty, Fan Chan, then king of Fei Yunnan, sent a relative named Su Wu on an embassy to India, to a king called Maolun, which probably represents Marunda, a people of the Ganges Valley mentioned by the Puranas and by Pythalami. This king dispatched a return embassy to Fei Yunnan, and his ambassadors met there an official sent by the Emperor of China. The early data ascribed to these events is noticeable. The Li Yang annals contain also the following statements. Between the years 357 and 424 AD, named as the dates of embassy sent to China, an Indian Brahmin called Xia Shenzhu heard a supernatural voice bidding him to go and reign in Fei Yunnan. He met with a good reception and was elected king. He changed the customs of the country and made them conform to those of India. One of his successors, Jayavarman, sent a choral image of Buddha in 503 to the emperor Wu Ti. The inhabitants of Fei Yunnan are said to make bronze images of the heavenly Jinyai with two or four heads and four or eight arms. Jayavarman was succeeded by an usurper named Liao Topomo, who sent an image made of sandalwood to the emperor in 519 and in 539 offered him a hair of the Buddha 12 feet long. The Sui Anal state that the Citrusina, king of Shenla, conquered Fei Yunnan and was succeeded by his son Isanasina. Two monks of Fei Yunnan are mentioned among the translators of the Chinese scriptures namely Sangapala and Mandra. Both arrived in China during the first years of the 6th century, and their works are extant. The pilgrim Aixing, who returned from India in 695, says that to the SW of Champa lies the country of Ponan, formerly called Feiyunan, which is the southern corner of Jambodvipa. He says that of old, it was a country the inhabitants of which lived naked. The people were mostly worshippers of Devas, and later on, Buddhism flourished there. But a wicked king has now expelled and exterminated them all, and there are no members of the Buddhist Brotherhood at all. These data from Chinese authorities are on the whole confirmed by the Cambodian inscriptions. 
Rudrovamin is mentioned, and the kings claim to belong to the race of Kodinya. This is the name of a Brahmin Godra, but such designations were not often borne by Kshatriyas, and the conqueror of Cambodia probably belonged to that caste. It may be affirmed with some certainty that he started from southeastern India, and possibly he sailed from Mahabalipur. Masula Patnam was also a port of embarkation for the east and was connected with Brooch by a trade running through Tagada, now Ter, in the Nizam's dominion. By using this road, it was possible to avoid the west coast, which was infested by pirates. The earliest Cambodian inscriptions date from the beginning of the 7th century and are written in an alphabet closely resembling that of the inscriptions in the temple of Papanatha at Patatakul in the Bijapur district. They are composed in Sanskrit verse of a somewhat exuberant style, which reveals in the commonplaces of Indian poetry. The deities most frequently mentioned are Shiva by himself and Shiva united with Vishnu in the form of Harihara. The names of the kings end in Varman, and this termination is also specifically frequent in the names of the Pallava dynasty. The magnificent monuments still extend attest a taste for architecture on a large scale similar to that found among the Dravidians. These and many other indications justify the conclusion that the Indian civilization and religion, which became predominant in Cambodia, were imported from Deccan. The Chinese accounts distinctively mention two invasions, one under Xiao Shanju about 400 AD and one considerably anterior to 265 under Hian Tian. It might be supposed that this name also represents Kodinya, and that there is a confusion of dates, but the available evidence is certainly in favor of the establishment of Hindu civilization in Feiyunan long before 400 AD, and there is nothing improbable in the story of the two invasions and even of the two Kodinyas. Maspero suggests that the first invasion came from Java and formed part of the same movement which founded the Kingdom of Champa. It is remarkable that an inscription in Sanskrit found on the east coast of Borneo and apparently dating from the 5th century mentions Kundaga as the grandfather of the reigning king, and the Liayong annals say that the king of Pali was called Xiao Shenju. It seems likely that the Indian family of Kodinya was established somewhere in the South Seas at an early period and thence invaded various countries at various times. But Feiyunan is a vague geographical term, and it may be that the Hyon Tian founded a Hindu dynasty in Champa. It is clear that during the period of the inscriptions, the religion of Cambodia was a mixture of Brahmanism and Buddhism, the only change noticeable being the preponderance of one or other element in different centuries. But it would be interesting to know the value of Aishing's statement that Buddhism flourished in Feiyunan in early times and was then subverted by a wicked king by whom Bavivarman may be meant. Prima facie, the statement is not improbable, for there is no reason why the first immigrants should not have been Buddhist, but the traditions connecting these countries with early Hinayanist missionaries are vague. Taranatha states that the disciples of Vasubandhu introduced Buddhism into the country of Koki, but his authority does not count for much in such a manner. The statement Aishing, however, has considerable weight, especially as the earliest inscription found in Champa appears to be inspired by Buddhism. Cambodia 2 it may be well to state briefly the chief facts of Cambodian history before considering the phases through which the religion passed. Until the 13th century, our chief authorities are the Sanskrit and Khmer inscriptions, supplemented by notices in the Chinese annals. The Khmer inscriptions are often only a translation or paraphrase of Sanskrit texts found in the same locality and, as a rule, are more popular, having little literacy pretension. They frequently contain lists of donations or of articles to be supplied by the population for the upkeep of pious foundations. After the 14th century, we have Cambodian annals of dubious value, and we also find inscriptions in Pali or in modern Cambodian. 
The earliest Sanskrit inscriptions date from the beginning of the 7th century and mention works undertaken in 604 and 624. The first important king is Bhavivarman, a conqueror and probably a usurper, who extended his kingdom considerably towards the west. His career of conquest was continued by Mahavarman, by Isivarman, and by Jayavarman. This last prince was in the throne in 667, but his reign is followed by a lacuna of more than a century. Notices in the Chinese annals, confirmed by the double genealogies given for this period in later inscriptions, indicate that Cambodia was divided for some time into two states, one literal and the other inland. Clear history begins again with the reign of Jayavarman II. Later sovereigns evidently regard him as the great national hero, and he lives in popular legend as the builder of a magnificent palace, Benjamele, whose ruins still exist, and as the recipient of the sacred sword of Indra, is preserved at Phnom Penh to this day. We are told that he came from Java, which is more likely to be some locality in the Malay Peninsula or Laos than the island of that name. It is possible that Jayavarman was carried away captive to this region, but returned to found a dynasty independent of it. The ancient city of Angkor has probably done more to make Cambodia known in Europe than any recent achievements of the Khmer race. In the center of it stands the temple now called Bayon, and outside its walls are many other edifices of which the majesty Angkor Wat is the largest and best preserved. King Indravarman seems responsible for the selection of the site, but he merely commenced the construction of the Bayan. The edifice was completed by his son, Yasovarman, who also built a town around it, called Yasod Haripura, Kampupuri, or Mahanagata. Angkor Thom is the Cambodian translation of this last name, Angkor being a corruption of Nokor. Yes, Sovereman's empire comprised nearly all Indochina between Burma and Champa, and he has been identified with the leper king of Cambodian legend. His successors continued to embellish Angkor Thom, but Jayavarman IV abandoned it and it was deserted for several years until Rajendravarman II made it the capital again. The Chinese are now supported by allusions in the inscriptions say that this prince conquered Champa. The long reigns of Jayavarman V, Suryavarman I, and Udayatiyavarman, which cover more than a century, seem to mark a prosperous period when architecture flourished, although Udayatiyavarman had to contend with two rebellions. Another Greek king, Suryavarman II, followed shortly after them, and for a time succeeded in uniting Cambodia and Champa under his sway. Some authorities credit him with a successful ex expedition to Ceylon. There is not sufficient evidence for this, but he was a great prince and, in spite of his foreign wars, maintained peace and order at home. Jayavarman VII, who appeared to have reigned from 1162 to 1201, reduced to obedience his unruly vassals of the north and successfully invaded Champa, which remained for 30 years though not without rebellion, the vassal of Cambodia. It was evacuated by his successor, Indrafirman, in 1220. After this date, there is again a gap of more than a century in Cambodian history, and when the sequence of events becomes clear again, we find that Siam has grown to be a dangerous and aggressive enemy. But though the vigor of the kingdom may have declined, the account of the Chinese traveler, Saoho Tao Khan, who visited Angkor Thom in 1296 shows that it was not in a state of anarchy nor conquered by Siam. There had, however, been a recent war with Siam, and he mentions that the country was devastated. He unfortunately does not tell us the name of the reigning king, and the list of sovereigns begins again only in 1340 when the annals of Cambodia take up the history. They are not of great value. The custom of recording all events of importance prevailed at the Cambodian court in earlier times, but these chronicles were lost in the 18th century. King Yang Chen ordered that they should be rewritten with the aid of the Siamese chronicles and such other materials as were available and fixed in 1340 at the point of departure, apparently because the Siamese chronicles start from that date.
Although the period of the Annals offers little but a narrative of dissensions at home and abroad, of the interference of Anam on one side and of Siam on the other, yet it does not seem that the sudden cessation of inscriptions and of the ancient style of architecture in the 13th century was due to the collapse of Cambodia, for even in the 16th century it offered a valiant and often successful resistance to aggressions from the west. But Angkor Thom and the principal monuments were situated near the Siamese frontier and felt the shock of every collision. The sense of security, essential for the construction of great architectural works, had disappeared and the population became less submissive and less willing to supply forced labor without which such monuments could not be erected. The Siamese captured Angkor Thom in 1313, 1351, and 1420, but did not on any occasion hold it for long. Again, in 1473, they occupied Shantavun, Korat, and Angkor, but had to retire and conclude peace. King Ang Shan I successfully disputed the right of Siam to treat him as a vassal and establish his capital at Luvuk, which he fortified and ornamented. He reigned from 1505 to 1555, and both he and his son, Badom Racha, seemed entitled to rank among the great kings of Cambodia. But the situation was clearly precarious, and when a minor succeeded to the throne in 1574, the Siamese seized the opportunity and recaptured Lovik and Shantabun, though this capture was the death blow to the power of the Khmers. The Kingdom of Cambodia did not cease to exist, but for nearly three centuries continued to have an eventful but uninteresting history as the vassal of Siam or Anam, or even both, until in the middle of the 19th century the intervention of France substituted a European protectorate for these Asian rivalries. The provinces of Siem Reap and Batambang, in which Angkor Thom and the principal ancient monuments are situated, were annexed by Siam at the end of the 18th century, but in virtue of an arrangement negotiated by the French government, they were restored to Cambodia in 1907, Krat and certain territories being at the same time ceded to Siam. Cambodia 3. The religious history of Cambodia may be divided into two periods, exclusive of the possible existence there of a Hanayanist Buddhism in the earlier centuries of our era. In the first period, which witnessed the construction of the great monuments in the reigns of the great kings, both Brahmanism and Mahayanist Buddhism nourish, but as in Java and Champa without mutual hostility. This period extends certainly from the 6th to the 13th centuries, and perhaps its limits should be stretched to 400 to 1400 AD. In any case, it passed without abrupt transition into the second period in which, under Siamese influence, Hanayanist Buddhism supplanted the older faiths, although the ceremonies of the Cambodian court still preserve a good deal of Brahmanic ritual. During the first period, Brahmanism and Mahayanism were professed by the court and nobility. The multitude of great temples and opulent endowments, the knowledge of Sanskrit literature, and the use of Indian names leave no doubt about this, but it is highly probable that the mass of the people had their own humbler forms of worship. Still, there is no record of anything that can be called Khmer, as opposed to Indian religion, as in Siam. The veneration of nature spirits is universal in Cambodia, and little shrines elevated on poles are erected in their honor in the neighborhood of almost every house. Possibly, the more important of these spirits were identified in early times with Indian deities or received Sanskrit names. Thus, we hear a pious foundation in honor of Brahmarakshas, perhaps a local mountain spirit. Shiva is adored under the name of Sri Sikharasvara. The Lord of the Peak in Krishna appears to be identified with a local god called Sri Champasvara, who is worshipped by Jayavarman. The practice of accepting and hinducing strange gods with whom they came into contact was so familiar to the Brahmins that it would be odd if no examples of it occurred in Cambodia. Still, the Brahmanic religion which has left such clear records there was in the main not a Hindu form of any local cult but a direct importation of Indian thought, ritual, and literature. The Indian invaders or colonists were accompanied by Brahmins. Their descendants continued to bear Indian names and to give them to all places of importance. Sanskrit was the ecclesiastical and official language. 
for the inscriptions written in Khmer are clearly half-contemptuous notifications to the common people, respecting such details as especially concern them. As Ramas and Kas are mentioned, and it is probable that natives were only gradually and grudgingly admitted to the higher castes. There is also reason to believe that this Hindu civilization was from time to time vivified by direct contact with India. The embassy of Su Wu has already been mentioned, and an inscription records the marriage of a Cambodian princess with a Brahmin called Divikara, who came from the banks of Yamuna, where Krishna sported in his infancy. During the whole period of the inscriptions, the worship of Shiva seems to have been the principal cultus and to some extent the state religion, for even kings who express themselves in their inscriptions as devout Buddhists do not fail to invoke him. But there is no trace of hostility to Vishnuism, and the earlier inscriptions constantly celebrate the praises of the compound deity Vishnu Shiva, known under such names as Harihara, Sambhu Vishnu, Sankara Narayana, etc. Thus, an inscription of Aang Pu dating from Is Everman's reign says, Victorious Arhata and Asida become one for the good of the world, though as the spouses of Parvati and Sri, they have different forms. But the worship of this double being is accompanied by pure Shivaism and by the adoration of other deities. The earliest inscriptions Bob Everman invokes Shiva and dedicates a linga. He also celebrates the compound deity under the name of Sambhu Vishnu and mentions Uma, Lakshmi, Bharati, Dharma, the Maruts, and Vishnu under the names of Kutur, Buha, and Trilakyosara. There appears to be no allusion to the worship of Vishnu Shiva as two and one after the 7th century, but through Shiva became exalted at the expense of his partner, Vishnu must have had adorers for two kings, Jayavarma III and Suryavarma II, who are known after their death by the names of Vishnu Loka and Parama Vishnu Loka. Shiva became generally recognized as the supreme deity in a comprehensive but non-exclusive sense. He is the universal spirit from whom emanate Brahma and Vishnu. His character as the destroyer is not much emphasized. He is the god of change and therefore of reproduction, whose symbol is the linga. It is remarkable to find that a pantheistic form of Shivaism is clearly enunciated in one of the earliest inscriptions. Shiva is there styled Vibhu, the omnipresent Param Brahma, Jagapati, Pasapati. An inscription found at Angkor mentions an Akari of the Pasupatas as well as an Akari of the Saivas, and Shao Tao Kwan seems to allude to the worshippers of Pasupati under the name of Pasu Wei. It would appear that the Pasupatas existed in Cambodia as a distinct sect, and there are some indications that ideas which prevailed among the Lingayats also found their way thither. The most interesting and original aspect of Cambodian religion is its connection with the state and the worship of deities somehow identified with the king or with prominent personages. These features are also found in Champa and Java. In all these countries, it was usual that when a king founded a temple, the god worshipped in it should be called by his name or by something like it. Thus, when Bhav Viverman dedicated a temple to Shiva, the god was styled Bhadrasvara. More than this, when a king or any distinguished person died, he was commemorated by a statue which produced his features but represented him with the attributes of his favorite god. Thus, in Jeverman and Yas Silverman dedicated a bako on the lay shrines, in which decreased members of the royal family were commemorated in the form of images of Shiva and Devi bearing names similar to their own. Another form of apotheosis was to describe a king by a posthumous title indicating that he had gone to the heaven of his divine patron such as Paramavishnu Loka or Buddha Loka. The temple of Bayan was a truly national fane, almost a Westminster Abbey, in whose many shrines all the gods and great men of the country were commemorated. The French archaeologists recognized four classes of these shrines dedicated respectively to a. Indian deities, mostly special forms of Shiva, Deva, and Vishnu, b. Mahayanist Buddhas, especially Buddhas of healing, who were regarded as the patron saint of various towns and mountains. C. Similar local deities, apparently of Cambodian origin and perhaps corresponding to the god of the city worshipped in every Chinese town. 
Thus, one inscription speaks of Shri Mahendrasvari, who is the divine form of the lady Shri Mahendras Lakshmi. The presiding deity of the Bayan was Shiva, adored under the form of the Linga. The principal external ornaments of the building are 40 towers, each surmounted by four heads. These were formerly thought to represent Brahma, but there is little doubt that they are meant for lingas, bearing four faces of Shiva, since each head has three eyes. Such lingas are occasionally seen in India, and many metal cases bearing faces and made to be fitted on lingas have been discovered in Champa. These four head columns are found in the gates of Angkor Thom, as well as in the Bayan, and are singularly impressive. The emblem adored in the central shrine of the Bayan was probably a linga, but its title was Kamran Jagataraja, or Devi Raja, the King God. More explicitly, still it is styled Kamran Jagataraja, the God who is the Kingdom. It typified and contained the royal essence present in the living king of Cambodia and in all her kings. Several inscriptions make it clear that not only dead, but living people could be represented by statue portraits, which identified them with the deity. And in one very remarkable record, a general offers to the king the booty he has captured, asking him to present it to your subtle ego, who is Isfara, dwelling in a golden linga. Thus, this subtle ego dwells in a linga, is identical with Shiva, and manifests itself in the successive kings of the royal house. The practices described have some analogies in India. The custom of describing the god of a temple by the name of the founder was known there. The veneration of ancestors is universal. There is some masalia, and the notion that in life the soul can reside elsewhere than in the body is an occasional popular superstition. Still, these ideas and practices are not conspicuous features of Hinduism, and the Cambodians had probably come within the sphere of another influence. In all Eastern Asia, the veneration of the dead is the fundamental and ubiquitous form of religion, and in China, we find fully developed such ideas as that the great should be buried in monumental tombs, that a spirit can be made to reside in a tablet or image, and that the human soul is compound so that portions of it can be in different places. These beliefs, combined with the Indian doctrine that the deity is manifested in incarnations and the human soul and in images, afford a good theoretical basis for the worship of the Devaraja. It was also agreeable to Far Eastern ideas that religion and the state should be closely associated and the Cambodian kings would be glad to imitate the glories of the Son of Heaven. But probably, a simpler cause tended to unite church and state in all these Hindu colonies. In medieval India, the Brahmins became so powerful that they could claim to represent religion and civilization apart from the state, but in Cambodia and Champa, Brahmanic religion and civilization were bound up with the state. Both were attacked by and ultimately succumbed to the same enemies. The Brahmanism of Cambodia, as we know it from the inscriptions, was so largely concerned with the worship of this royal god that it might almost be considered a department of the court. It seems to have been thought essential to the dignity of a sovereign who aspired to be more than a local prince, that his chaplain or preceptor should have a pontifical position. A curious parallel to this is shown by those medieval princes of Eastern Europe who claim for their chief bishops the title of patriarch as a complement to their own imperial pretensions. In its ultimate form, the Cambodian hierarchy was the form of Jayavarman II, who, it will be remembered, re-established the kingdom after an obscure but apparently disastrous interregnum. He made the priest of the royal god hereditary and the family of Sivakaivalya and the Sacerdotal dynasty thus founded and enjoyed, during some centuries, a power inferior only to that of the kings. In the inscriptions of Sadak Kak Thom, the history of this family is traced from the reign of Jayavarman II to 1052. The beginning of the story as related in both the Sanskrit and Khmer texts is interesting but obscure. It is to the effect that Jayavarman, Anxious to assure his position as an emperor independent of Java, summoned from Janapada, a Brahmin called Hiranyadama, learned in magic, who arranged the rules for the worship of the royal god and taught the king's chaplain. 
Sivakai Valia, four trace heises called Vravanasika, Neyotara, Samoa, and Saraishita. The king made a solemn compact that only the members of his maternal family, men and women, should be yajikas to the exclusion of all others. The restriction refers no doubt only to the cult of the royal god and the office of court chaplain called Purohita Guru or Hatri, of whom there were at least two. The outline of this narrative, that a learned Brahmin was imported in charge with the instruction of the royal chaplain, is simple and probable, but the details are perplexing. The Sanskrit treatises mentioned are unknown, and the names are singular. Janapada, as the name of a definitive locality, is also strange, but it is conceivable that the word may have been used in Khmer as a designation of India or a part of it. The inscription goes on to relate the gratifying history of the priestly family, the grants of land made to them, the honors they received. We gather that it was usual for an estate to be given to a priest with the right to claim forced labor from the population. He then proceeded to erect a town or village embellished with temples and tanks. The hold of Brahmanism on the country probably depended more on such priestly towns than on the convictions of the people. The inscriptions often speak of religious establishments being restored and sometimes say that they had become deserted and overgrown. We may conclude that if Brahmin lords of a village ceased for any reason to give it their attention, the labor and contributions requisite for the upkeep of the temples were not forthcoming, and the jungle was allowed to grow over the buildings. Numerous inscriptions testify to the grandeur of the Sivakai Valley of family. The monotonous list of their properties and slaves, of the statues erected in their honor, and the number of parasols borne before them show that their position was almost regal, even when a king was a Buddhist. They prudently refrained from attempting to occupy the throne, but probably no king could succeed unless consecrated by them. Sadasiva, Sankara Pandita, and Divakara Pandita formed an ecclesiastical dynasty from about 1000 to 1100 AD, parallel to the long reigns of the kings in the same period. The last name mentions in an inscription that he had consecrated three kings, and Sankara Pandita, a man of great learning, was de facto sovereign during the minority of his pupil, Udaya T. Yavarman, nor did he lose his influence when the young king attained his majority. The shrine of the royal god was first near Mount Mahendra and was then moved to Hari Harayalaya. Its location was definitely fixed in the reign of Indravarman, about 877 AD. Two Sivakai Valley of Brahmins, Sivasoma and his pupil Vamasiva, chaplain of the king, built a temple called Sivasrama and erected a linga therein. It is agreed that this building is the band, which formed the center of the later city of Angkor. Indravarman also illustrated another characteristic of the court religion by placing in the temple now called Prao Ko, three statues of Shiva, with the features of his father, grandfather, and Jayavarman II, together with corresponding statues of Sakti and the likeness of their wives. The next king, Yasovarman, who founded the town of Angkor around the Bayon, built near his palace another Linga temple, now known as Bepioni. He also erected two convents, one Brahminic and one Buddhist. An inscription gives several interesting particulars respecting the former. It fixes the provisions to be supplied to priests and students and the honors to be rendered to distinguished visitors. The rite of sanctuary is accorded, and the sick and helpless are to receive food and medicine. Also, funeral rites are to be celebrated within its precincts, for the repose of the friendless and those who have died in war. The royal residence was moved from Angkor in 928, but about 20 years later, the corps returned thither, and the inscriptions record that the royal god accompanied it. The cultus was probably similar to what may have been seen in the Sivet temples of India today. The principal lingam was placed in a shrine approached through other chambers and accessible only to privileged persons. Libations were poured over the emblem, and sacred books were recited. An interesting inscription of about 600 AD 
relates how Suriso Misterman presented to a temple the Ramayana, the Purana, and Bharata and made arrangements for their recitation. We are told that Suryavarman I was versed in the Atharva Veda and also in the Bhashya, Kavyas, and Six Darsanas and the Dharmasastrias. Sacrifices are also frequently mentioned, and one inscription records the performance of a kutihoma. The old Vedic ritual remained to some extent in practice, for no circumstances are more favorable to its survival than a wealthy court dominated by a powerful hierarchy. Such ceremonies were probably performed in the ample enclosures surrounding the temples. End of section 7. Recording by Cristina Ordonez. Section 8 of Hinduism and Buddhism, an historical sketch, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Seema Parakyat. Hinduism and Buddhism, an historical sketch, Volume 3 by Charles Eliot. Cambodia 4. Mahayana's Buddhism existed in Cambodia during the whole of the period covered by the inscriptions. But it remained in such close alliance with Brahmanism that it is hard to say whether it should be regarded as a separate religion. The idea that the two systems were incompatible obviously never occurred to the writers of the inscriptions and Buddhism was not regarded as more distinct from Shivaism and Vishnuism than these from one another. It had nevertheless many fervent and generous if not exclusive admirers. The earliest record of its existence is a short inscription dating from the end of the 6th or beginning of the 7th century, which relates how a person called Pon Pragnyakandra dedicated male and female slaves to the three bodhisattvas, Shasta, Maitreya and Avalokiteshwara. The title given to the bodhisattvas, Vra, Kamratan, which is also borne by Indian deities, shows that this Buddhism was not very different from the Brahmanic cult of Cambodia. It is interesting to find that Yeshavarman, founded in Angkor Thom, a Saugat Ashrama, or Buddhist monastery parallel to his Brahmashrama already described. Its inmates enjoyed the same privileges and had nearly the same rules and duties, being bound to afford sanctuary, maintain the destitute and perform funeral masses. It is laid down that an Akarya versed in Buddhist lore corresponds in rank to the Akaryas of the Shaivas and Pashupatas, and that in both institutions great honour is to be shown to such Akaryas as also are learned in Brahma. A Buddhist Akarya ought to be honoured a little less than a learned Brahmin. Even in form, the inscriptions recording the foundation of the two ashramas show a remarkable parallelism. Both begin with two stanzas addressed to Shiva. Then, the Buddhist inscription inserts a stanza in honor of the Buddha, who delivers from transmigration and gives nirvana, and then the two texts are identical for several stanzas. Mahayanism appears to have flourished here, especially from the 10th to the 13th centuries, and throughout the greater part of this period, we find the same feature that its principal devotees were not the kings, but their ministers. Suryavarman 1, 1049 and Jayavarman 7, 1221 in some sense deserve the name of Buddhist since the posthumous title of the former was Nirvanapada and the latter left a long inscription beginning with a definitely Buddhist invocation. Yet an inscription of Suryavarman which states in its second verse that only the word of the Buddha is true opens by singing the praises of Shiva and Jayavarman certainly did not neglect the Brahmanic gods. But for about a hundred years, there was a series of great ministers who specially encouraged Buddhism. Such were Satyavarman 980, who was charged with the erection of the building in Angkor, known as Piminakas, Kavindrari Madana, minister under Rajendra Varman II and Jayavarman V, who erected many Buddhist statues, and Kirti Pandita, minister of Jayavarman V. Kirti Pandita was the author of the inscription found at Shres and Thor, which states that thanks to his efforts, the pure doctrine of the Buddha reappeared like the moon from behind the clouds or the sun at dawn. It may be easily imagined that the power enjoyed by the court chaplain 
would dispose the intelligent classes to revolt against this hierarchy and to favor liberty and variety in religion so far as was safe. Possibly the kings, while cooperating with the priesthood which recognized them as semi-divine, were glad enough to let other religious elements form some sort of counterpoise to a priestly family which threatened to be omnipotent. Though the identification of Shivaism and Buddhism became so complete that we actually find a trinity composed of Padmodbhava, Brahma, Ambojanetra, Vishnu, and the Buddha, the inscriptions of the Buddhist ministers are marked by a certain diplomacy and self-congratulation on the success of their efforts, as if they felt that their position was meritorious yet delicate. Thus, in an inscription, the object of which seems to be to record the erection of a statue of Pragna Paramita by Kavindrari Madana, we are told that the king charged him with the embellishment of Yeshodhara Pura because, though an eminent Buddhist, his loyalty was above suspicion. The same minister erected three towers at Bhatkam with inscriptions which record the dedication of a tank. The first invokes the Buddha, Vajrapani and Lokeshwara. In the others, Lokeshwara is replaced by Pragna Paramita, who here as elsewhere is treated as a goddess or Shakti and referred to as Devi in another stanza. The three inscriptions commemorate the construction of a sacred tank, but though the author was a Buddhist, he expressly restricts the use of it to Brahmanic functionaries. The inscriptions of Shrey Santor, 975 AD, describes the successful efforts of Kirti Pandita to restore Buddhism and gives the instruction of the king, Jayavarman V, as to its status. The royal chaplain is by no means to abandon the worship of Shiva, but he is to be well versed in Buddhist learning, and on feast days he will bathe the statue of the Buddha with due ceremony. A point of interest in this inscription is the statement that Kirti Pandita introduced Buddhist works from abroad, including the Shastra Madhya Vibhaga and the commentary on the Tattva Sangraha. The first of these is probably the Madhyanta Vibhaga Shastra by Vasubandhu and the authorship is worth attention as supporting Taranada's statement that the disciples of Vasubandhu introduced Buddhism into Indochina. In the time of Jayavarman VII, 1185 AD, although Hindu mythology is not discarded and though the king's chaplain, presumably a Shivite, receives every honor, yet Mahayana's Buddhism seems to be frankly professed as the royal religion. It is noteworthy that about the same time it becomes more prominent in Java and Champa. Probably the flourishing condition of the faith in Ceylon and Burma increased the prestige of all forms of Buddhism throughout southeastern Asia. A long inscription of Jayavarman in 145 stanzas has been preserved in the temple of Ta Prom near Angkor. It opens with an invocation to the Buddha in which are mentioned the three bodies, Lokeshwara and the mother of the Jinas, by whom Pragna Paramita must be meant. Shiva is not invoked but allusion is made to many Brahmanic deities and bhikkhus and Brahmans are mentioned together. The inscription contains a curious list of the materials supplied daily for the temple services and of the personnel. Ample provision is made for both, but it is not clear how far a purely Buddhist ritual is contemplated and it seems probable that an extensive Brahmanic cultus existed side by side with the Buddhist ceremonial. We learned that there were clothes for the deities and 45 mosquito nets of Chinese material to protect their statues. The Uposada days seem to be alluded to and the spring festival is described when Bhagavat and Bhagavati are to be escorted in solemn procession with parasols, music, banners and dancing girls. The whole staff, including Burmese and Chams, probably slaves, is put down at the enormous figure of 79,365, which perhaps includes all the neighboring inhabitants who could be called on to render any service to the temple. The most sacerdotal part of the establishment consisted of 18 principal priests, Adi Karina, 2,740 priests, and 2,232 assistants, including 615 dancing girls. But even these figures seem very large. The inscription comes to a gratifying conclusion by announcing there are 102 hospitals in the kingdom. 
These institutions, which are alluded to in other inscriptions, were probably not all founded by Jayavarman VII, and he seems to treat them as being like temples and natural part of a well-ordered state. But he evidently expended much care and money on them, and in the present inscription, he makes over the fruit of these good deeds to his mother. The most detailed description of these hospitals occur in another of his inscriptions found at Seifong in Laos. It is, like the one just cited, definitely Buddhist, and it is permissible to suppose that Buddhism took a more active part than Brahmanism in such works of charity. It opens with an invocation first to the Buddha, who in his three bodies transcends the distinction between existence and non-existence, and then to the healing Buddha and the two bodhisattvas who drive away darkness and disease. These divinities, who are the lords of a heaven in the east, analogous to the paradise of Amitabha, are still worshipped in China and Japan and were evidently gods of light. The hospital erected under their auspices by the Cambodian king was open to all the four castes and had a staff of 98 persons besides an astrologer and two sacrificers, Yajaga. Cambodia 5 These inscriptions of Jayavarman are the last which tell us anything about the religion of medieval Cambodia. But we have a somewhat later account from the pen of Chow Ta Kuan, a Chinese who visited Angkor in 1296. He describes a temple in the centre of the city which must be the Bayon, and says that it had a tower of gold and that the eastern or principal entrance was approached by a golden bridge flanked by two lions and eight statues, all of the same metal. The chapter of his work entitled The Three Religions runs as follows slightly abridged from M. Pelliot's version. The literati are called Pan Chi, the bonds is Chu Ku, and the Tao is Pa Su Wei. I do not know whom the Pan Chi worship. They have no schools and it is difficult to say what books they read. They dress like other people except that they wear a white thread around their necks, which is their distinctive mark. They attain to very high positions. The Chu Ku shave their heads and wear yellow clothes. They uncover the right shoulder, but the lower part of their body is draped with a skirt of yellow cloth, and they go barefoot. Their temples are sometimes roofed with tiles. Inside, there is only one image exactly like the Buddha Sakya, which they call Polai, Pra, ornamented with vermilion and blue and clothed in red. The Buddhas of the Taurus images in the towers of the temples, are different and cast in bronze. There are no bells, drums, cymbals or flags in their temples. They eat only one meal a day, prepared by someone who entertains them, for they do not cook in their temples. They eat fish and meat and also use them in their offerings to Buddha. But they do not drink wine. They recite numerous texts written on strips of palm leaf. Some bonzes have a right to have the shafts of their palanquins and the handles of their parasols in gold or silver. The prince consults them on serious matters. There are no Buddhist nuns. The Pasu Wei dress like everyone else, except that they wear on their heads a piece of red or white stuff like the cuckoo worn by Tata women, but lower. Their temples are smaller than those of the Buddhists, for Taoism is less prosperous than Buddhism. They worship nothing but a block of stone, somewhat like the stone on the altar of the god of the sun in China. I do not know what god they adore. There are also Taoist nuns. The Pasu Wei do not partake of the food of other people or eat in public. They do not drink wine. Such children of the laity as go to school frequent the bonzes who give them instruction. When grown up, they return to a lay life. I have not been able to make an exhaustive investigation. Elsewhere, he says, all worship the Buddha. And he describes some popular festivals which resemble those now celebrated in Siam. In every village, there was a temple or a stupa. He also mentions that in eating, they use leaves as spoons and adds, it is the same in their sacrifices to the spirits and to Buddha. Chao Ta Kuan confesses that his account is superficial and he was perhaps influenced by the idea that it was natural that there should be three religions in Cambodia as in China. 
Buddhists were found in both countries. Panchi, no doubt, represents Pandita, and he saw an analogy between the Brahmins of the Cambodian court and the Confucian Mandarins, a third and less known sect he identified with the Taoists. The most important point in his description is the prominence given to the Buddhists. His account of their temples, of the dress and life of their monks, leaves no doubt that he is describing Hinayanist Buddhism, such as still nourishes in Cambodia. It probably found its way from Siam, with which Cambodia had already closed, but not always peaceful relations. Probably the name by which the bonds are designated is Siamese. With Chao Taokwan's statements may be compared the inscription of the Siamese king Rama Komhe, which dwells on the nourishing condition of Pali Buddhism in Siam about 1300 AD. The contrast indicated by Chao Taokwan is significant. The Brahmins held high office but had no schools. Those of the laity who desired education spent some portion of their youth in a Buddhist monastery, as they still do, and then returned to the world. Such a state of things naturally resulted in the diffusion of Buddhism among the people, while the Brahmins dwindled to a court hierarchy. When Chao Taokwan says that all Cambodians adored Buddha, he probably makes a mistake as he does in saying that the sculptures above the gates of Angkor are heads of Buddha. But the general impression which he evidently received that everyone frequented Buddhist temples and monasteries speaks for itself. His statement about sacrifices to Buddha is remarkable and since the inscriptions of Jayavarman 7 speak of sacrificers, it cannot be rejected as a mere mistake. But if Hinayana's Buddhism countenanced such practices in an age of transition, it did not adopt them permanently for, so far as I have seen, no offerings are made today in Cambodian temples except flowers and sticks of incense. The Pasu Way have given rise to many conjectures and have been identified with the Basai or sacerdotal class of the Chams. But there seems to be little doubt that the word really represents Pasupata and Chao Ta Kwan's account clearly points to a sect of Linga worshippers, although no information is forthcoming about the stone on the altar of the sun god in China, to which he compares their emblem. His idea that they represented the Taoists in Cambodia may have led him to exaggerate their importance, but his statement that they were a separate body is confirmed. For an inscription of Angkor, defines the order of hierarchical precedence as the Brahman, the Saiva Akarya, the Pashupata Akarya. From the time of Chao Ta Kwan to the present day, I have found few notices about the religion of Cambodia. Hinayana's Buddhism became supreme and though we have a few details of the conquest, we can hardly go wrong in tracing its general lines. Brahmanism was exclusive and tyrannical. It made no appeal to the masses, but a severe levy of forced labor must have been necessary to erect and maintain the numerous great shrines which, though in ruins, are still the glory of Cambodia. In many of them are seen the remains of inscriptions which have been deliberately erased. These probably prescribed certain onerous services which the proletariat was bound to render to the established church. When the CMA's Buddhism invaded Cambodia, it had a double advantage. It was a creed of an aggressive and successful neighbor, but while thus armed with weapons of this world, it also appealed to the poor and oppressed. If it enjoyed the favor of princes, it had no desire to defend the rights of a privileged caste. It offered salvation and education to the average townsman and villager. If it invited the support and arms of the laity, it was at least modest in its demands. Brahmanism, on the other hand, lost strength as the prestige of the court declined. Its greatest shrines were in the provinces most exposed to Siamese attacks. The first Portuguese writers speak of them as already deserted at the end of the 16th century. The connection with India was not kept up and if any immigrants came from the West after the 12th century, they are more likely to have been Muslims than Hindus. Thus, driven from its temples with no roots among the people, whose evictions it had never tried to win, Brahmanism in Cambodia became what it now is, a court ritual without a creed and hardly noticed except at royal functions. It is remarkable that Mohammedanism remained almost unknown to Cambodia, Siam and Burma. The tide of Muslim invasion swept across the Malay Peninsula southwards. 
Its effect was strongest in Sumatra and Java, feebler on the coast of Borneo and the Philippines. From the islands, it reached Champa, where it had some success, but Siam and Cambodia lay on one side of its main route and also showed no sympathy for it. King Rama Dugde Chan, who reigned in Cambodia from 1642 to 1659, became a Mohammedan and surrounded himself with Malays and Javanese. But he alienated the affections of his subjects and was deposed by the intervention of Annam. After this, we hear no more of Mohammedanism, an unusual incident which must be counted among the few cases in which Buddhism has encouraged violence is recorded in the year 1730 when a Laotian who claimed to be inspired collected a band of fanatics and proceeded to massacre in the name of Buddha all the Annamites resident in Cambodia. This seems to show that Buddhism was regarded as a religion of the country and could be used as a national cry against strangers. As already mentioned, Brahmanism still survives in the court ceremonial, though this by no means prevents the king from being a devout Buddhist. The priests are known as bakus. They wear a top knot and a sacred thread after the Indian fashion and enjoy certain privileges. Within the precincts of the palace at Phnom Penh, is a modest building where they still guard the sword of Indra. About two inches of the blade are shown to visitors, but except at certain festivals, it is never taken out of its sheath. The official program of the coronation of King Shishovat, April 23-28, 1906, published in French and Cambodian, gives a curious account of the ceremonies performed, which were mainly Brahmanic. Although prayers were recited by the bonzes and offering made to Buddha, four special Brahmanic shrines were erected and the essential part of the rite consisted in a lustral bath in which the bakus poured water over the king. Invocations were addressed to beings described as Anjikiyet au paradis de si se jus celeste qui habite auprès Indra de Brahma et de la Archange Sahabade to the spirits of mountains, valleys, and rivers, and to the spirits who guard the palace. When the king has been duly bathed and program prescribes that le directeur des bakus remettra la couronne à extension complexe, monsieur le gouverneur général qui la portera sur la tête de sa majesté au nom du gouvernement de la République française. Equally curious is the program de Fert Royal à l'occasion de la cremation de SM Norodom, January 2nd to 16th, 1906. The lengthy ceremonial consisted of a strange mixture of prayers, sermons, pageants, and amusements. The definitely religious exercises were Buddhist, and the amusements which accompanied them, though according to our notions curiously out of place, clearly correspond to the funeral games of antiquity. Thus, we read not only of a fin d'un repos or un royal, but of illumination générale, lancement de ballons, luthier sort de box et de l'escrime, danser et soirée de gala. Après la crémation, Sa Majesté distribuera des billets de tombola. The ordinary Buddhism of Cambodia at the present day resembles that of Siam and is not mixed with Brahmanic observances. Monasteries are numerous, the monks enjoy general respect, and their conduct is said to be beyond reproach. They act as schoolmasters, and as in Siam and Burma, all young men spend some time in a monastery. A monastery generally contains from 30 to 50 monks and consists of a number of wooden houses raised on piles and arranged round a square. Each monk has a room and often a house to himself. Besides the dwelling houses, there are also stores and two halls called Sala and Vihir, Vihara. In both, the Buddha is represented by a single gigantic sitting image before which are set flowers and incense. As a rule, there are no other images, but the walls are often ornamented with frescoes of Jataka stories or the early life of Gotama. Meals are taken in the Sala at about 7 and 11 a.m. and prayers are recited there on ordinary days in the morning and evening. The 11 o'clock meal is followed by a rather long race. The prayer consists mostly of Pali formulae such as the three refuges, but they are sometimes in Cambodian and contain definite petitions or at least wishes formulated before the image of the Buddha. Thus, I have heard prayers for peace and against war. The most solemn ceremonies such as the Uposita, 
and ordinations are performed in the vihir the recitation of party mokha is regularly performed and i have several times witnessed it all but ordained monks have to withdraw outside the sima stones during the service the ceremony begins about 6 pm the bhikkhus kneel down in pairs face to face and rubbing their foreheads in the dust ask for mutual forgiveness if they have inadvertently offended this ceremony is also performed on other occasions it is followed by singing or intoning lords after which comes the recitation of patimoka itself which is marked by great solemnity the reader sits in a large chair on the arms of which are fixed many lighted tapers he repeats the text by heart but near him sits a prompter with a palm leaf manuscript who if necessary corrects the words recited i have never seen a monk confess in public and i believe that the usual practice is for sinful brethren to abstain from attending the ceremony and then to confess privately to the abbot who assigns them a penance when as a party mokha is concluded all the bhikkhus smoke last cigarettes in most buddhist countries it is not considered irreverent to smoke chew betel or drink tea in the intervals of religious exercises when the cigarettes are finished there follows a service of prayer and praise in cambodian During the season of Vasa there are usually several bhikkhus in each monastery who practice meditation for 3 or 4 days consecutively in tents or enclosure made of yellow cloth open above but closed all around the four stages of meditation described in the pitakas are said to be commonly attained by devout monks the abbot has considerable authority in disciplinary matters he eats apart from the other monks and at religious ceremonies wears a sort of red cope whereas the dress of the other brethren is entirely yellow novices prostrate themselves when they speak to him above the abbots are provincial superiors and the government of the whole church is in the hands of the somtik pras angrak there is or was also a second prelate called lok prasokon or brasuganda and the two some ward after the manner of the two primates of the english church supervise the clergy in different parts of the kingdom the second being inferior to the first in rank but not dependent on him but it is said that no successor has been appointed to the last bra suganda who died in 1894 he was a distinguished scholar and introduced the dhamma yuth sect from siam into cambodia the king is recognized as the head of the church but cannot alter his doctrine or confiscate ecclesiastical property cambodia 6 No account of Cambodian religion would be complete without some reference to the splendid monuments in which it found expression and which still remain in a great measure intact. The colonists who established themselves in these regions brought with them the Dravidian taste for great buildings, but either their travels enlarged their artistic powers or they modified the Indian style by assimilating successfully some architectural features found in their new home. what pre-indian architecture there may have been among the khmers we do not know but the fact that the earliest known monuments are hindu makes it improbable that stone buildings on a large scale existed before their arrival the feature which most clearly distinguishes cambodian from indian architecture is its pyramidal structure india has stupas and gopurams of pyramidal appearance but still hindu temples of the normal type both in the north and south consists of a number of buildings erected on the same level in cambodia on the contrary many buildings such as takyo bapong and the feminakas are shrines on the top of pyramids which consist of three stories or large steps ascended by flights of relatively small steps in other buildings notably angkor wat the pyramidal form is obscured by the slight elevation of the stories compared with the breadth and by the elaboration of the colonnades and other edifices which they bear but still the general plan is that of a series of courts each rising within and above the last and this gradual rise by which the pilgrim is led not only through colonnade after colonnade but up flight after flight of stairs each leading to something higher but invisible from the base imparts to cambodian temples a sublimity and aspiring grandeur which is absent from the mysterious halls of dravidian shrines one might almost suppose that the cambodian architects had deliberately set themselves to rectify the chief faults of indian architecture one of these is the profusion of external ornament in high relief which by its very multiplicity ceases to produce any effect proportionate to its elaboration 
with the result that the general view is disappointing and majestic outlines are wanting. In Cambodian buildings, on the contrary, the general effect is not sacrificed to detail. The artists knew how to make air and space give dignity to their work. Another peculiar defect of many Ravidian buildings is that they were gradually erected round some ancient and originally humble shrine with the unfortunate result that the outermost courts and gateways are the most magnificent and that progress to the holy of holies in a series of artistic disappointments. But at Angkor Wat, this fault is carefully avoided. The long paved road which starts from the first gateway isolates the great central mass of buildings without dwarfing it. And even in the last court, when one looks up, the vast staircases leading to the five towers which crown the pyramid, all that has led up to the central shrine seems, as it should, merely an introduction. The solidity of Cambodian architecture is connected with the prevalence of inundations. With such dangers, it was of primary importance to have a massive substructure which could not be washed away and the style which was necessary in building a firm stone platform inspired the rest of the work. Some unfinished temples reveal the interesting fact that they were erected first as piles of plain masonry. Then came the decorator and carved the stones as they stood in their places, so that instead of carving separate blocks, he was able to contemplate his design as a whole and to spread it over many stones. Hence, most Cambodian buildings have a peculiar air of unity. They have not had ornaments affixed to them, but have grown into an ornamental whole. Yet, if an unfavorable criticism is to be made on these edifices, especially Angkor Wat, it is that the sculptures are wanting in meaning and importance. They cannot be compared to the reliefs of Borobudur, a veritable catechism in stone where every clause teaches the believer something new or even to the piles of figures in Dravidian temples which, though of small artistic merit, seem to represent the world of the world with all its men and monsters, struggling from life into death and back to life again. The reliefs in the great corridors of Angkor are purely decorative. The artist justly felt that so long a stretch of plain stone would be wearisome and as decoration, his work is successful. Looking outwards, the eye is satisfied with such variety as the trees and houses in the temple courts afford. Looking inwards, it finds similar variety in the warriors and deities portrayed on the walls. Some of the scenes have an historical interest, but the attempt to follow the battles of the Ramayana or the churning of the sea soon becomes a tedious task, for there is little individuality or inspiration in the figures. This want of any obvious correspondence between the decoration and cult of the Cambodian temples often makes it difficult to say to what deities they were dedicated. The Bayon or Shivasrama was presumably a Linga temple, yet the conjecture is not confirmed as one would expect by any indubitable evidence in the decoration or arrangements. In its general plan, the building seems more Indian than others, and like the temples of Jagannatha at Puri, consists of three successive chambers, each surmounted by a tower. The most remarkable feature in the decoration is the repetition of the four-headed figure at the top of every tower, a striking and effective motive which is also found above the gates of the town. Chao Ta Kwan says that there were golden statues of Buddhas at the entrance to the Bayon. It is impossible to say whether this statement is accurate or not. He may have simply made a mistake, but it is equally possible that the fusion of the two creeds may have ended in images of the Buddha being placed outside the shrine of the Linga. Strange as it may seem, there is no clear evidence as to the character of the worship performed in Cambodia's greatest temple, Angkor Wat. Since the prince who commenced it was known by the posthumous title of Parava Parama Vishnu Loka, we may presume that he intended to dedicate it to Vishnu and some of the sculptures appear to represent Vishnu slaying a demon. But it was not finished until after his death, and his intentions may not have been respected by his successors. An authoritative statement warns us that it is not safe to say more about the date of Angkor Wat than that its extreme limits are 1050 and 1170. Jay Varman 7 who came to the throne at about this latter date, was a Buddhist, and may possibly have used the great temple for his own worship. 
The sculptures are hardly Brahmanic in the theological sense, and those which represent the pleasures of paradise and the pains of hell recall Buddha's delineations of the same theme. The four images of the Buddha which are now found in the central tower are modern, and all who have seen them well, I think, agree that the figure of the great teacher which seems so appropriate in the neighboring monasteries is strangely out of place in this aerial shrine. For what the designer of the building intended to place there remains a mystery. Perhaps an empty throne, such as is seen in the temples of Annam and Bali, would have been the best symbol. Though the monuments of Cambodia are well preserved, the grey and massive severity which marks them at present is probably very different from the appearance that they wore when used for worship. From Chow Takwan and other sources, we gather that the towers and porches were gilded, the base reliefs and perhaps the whole surface of the walls were painted, and the building was ornamented with flags. Music and dances were performed in the courtyards, and as in many Indian temples, the intention was to create a scene which by its animation and brilliancy might amuse the deity and rival the pleasures of paradise. It is remarkable that the ancient Cambodia, which has left us so many monuments, produced no books. Though the inscriptions and Chow Takwan testify to the knowledge of literature, especially religious, both Brahmanic and Buddhist diffused among the upper classes, no original works or even adaptations of Indian originals have come down to us. The length and ambitious character of many inscriptions give an idea of what the Cambodians could do in the way of writing, but the result is disappointing. These poems in stone show a knowledge of Sanskrit, of Indian poetry and theology, which is surprising if we consider how far from India they were composed. But they are almost without exception, artificial, frigid and devoid of vigor or inspiration. End of section 8 Recording by Seema Parikyat Section 9 of Hinduism and Buddhism, An Historical Sketch, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ginny Rosario. Hinduism and Buddhism, An Historical Sketch, Volume 3, by Sir Charles Eliot, Chapter 9, Champa, Section 1. The Kingdom of Champa, though a considerable power from about the 3rd century until the end of the 15th, has attracted less attention than Cambodia or Java. Its name is a thing of the past and known only to students. Its monuments are inferior in size and artistic merit to those of the other Hindu kingdoms in the Far East, and perhaps its chief interest is that it furnishes the oldest Sanskrit inscription yet known from these regions. Champa occupied the southeastern corner of Asia, beyond the Malay Peninsula, if the word corner can be properly applied to such rounded outlines. Its extent varied at different epochs, but it may be roughly defined in the language of modern geography as the southern portion of Anam, comprising the provinces of Quan Nam in the north and Bing Tuan in the south, with the intervening country. It was divided into three provinces, which respectively became the seat of empire at different periods. They were in the north Amaravati, the modern Kuang Nam, with the towns of Indrapura and Sinhapura, in the middle Vijaya, the modern Bing Din, with the town of Vijaya and the port of Sri Vinaya, in the south Pandaranga or Panran, the modern provinces of Phan Rang and Bin Tuan, with the town of Virapura or Rajapura. A section of Pandaranga called Kathara, the modern Khan Ho, was a separate province at certain times. Like the modern Anam, Champa appears to have been mainly a littoral kingdom and not to have extended far into the mountains of the interior. Champa was the ancient name of a town in western Bengal near Bagalpur, but its application to these regions does not seem due to any connection with northeastern India. The conquerors of the country, who were called Chams, had a certain amount of Indian culture and considered the classical name Champa as an elegant expression for the land of the Chams. Judging by their language, these Chams belonged to the Malay Polynesian group 
and their distribution along the littoral suggests that they were invaders from the sea, like the Malay pirates from whom they themselves subsequently suffered. The earliest inscription in the Cham language dates from the beginning of the ninth century, but it is preceded by a long series of Sanskrit inscriptions, the oldest of which, that of Vokan, is attributed at latest to the third century, and refers to an earlier king. It therefore seems probable that the Hindu dynasty of Champa was founded between 150 and 200 AD, but there is no evidence to show whether a Malay race already settled in Champa was conquered and Hinduized by Indian invaders, or whether the Chams were already Hinduized when they arrived, possibly from Java. The inferiority of the Chams to the Khmers in civilization was the result of their more troubled history. Both countries had to contend against the same difficulty, a powerful and aggressive neighbor on either side. Cambodia, between Siam and Anam in 1800, was in very much the same position as Champa had been between Cambodia and Anam 500 years earlier. But between 950 and 1150 AD, when Champa by no means enjoyed stability and peace, the history of Cambodia, if not altogether tranquil, at least records several long reigns of powerful kings who were able to embellish their capital and assure its security. The Chams were exposed to attacks not only from Anam, but also from the more formidable, if distant, Chinese and their capital, instead of remaining stationary through several centuries like Angkor Thom, was frequently moved as one or other of the three provinces became more important. The inscription of Vokan is in correct Sanskrit prose and contains a fragmentary address from a king who seems to have been a Buddhist and writes somewhat in the style of Asoka. He boasts that he is of the family of Srimmararaja. The letters closely resemble those of Rudradaman's inscription at Girnar and contemporary inscriptions at Kanheri. The text is much mutilated so that we know neither the name of the writer nor his relationship to Srimara, but the latter was evidently the founder of the dynasty and may have been separated from his descendant by several generations. It is noticeable that his name does not end in Varman like those of later kings. If he lived at the end of the second century, this would harmonize with the oldest Chinese notices which fix the rise of Lin Ai their name for Champa, about 192 A.D. Agreeably to this, we also hear that Hun Tien founded an Indian kingdom in Funan considerably before 265 A.D., and that sometime between 220 and 280, a king of Funan sent an embassy to India. The name Funan may include Champa, but though we hear of Hindu kingdoms in these districts at an early date, we know nothing of their civilization or history, nor do we obtain much information from those Cham legends which represent the dynasties of Champa as descended from two clans, those of the Cabbage Palm, Arakier, and Coconut. Chinese sources also state that a king called Fan Yi sent an embassy to China in 284 and give the names of several kings who reigned between 336 and 440. One of these, Fan Hu Ta, is apparently the Badravarman who has left some Sanskrit inscriptions dating from about 400, and who built the first temple at Mi so Un. This became the national sanctuary of Champa. It was burnt down about 575 AD, but rebuilt. Badravarman's son, Gangaraja, appears to have abdicated, and to have gone on a pilgrimage to the Ganges another instance of the intercourse prevailing between these regions and India. It would be useless to follow in detail the long chronicle of the kings of Champa, but a few events merit mention. In 446, and again in 605, the Chinese invaded the country and severely chastised the inhabitants. But the second invasion was followed by a period of peace and prosperity, Sambu Varman restored the temples of Misoun, and two of his successors, both called Vikranta Varman, were also great builders. The kings who reigned from 758 to 859 reckoned as the fifth dynasty belonged to the south and had their capital at Viapura. The change seems to have been important for the Chinese who had previously called the country Lin Ai, henceforth call it Huan Wang. 
the natives continue to use the name Champa, but Satya Varman and the other kings of the dynasty do not mention Miso Un, though they adorned and endowed Po Nagar and other sanctuaries in the south. It was during this period, A.D. 774 and 787, that the province of Kuthara was invaded by pirates, described as thin black barbarians and cannibals, and also as the armies of Java. They pillaged the temples but were eventually expelled. They were probably Malays, but it is difficult to believe that the Javanese could be seriously accused of cannibalism at this period. The capital continued to be transferred under subsequent dynasties. Under the 6th, 860-900, to 900, it was at Indrapura in the north. Under the 7th, 900-986, to 986, it returned to the south. Under the 8th, 989-1044, to 1044, it was in Vijaya, the central province. These internal changes were accompanied by foreign attacks. The Khmers invaded the southern province in 945. On the north, an Anamite prince founded the kingdom of Dai Kuviet, which became a thorn in the side of Champa. In 982, its armies destroyed Indrapura, and in 1044, they captured Vijaya. In 1069, King Rudravarman was taken prisoner, but was released in return for the cession of the three northernmost provinces. Indrapura, however, was rebuilt, and for a time successful wars were waged against Cambodia. But though the kings of Champa did not acquiesce in the loss of the northern provinces, and though Harivarman III, 1074-80, was temporarily victorious, no real progress was made in the contest with Anam, whither the Chams had to send embassies practically admitting that they were a vassal state. In the next century, further disastrous quarrels with Cambodia ensued, and in 1192, Champa was split into two kingdoms, Vijaya in the north under a Cambodian prince, and Pan Ram in the south governed by a Cham prince, but under the suzerainty of Cambodia. This arrangement was not successful, and after much fighting, Champa became a Khmer province, though a very unruly one from 1203 till 1220. Subsequently, the aggressive vigor of the Khmers was tempered by their own wars with Siam, but it was not the fate of Champa to be left in peace. The invasion of Kublai lasted from 1278 to 1285, and in 1306, the provinces of O and Lai were ceded to Anam. Champa now became, for practical purposes, an Anamite province, and in 1318, the king fled to Java for refuge. This connection with Java is interesting, and there are other instances of it. King Jaya Simavarman III of Champa married a Javanese princess called Tapazi. Later, we hear in Javanese records that in the 15th century, the princess Darawadi of Champa married the king of Majapahit, and her sister married Radin Radmat, a prominent Muslim teacher in Java. The power of the Chams was crushed by Anam in 1470. After this date, they had little political importance, but continued to exist as a nationality under their own rulers. In 1650, they revolted against Anam without success, and the king was captured. But his widow was accorded a titular position, and the Cham Chronicle continues the list of nominal kings down to 1822. In Champa, as in Cambodia, no books dating from the Hindu period have been preserved, and probably there were not many. The Cham language appears not to have been used for literary purposes, and whatever culture existed was exclusively Sanskrit. The kings are credited with an extensive knowledge of Sanskrit literature. An inscription at Pagnagar, 918 AD, says that Sri Indravarman was acquainted with the Mimamsa and other systems of philosophy. Janendra and grammar, together with the Kasika, Vritti, and the Savatara Kalpa. Again, an inscription of Misan ascribes to Jaya Indra Varmadeva, circa 1175 AD, proficiency in all the sciences as well as a knowledge of the Mahayana and the Dharma Sastras, particularly of the Naradiya and Bhargaviya. To some extent, original compositions in Sanskrit must have been produced for several of the inscriptions are of considerable length, and one gives a quotation from a work called the Puranartha or Artha Puranastra, 
which appears to have been a chronicle of Champa, but the language of the inscriptions is often careless and incorrect, and indicates that the study of Sanskrit was less flourishing than in Cambodia. Section 2. The monuments of Champa, though considerable in size and number, are inferior to those of Cambodia. The individual buildings are smaller and simpler, and the groups into which they are combined lack unity. Brick was the chief material, stone being used only when brick would not serve, as for statues and lintels. The commonest type of edifice is a square pyramidal structure called by the Chams Kalan. A Kalan is, as a rule, erected on a hill or rising ground. Its lowest story has on the east a porch and vestibule, on the other three sides false doors. The same shape is repeated in four upper stories of decreasing size, which however serve merely for external decoration, and correspond to nothing in the interior. This is a single windowless pyramidal cell lighted by the door and probably also by lamps placed in niches on the inner walls. In the center stood a pedestal for a linga or an image with a channel to carry off libations, leading to a spout in the wall. The outline of the tower is often varied by projecting figures or ornaments, but the sculpture is less lavish than in Cambodia and Java. In the greater religious sites, several structures are grouped together. A square wall surrounds an enclosure entered by a gateway and containing one or more columns, as well as smaller buildings, probably for the use of priests. Before the gateway, there is frequently a hall supported by columns, but open at the sides. All known specimens of Cham architecture are temples. Palaces and other secular buildings were made of wood and have disappeared. Of the many sanctuaries which have been discovered, the most remarkable are those of Mison and Dong Duog, both in the neighborhood of Terrain, and Po Nagar, close to Nha Trang. Mi San is an undulating amphitheater among mountains and contains eight or nine groups of temples founded at different times. The earliest structures erected by Bhadravarman I, about 400, have disappeared and were probably of wood since we hear that they were burnt, apparently by accident, in 575 AD. New temples were constructed by Sambu Varman about 25 years later and were dedicated to Sambu Bhadrasvara in which title, the names of the founder, restorer, and the deity are combined. These buildings, of which portions remain, represent the oldest and best period of Cham art. Another style begins under Vikra Tavarman I, between 657 and 679 AD. This reign marks a period of decadence, and though several buildings were erected at Misan during the 8th and 9th centuries, the locality was comparatively neglected until the reign of Harivarman III, 1074-1080. The temples had been ravaged by the Anamites, but this king, being a successful warrior, was able to restore them and dedicated to them the booty which he had captured. Though his reign marks a period of temporary prosperity in the annals of Champa, the style which he inaugurated in architecture has little originality. It reverts to the ancient forms, but shows conscious archaism rather than fresh vigor. The position of Misan, however, did not decline, and about 1155, Jaya Haravarman I repaired the buildings, dedicated the booty taken in battle, and erected a new temple in fulfillment of a vow. But after this period, the princes of Champa had no authority in the district of Misan, and the Anamites, who seem to have disliked the religion of the Chams, plundered the temples. Ponagar is near the port of Na Trang and overlooks the sea. Being smaller than Misan, it has more unity but still shows little attempt to combine in one architectural whole the buildings of which it is composed. An inscription states with curious precision that the shrine was first erected in the year 5911 of the Davapara age, and this fantastic chronology shows that in our 10th century it was regarded as ancient. As at Misan, the original buildings were probably of wood, for in 774 they were sacked and burnt by pirates who carried off the image. Shortly afterwards, they were rebuilt in brick, by King Satyavarman, and the existing southern tower probably dates from his reign, but the great central tower was built by Haravarman I, 817 AD, and the other edifices are later.
Ponagar, or Yang Ponagar, means the lady or goddess of the city. She was commonly called Bhagavadi in Sanskrit, and appears to have been the chief object of worship at Na Trang, although Siva was associated with her under the name of Bhagavastisvara. In 1050, an Art Hanari image representing Siva and Bhagavati combined in one figure and was presented to the temple by King Paramisvara, and a dedicatory inscription describes this double deity as the cosmic principle. When Champa was finally conquered, the temple was sold to the Anamites, who admitted that they could not acquire it except by some special and peaceful arrangement. Even now they still continue the worship of the goddess, though they no longer know who she is. Dong Duang, about 20 kilometers to the south of Misan, marks the site of the ancient capital Indrapura. The monument which has made its name known differs from those already described. Compared with them, it has some pretensions to be a whole, laid out on a definite plan, and it is Buddhist. It consists of three courts surrounded by walls and entered by massive porticos. In the third, there are about twenty buildings, and perhaps it did not escape the fault common to Cham architecture of presenting a collection of disconnected and unrelated edifices. But still, there is clearly an attempt to lead up from the outermost portico, through halls and gateways, to the principal shrine, from an inscription dated 875 A.D., we learn that the ruins are those of a temple and vihara erected by King Indra Varman and dedicated to Avalokita under the name of Lakshmindra Lokasvara. Section 3. The religion of Champa was practically identical with that of Cambodia. If the inscriptions of the former tell us more about Mukalingas and Koshas, and those of the latter have more allusions to the worship of the compound deity Harihara, this is probably a matter of chance. But even supposing that different cults were specially prominent at different places, it seems clear that all the gods and ceremonies known in Cambodia were also known in Champa, and vice versa. In both countries, the national religion was Hinduism, mainly of the Saveti type, accompanied by Mahayanist Buddhism, which occasionally came to the front under royal patronage. In both, any indigenous beliefs which may have existed did not form a separate system. It is probable, however, that the goddess known at Po Nagar as Bhagavati was an ancient local deity worshipped before the Hindu immigration, and an inscription found at Misan recommends those whose eyes are diseased to propitiate Kuvera and thus secure protection against Ekaksha Pingala, the tawny one-eyed spirit. Though this goddess or demon was probably a creation of local fancy, similar identifications of Kali, with the spirits presiding over cholera, smallpox, etc., take place in India. The social system was theoretically based on the four castes, but Chinese accounts indicate that in questions of marriage and inheritance, older ideas connected with matriarchy and a division into clans still had weight. But the language of the inscriptions is most orthodox. King Vikratan Varman quotes with approval the saying that the horse sacrifice is the best of good deeds, and the murder of a Brahmin the worst of sins. Brahmins, chaplains, parohita, Pandits and ascetics are frequently mentioned as worthy of honor and gifts. The high priest or royal chaplain is styled Sri Paramapurohita, but it does not appear that there was a sacerdotal family enjoying the unique position held by the Sivakai Valyas in Cambodia. The frequent changes of capital and dynasty in Champa were unfavorable to continuity in either church or state. Saveism, without any hostility to Vishnuism or Buddhism, was the dominant creed. The earliest known inscription, that of Vokan, contains indications of Buddhism, but three others believed to date from about 400 AD invoke Siva under some such title as Badrasvara, indicating that a temple had been dedicated to him by King Badravarman. Thus, the practice of combining the names of a king and his patron deity in one appellation existed in Champa at this early date. It is also recorded from southern India, Cambodia, and Java. Besides Siva, one of the inscriptions venerates, though in a rather perfunctory manner, Uma, Brahma, Vishnu, and the five elements. 
Several inscriptions give details of Savete theology, which agree with what we know of it in Cambodia. The world animate and inanimate is an emanation from Siva, but he delivers from the world those who think of him. Meditation, the practice of yoga, and devotion to Siva are several times mentioned with approval. He abides in eight forms corresponding to his eight names, Sarva, Bhava, Pasupati, Asana, Bhima, Rudra, Mahadeva, and Agra. He is also, as in Java, Guru, or the teacher, and he has the usual mythological epithets. He dances in lonely places, he rides on the bull Nandi, is the slayer of Kama, etc. Though represented by figures embodying such legends, he was most commonly adored under the form of the Linga, which in Champa, more than elsewhere, came to be regarded as not merely symbolic, but as a personal god. To mark this individuality, it was commonly enclosed in a metal case, kosha, bearing one or more human faces. It was then called Mukahalinga, and the faces were probably intended as portraits of royal donors, identified with the god in form as well as in name. An inscription of 1163 AD records the dedication of such a kosha, adorned with five royal faces, to Sri Sanabhadrasvara. The god, it is said, will now be able to give his blessing to all regions through his five mouths, which he could not do before, and being enclosed in the kosha, like an embryo in the matrix, he becomes Hiranyagarbha. The linga, with or without these ornaments, was set on a snanadroni, or stone table, arranged for receiving libations, and sometimes, as in Java and Cambodia, four or more lingas were set upon a single slab. From A.D. 400 onwards, the cult of Siva seems to have maintained its paramount position during the whole history of Champa, for the last recorded Sanskrit inscription is dedicated to him. From first to last, it was the state religion. Siva is said to have sent Eroja to be the first king, and is even styled the root of the state of Champa. An inscription of 811 A.D. celebrates the dual deity Sankara Narayana, it is noticeable that Narayana is said to have held up Mount Govardhana and is apparently identified with Krishna. Rama and Krishna are both mentioned in an inscription of 1157, which states that the whole divinity of Vishnu was incarnate in King Jayahavavarman I. But neither allusions to Vishnu nor figures of him are numerous, and he plays the part of an accessory, though respected personage. Garuda, on whom he rides, was better known than the god himself, and is frequently represented in sculpture. The Sakti of Siva, amalgamated as mentioned with a native goddess, received great honor, especially at Natrang, under the names of Uma, Bhagavati, the lady of the city, Yangponagar, and the goddess of Kuthara. In another form or aspect, she was called Malada Kuthara. There was also a temple of Ganesha, Sri Vanayaka, at Nam Trang, but statues of this deity and of Skanda are rare. The Chinese pilgrim Ai Ching, writing in the last year of the 7th century, includes Champa, Lin Ai, in the list of countries which greatly reverence the three jewels, and contrasts it with Funan, where a wicked king had recently almost exterminated Buddhism. He says, in this country, Buddhists generally belong to the Arya Samadhi school, and there are also a few followers of the Arya Savarstivadin school. The statement is remarkable, for he also tells us that the Savarstivadins were the predominant sect in the Malay archipelago and flourished in southern China. The headquarters of the Samitayas were according to the accounts of both Huswan Chuang and Ai Ching in western India, though. Like the three other schools, they were also found in Magadha and eastern India. We also hear that the brother and sister of the emperor Harsha belonged to this sect, and it was probably influential. How it spread to Champa we do not know, nor do the inscriptions mention its name or indicate that the Buddhism which they knew was anything but the mixture of the Mahayana with Savaism, which prevailed in Cambodia. 
I Ching's statements can hardly be interpreted to mean that Buddhism was the official religion of Champa at any rate after 400 AD, for the inscriptions abundantly prove that the Savate shrines of Misan and Po Nagar were, so to speak, national cathedrals where the kings worshipped on behalf of the country. But the Vulcan inscription, approximately 250 AD, though it does not mention Buddhism, appears to be Buddhist, and it would be quite natural that a dynasty founded about 150 AD should be Buddhist, but that intercourse with Cambodia and probably with India should strengthen Savaism. The Chinese annals mention that 1,350 Buddhist books were carried off during a Chinese invasion in 605 AD, and this allusion implies the existence of Buddhism and monasteries with libraries. As in Cambodia, it was perhaps followed by ministers rather than by kings. An inscription found in southern Champa and dated as 829 AD records how a Sthafira named Budanirvana erected two Vaharas and two temples, Divakula to Jina and Sankara, Buddha and Siva, in honor of his deceased father. Shortly afterwards, there came to the throne Indra Varman II, 860 to 890 AD, the only king of Champa who is known to have been a fervent Buddhist. He did not fail to honor Siva as the patron of his kingdom, but like Asoka, he was an enthusiast for the Dharma. He desires the knowledge of the Dharma, he builds monasteries for the sake of the Dharma, he wishes to propagate it, he even says that the king of the gods governs heaven by the principles of Dharma. He wishes to lead all his subjects to the yoke and abode of Buddha, to the city of deliverance. To this end, he founded the Vihara, of Dong Duong, already described, and dedicated it to Sri Lakshmindra, Lokisvara. This last word is a synonym of Avalokita, which also occurs in the dedicatory inscription, but in a fragmentary passage. Lakshmindra is explained by other passages in the inscription, from which we learn that the king's name, before he ascended the throne, was Lakshmindra Bhumisvara, so that the Bodhisattva is here adorned under the name of the king who erected the Vihara according to the custom prevalent in Savedi temples. Like those temples, this Vihara received an endowment of land and slaves of both sexes, as well as gold, silver, and other metals. A king who reigned from 1080 to 1086 was called Paramabodhisattva, but no further epigraphic records of Buddhism are known until the reigns of Jaya Indra Varmadeva, 1167 to 1192, and his successor, Surya Varmadeva. Both of these monarchs, while worshipping Siva, are described as knowing or practicing the Janana, or Dharma, of the Mahayana. Little emphasis seems to be laid on these expressions, but still they imply that the Mahayana was respected and considered part of the royal religion. Surya Varmadeva erected a building called Sri Haruka Harmya. The title is interesting, for it contains the name of the Tantric Buddha Haruka. The grotto of Fang Na, in the extreme north of Champa, province of Kwangbin, must have been a Buddhist shrine. Numerous medallions in clay bearing representations of Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and Dagobas have been found there, but dates are wanting. It does not appear that the Hinayanist influence, which became predominant in Cambodia, extended to Champa. That influence came from Siam, and before it had time to traverse Cambodia, Champa was already in the grip of the Annamites, whose religion with the rest of their civilization came from China rather than India. Chinese culture and writing spread to the Cambodian frontier, and after the decay of Champa, Cambodia marks the permanent limit within which an Indian alphabet and a form of Buddhism not derived through China have maintained themselves. A large number of the Chams were converted to Mohammedanism, but the time and circumstances of the event are unknown. When Friar Gabriel visited the country at the end of the 16th century, a form of Hinduism seems to have been still prevalent. It would be of interest to know how the change of religion was affected, for history repeats itself, and it is likely that the Muslims arrived in Champa by the route followed centuries before by the Hindu invaders. There are still about 130,000 Chams in the south of Anam and Cambodia. In the latter country, they are all Mohammedans. In Anam, some traces of Hinduism remain, such as mantras in broken Sanskrit and hereditary priests called Basai. 
Both religions have become unusually corrupt, but are interesting as showing how beliefs which are radically distinct become distorted and combined in Eastern Asia. End of section 9. Section 10 of Hinduism and Buddhism, an historical sketch, volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Khan Touch This, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Hinduism and Buddhism, an historical sketch, volume 3, by Sir Charles Eliot. Java and the Malay Archipelago. In most of the countries which we have been considering, the native civilization of the present day is still Indian in origin. Although in the former territories of Champa, this Indian phase has been superseded by Chinese culture, with a little Mohammedanism. But in another area, we find three successive stages of culture, indigenous, Indian, and Mohammedan. This area includes the Malay Peninsula, with a large part of the Malay archipelago, and the earliest stratum with which we need concern ourselves is Malay. The people who bear this name are remarkable for their extraordinary powers of migration by sea, as shown by the fact that languages connected with Malay are spoken in Formosa and New Zealand, in Easter Island, and Madagascar. But their originality both in thought and in the arts of life is small. The three stages are seen most clearly in Java, where the population was receptive and the interior accessible. Sumatra and Borneo also passed through them in a fashion, but the indigenous element is still predominant and no foreign influence has been able to affect either island as a whole. Islam gained no footing in Bali which remains curiously Hindu, but it reached Celebes and the southern Philippines, in both of which Indian influence was slight. The destiny of southeastern Asia, with its islands, depends on the fact that the tide of trade and conquest, whether Hindu, Muslim, or European, flowed from India or Ceylon to the Malay Peninsula and Java, and thence northwards towards China, with a reflux westwards in Champa and Cambodia. Burma and Siam lay outside this track. They received their culture from India mainly by land and were untouched by Mohammedanism. But the Mohammedan current which affected the Malays was old and continuous. It started from Arabia in the early days of the Hijra and had nothing to do with the Muslim invasions which entered India by land. Indian civilization appears to have existed in Java from at least the 5th century of our era. Much light has been thrown on its history of late by the examination of inscriptions and of fairly ancient literature, but the record still remains fragmentary. There are considerable gaps. The seat of power shifted from one district to another, and at most epochs, the whole island was not subject to one ruler, so that the title King of Java merely indicates a prince preeminent among others doubtfully subordinate to him. The name Java is probably the Sanskrit Yava, used in the sense of grain, especially millet. In the Ramayana, the monkeys of Hanuman are bidden to seek for Sita in various places, including Yavadipa, which contains seven kingdoms, and produces gold and silver. Others translate these last words as referring to another or two other islands known as gold and silver land. It is probable that the poet did not distinguish clearly between Java and Sumatra. He goes on to say that beyond Java is the peak called Sisira. This is possibly the same as the Yavakoti, mentioned in 499 AD by the Indian astronomer Aryabhata. Since the Ramayana is a product of gradual growth, it is not easy to assign a definite date to this passage, but it is probably not later than the 1st or 2nd century AD, and an early date is rendered probable by the fact that the Alexandrian geographer Ptolemy, circa 130 AD, mentions Nasus Ayyavadio is Sebadio, and by various notices collected from inscriptions and from Chinese historians. The annals of the Liang Dynasty, circa 502 to 556 AD, in speaking of the countries of the Southern Ocean, say that in the reign of Suan Ti, year 73 to 49 BC, the Romans and Indians sent envoys to China by that route. 
thus indicating that the archipelago was frequented by Hindus. The same work describes under the name of Lang Ya Siu, a country which professed Buddhism and used the Sanskrit language, and states that, quote, the people say that their country was established more than 400 years ago, end quote. Lang Ya Siu has been located by some in Java, by others in the Malay Peninsula, but even on the latter's supposition, this testimony to Indian influence in the Far East is still important. An inscription found at Kedah in the Malay Peninsula is believed to be older than 400 AD. No more definite accounts are forthcoming before the 5th or 6th century. Fa Xian relates how in 418, he returned to China from India by sea and, quote, arrived at the country called Yavadi. In this country, he says, heretics and Brahmins flourish, but the law of Buddha hardly deserves mentioning, end quote. Three inscriptions found in West Java, in the district of Bath and Zorsh, are referred for paleographic reasons to about 400 AD. They are all in Sanskrit and eulogize a prince named Purnarvarman, who appears to have been a Vishnuit. The name of his capital is deciphered as Naruma or Taruma. In 435, according to the Liu Sang Annals, a king of Javada named Shiri Padado Alapamo sent tribute to China. The king's name probably represents a Sanskrit title beginning with Sri Pada and it is noticeable that two footprints are carved on the stones which bear Purnavarman's inscriptions. Also, Sanskrit inscriptions found at Koite on the east coast of Borneo are considered to be not later than the 5th century record the piety and gifts to Brahmans of a king Mulavarman and mention his father and grandfather. It follows from these somewhat disjointed facts that the name of Yavadipa was known in India soon after the Christian era, and that by the 5th century, Hindu or Hinduized states had been established in Java. The discovery of early Sanskrit inscriptions in Borneo and Champa confirms the presence of Hindus in these seas. The Tang annals speak definitely of Kaling, otherwise called Java, as lying between Sumatra and Bali, and say that the inhabitants have letters and understand a little astronomy. They further mention the presence of Arabs, and say that in 674, a queen named Sima ascended the throne and ruled justly. But the certain data for Javanese history before the 8th century are few. For that period, we have some evidence from Java itself. An inscription dated 654 Saka, equivalent to 732 AD, discovered in Kedo, celebrates the praises of a king named Sanjaya, son of King Sana. It contains an account of the dedication of a linga, invocations of Siva, Brahma, and Vishnu, an eulogy of the king's virtue and learning, and praise of Java. Thus, about 700 AD, there was a Hindu kingdom in mid-Java, and this, it would seem, was then the part of the island most important politically. Buddhist inscriptions of a somewhat later date, one is of 778 AD, have been found in the neighborhood of Prambanam. They are written in the Nagari alphabet, and record various pious foundations. A little later again, on the 809 and 840th AD, are the inscriptions found on the Diyang, a lonely mountain plateau on which are several Brahmanic shrines in fair preservation. There is no record of their builders, but the new Tang annals say that the royal residence was called Java, but, quote, on the mountains is the district Lang Piya, where the king frequently goes to look at the sea, end quote. This may possibly be a reference to pilgrimages to Diyang. The inscriptions found on the great monument of Borobudur throw no light on the circumstances of its foundation, but the character of the writing makes it likely that it was erected about 850, and obviously by a king who could command the services of numerous workmen as well as of skilled artists. The temples of Prambanam are probably to be assigned to the next century. All these buildings indicate the existence from the 8th to the 10th century of a considerable kingdom, or perhaps kingdoms, in Middle Java, comprising at least the regions of Mataram, Kedo, and the Diyang Plateau. From the Arabic geographers also we learn that Java was powerful in the 9th century, 
and attacked Khmer, probably Khmer or Cambodia. They placed the capital at the mouth of a river, perhaps the Solo or Brantas. If so, there must have been a principality in East Java at this period. This is not improbable, for archaeological evidence indicates that Hindu civilization moved eastwards and flourished first in the west, then in mid-Java, and finally from the 9th to the 15th centuries in the east. The evidence at our disposal points to the fact that Java received most of its civilization from Hindu colonists. But who were these colonists, and from what part of India did they come? We must not think of any sudden and definite conquest, but rather of a continuous current of immigration starting perhaps from several springs, and often merely trickling, but occasionally swelling into a flood. Native traditions collected by Raffles ascribe the introduction of Brahmanism and the Saka era to the sage Tritrasta, and represent the invaders as coming from Kalinga or from Gujarat. The difference of locality may be due to the fact that there was a trade route running from Broak to Masulipatam through Tagara, now Ter. People arriving in the Far East by this route might be described as coming either from Kalinga, where they embarked, or from Gujarat, their country of origin. Dubious as is the authority of these legends, they perhaps preserve the facts in outline. The earliest Javanese inscriptions are written in a variety of the Vengi script, and the Tang annals called the island Kaling as well as Java. It is therefore probable that early tradition represented Kalinga as the home of the Hindu invaders, but later immigrants may have come from other parts. Fa Xian could find no Buddhists in Java in 418, but Indian forms of Mahayanism indubitably flourished there in later centuries. The Kalasan inscription dated 778 AD and engraved Nagari characters records the erection of a temple to Tara and of a Mahayanist monastery. The change in both alphabet and religion suggests the arrival of new influences from another district, and the Javanese traditions about Gujarat are said to find an echo among the bards of Western India and in such proverbs as, they who go to Java come not back. In the period of the Hunnish and Arab invasions, there may have been many motives for immigration from Gujarat. The land route to Kalinga was probably open, and the sea route offers no great difficulties. Another indication of connection with northwestern India is found in the Chinese work Kao Seng Chuan, circa 519 AD, or Biographies of Eminent Monks. If the country they're called Shi Pao can be identified with Java, it is related that Gunavarman, son of the king of Kashmir, became a monk and, declining the throne, went first to Ceylon and then to the kingdom of Shi Pao, which he converted to Buddhism. He died at Nanking in 431 BC. Taranatha states that Indochina, which calls the Kokai country, was first evangelized in the time of Asoka, and that Mahayanism was introduced there by the disciples of Vasubandhu, who probably died about 360 AD, so that the activity of his followers would take place in the 5th century. He also says that many clergy from the Kokai country were in Madhyadesa from the time of Dharmapala, about 800 AD onwards, and these two statements, if they can be accepted, certainly explain the character of Javanese and Cambodian Buddhism. Taranatha is a confused and untrustworthy writer, but his statement about the disciples of Vasubandhu is confirmed by the fact that Dignaga, who was one of them, is the only authority cited in the Kamahayanikan. The fact that the terms connected with rice cultivation are Javanese and not loan words indicates that the island had some indigenous civilization when the Hindus first settled there. Doubtless, they often came with military strength, but on the whole as colonists and teachers rather than as conquerors. The Javanese kings of whom we know most appear to have been not members of Hindu dynasties, but native princes who had adopted Hindu culture and religion. Sanskrit did not out Javanese as the language of epigraphy, poetry, and even religious literature. Javanese Buddhism appears to have preserved its powers of growth and to have developed some special doctrines. But Indian influence penetrated almost all institutions and is visible even today. 
Its existence is still testified to by the alphabet in use by such titles as Arjo, Raja, Prabo, Dipati, equivalent to Adipati, and by various superstitions about lucky days and horoscopes. Communal land tenure of the Indian kind still exists, and in former times, grants of land were given to priests and, as in India, recorded on copper plates. Offerings to old statues are still made, and the Tangresi are not even nominal Mohammedans. The Balinese still profess a species of Hinduism and employ a Hindu calendar. From the 10th century onwards, the history of Java becomes a little plainer. Copper plates, dating from about 900 AD, mention Mataram, a certain Mpo Sindok, was vizier of this kingdom in 919. But 10 years later, we find him an independent king in East Java. He lived at least 25 years longer, and his possessions include Pasoiroen, Sorabaja, and Kediri. His great-grandson, Erlanga, or Langya, is an important figure. Erlanga's early life was involved in war, but in 1032, he was able to call himself, though perhaps not with great correctness, king of all Java. His memory has not endured among the Javanese, but is still honored in the traditions of Bali and Javanese literature, began in his reign or a little earlier. The poem Arjuna Vivaha is dedicated to him, and one book of the old Javanese prose translation of the Mahabharata bears a date equivalent to 996 AD. One of the national heroes of Java is Jajabaja, who is supposed to have lived in the 9th century. But tradition must be wrong here, for the free poetic rendering of part of the Mahabharata is called Brata Yuda, composed by Mpo Seda in 1157 AD, is dedicated to him, and his reign must therefore be placed later than the traditional date. He is said to have founded the kingdom of Daha in Kadiri, but his inscriptions merely indicate that he was a worshipper of Vishnu. Literature and art flourished in East Java at this period, for it would seem that the Kavi Ramayana and an Aras poetica called Vrita Sankaya were written about 1150 and that the temple of Panataran was built between 1150 and 1175. In Western Java, we have an inscription of 1030 found on the river Jitjatih. It mentions a prince who is styled Lord of the World, and native tradition confirmed by inscriptions, which however give few details, relates that in the 12th century, a kingdom called Pajajaran was founded in the Soenda country south of Batavia by princes from Tomapel in eastern Java. There is a gap in Javanese history from the reign of Jajabaja till 1222, at which date the Pararaton or Book of the Kings of Tomapel and Majapahit, begins to furnish information. The Sang Annals also give some account of the island, but it is not clear to what years the description refers. They imply, however, that there was an organized government and that commerce was flourishing. They also state that the inhabitants, quote, pray to the gods and Buddha, end quote, that Java was at war with eastern Sumatra, that embassies were sent to China in 992 and 1109, and that in the year 1129, the emperor gave the ruler of Java, probably Jajabaja, the title of king. The Pararaton opens with the fall of Daha in 1222, which made Tomapel known later as Singasari, the principal kingdom. Five of its kings are enumerated of whom Vishnu Vardhana was buried in the celebrated shrine of Jandi Jago, where he was represented in the guise of Buddha. His successor, Sri Rajasanagara, was praised by the poet Prapanja as a zealous Buddhist, but was known by the posthumous name of Siva Buddha. He was the first to use the name of Singasari and perhaps founded a new city, but the kingdom of Tomapel came to an end in his reign for he was slain by Jajakatong, prince of Daha who restored to that kingdom its previous primacy, but only for a short time, since it was soon supplanted by Majapahit. The foundation of this state is connected with a Chinese invasion of Java, related at some length in the Yuan Annals, so that we are fortunate in possessing a double and fairly consistent account of what occurred. 
we learn from these sources that sometime after Kublai Khan had conquered China, he sent missions to neighboring countries to demand tribute. The Javanese had generally accorded a satisfactory reception to Chinese missions, but on this occasion, the king, apparently Jia Jia Katong, maltreated the envoy and sent him back with his face cut or tattooed. Kublai could not brook this outrage and in 1292 dispatched a punitive expedition. At that time, Raden Vijaja, the son-in-law of Kirtanagara, had not submitted to Jaja Katong and held out at Majapahit, a stronghold which he had founded near the river Brantas. He offered his services to the Chinese, and after a two-month campaign, Daha was captured and Jaja Katong killed. Raden Vijaja now found that he no longer needed his Chinese allies. He treacherously massacred some and prepared to fight the rest. But the Mongol generals, seeing the difficulties of campaigning in an unknown country without guides, prudently returned to their master and reported that they had taken Daha and killed the insolent king. Majapahit, or Wilwatikta, now became the premier state of Java and had some permanency. Eleven sovereigns, including three queens, are enumerated by the Pararaton until its collapse in 1468. We learn from the Ming annals and other Chinese documents that it had considerable commercial relations with China and sent frequent missions, also that Palembang was a vassal of Java. But the general impression left by the Pararaton is that during the greater part of its existence, Majapahit was a distracted and troubled kingdom. In 1403, as we know from both Chinese and Javanese sources, there began a great war between the Western and Eastern kingdoms, that is, between Majapahit and Balambangan in the extreme east, and in the 15th century, there was twice an interregnum. Art and literature, though not dead, declined, and events were clearly tending towards a breakup or revolution. This appears to have been consummated in 1468, where the Pararaton simply says that King Pandansalas III left the Kraton, or royal residence. It is curious that the native traditions as to the date and circumstances in which Majapahit fell should be so vague, but perhaps the end of Hindu rule in Java was less sudden and dramatic than we are inclined to think. Islam had been making gradual progress, and its last opponents were kings only in title. The Chinese mentioned the presence of Arabs in the 7th century, and the geography called Ying Yai Sheng Lan, published in 1416, which mentions Grise, Sardarbaja, and Majapahit as the principal towns of Java, divides the inhabitants into three classes. A. Mohammedans who have come from the west, quote, their dress and food is clean and proper, end quote. B. The Chinese, who are also cleanly, and many of whom are Mohammedans. C. The natives, who are ugly and uncouth, devil worshippers, filthy in food and habits. As the Chinese do not generally speak so severely of the Hinduized Javanese, it would appear that Hinduism lasted longest among the lower and more savage classes, and that the Muslims stood on a higher level. As in other countries, the Arabs attempted to spread Islam from the time of their first appearance. At first, they confined their propaganda to their native wives and dependents. Later, we hear of veritable apostles of Islam, such as Malik Ibrahim and Raden Rahmat, the ruler of a town called Ampel, which became the headquarter of Islam. The princes, whose territory lay around Majapahit, were gradually converted, and the extinction of the last Hindu kingdom became inevitable. It is remarkable that the great island of Sumatra, which seems to lie in the way of anyone proceeding from India eastwards and is close to the Malay Peninsula, should in all ages have proved less accessible to invaders coming from the west than the more distant Java. Neither Hindus, Arabs, nor Europeans have been able to establish their influence there in the same thorough manner. The cause is probably to be found in its unhealthy and impenetrable jungles, but even so, its relative isolation remains singular. It does not appear that any prince ever claimed to be king of all Sumatra. For the Hindu period, we have no indigenous literature, and our scanty knowledge is derived from a few statues and inscriptions, and from notices in Chinese writings. The latter do not refer to the island as a whole, 
but to several states such as Indragiri near the equator and Kandali, afterwards called San Bosai, the Sabaza of the Arabs, near Palembang. The annals of the Liang dynasty say that the customs of Kandali were much the same as those of Cambodia, and apparently we are to understand that the country was Buddhist, for one king visited the emperor Wu Qi in a dream, and his son addressed a letter to his majesty eulogizing his devotion to Buddhism. Kandali is said to have sent three envoys to China between 454 and 519. The Chinese pilgrim Ai Ching visited Sumatra twice, once for two months in 672, and subsequently for some years, about the years 688 to 695. He tells us that in the islands of the Southern Sea, quote, which are more than 10 countries, end quote, Buddhism flourishes, the school almost universally followed, being the Mula Sarvatisvada, though the Samatiyas and other schools have a few adherents. He calls the country where he sojourned and to which these statements primarily refer Boja or Sri Boja, Foshi or Shili Foshi, adding that its former name was Malayu. It is conjectured that Shili Foshi is the place later known as San Bosai, and Chinese authors seem to consider that both this place and the earlier Kandali were roughly speaking identical with Palembang. Ai Ching tells us that the king of Boja favoured Buddhism, and that there were more than a thousand priests in the city. Gold was abundant, and golden flowers were offered to the Buddha. There were communication by ship with both India and China. The Hinayana, he says, was the form of Buddhism adopted, quote, except in Malayu, where there are a few who belong to the Mahayana, end quote. This is a surprising statement but it is impossible to suppose that an expert like Ai Ching can have been wrong about what he actually saw in Sri Boja. So far as his remarks apply to Java, they must be based on hearsay and have less authority, but the sculptures of Borobudur appear to show the influence of Mulasara Fastivadin literature. It must be remembered that this school, though nominally belonging to the Hinayana, came to be something very different from the Theravada of Ceylon. The Song Annals and subsequent Chinese writers know the same district, the modern Palembang, as San Bosai, which may indicate either mere change of name or the rise of a new city, and say that it sent 21 envoys between the years 960 and 1178. The real object of these missions was to foster trade, and there was evidently frequent intercourse between eastern Sumatra, Champa, and China. Ultimately, the Chinese seem to have thought that the entertainment of Sumatran diplomatists cost more than they were worth, for in 1178, the emperor ordered that they should not come to court but present themselves in the province of Fukien. The annals state that Sanskrit writing was in use at San Bosai and led us to suppose that the country was Buddhist. They mentioned several kings whose names or titles seem to begin with the Sanskrit word Sri. In the year 1003, the envoys reported that a Buddhist temple had been erected in honour of the emperor, and they received a present of bells for it. Another envoy asked for dresses to be worn by Buddhist monks. The Ming annals also recorded missions from San Bosai up to 1376, shortly after which the region was conquered by Java and the town decayed. In the 14th century, Chinese writers began to speak of Sumantala, or Sumatra, by which is meant not the whole island, but a state in the northern part of it called Samudra, and corresponding to Aceh. It had relations with China, and the manners and customs of its inhabitants are said to be the same as in Malacca, which probably means they were Muslims. Little light is thrown on the history of Sumatra by indigenous or Javanese monuments. Those found testify, as might be expected, to the existence here and there of both Brahmanism and Buddhism. In 1343, a Sumatran prince named Aditya Varman, who was apparently a vassal of Majapahit, erected an image of Manjusri at Jandi Jago, and in 1375, one of Amogapasa. The Liang and Tang annals both speak of a country called Poli, 
described as an island lying to the southeast of Canton. Kronevelt identified it with Sumatra, but the account of its position suggests that it is rather to be found in Borneo, parts of which were undoubtedly known to the Chinese as Polo and Puni. The Liang Annals state that Po Li sent an embassy to the Emperor Wu Qi in 518, bearing a letter which described the country as devoted to Buddhism and frequented by students of the Three Vehicles. If the letter is an authentic document, the statements in it may still be exaggerations, for the piety of Wu Qi was well known, and it is clear that foreign princes who addressed him thought it prudent to represent themselves and their subjects as fervent Buddhists. But there certainly was a Hindu period in Borneo, of which some tradition remains among the natives, although it ended earlier and left fewer permanent traces than in Java and elsewhere. The most important records of this period are three Sanskrit inscriptions found at Koete on the east coast of Borneo. They record the donations made to Brahmans by King Mulavarman, son of Asvavarman, and grandson of Kundaga. They are not dated, but Kern considers the paleographical reasons that they are not later than the 5th century. Thus, since three generations are mentioned, it is probable that about 400 AD there were Hindu princes in Borneo. The inscriptions testify to the existence of Hinduism there rather than of Buddhism. In fact, the statements in the Chinese annals are the only evidence for the latter. But it is most interesting to find that these annals give the family name of the king of Poli as Kaundinya, which in no doubt corresponds to the Kundaga of the Koite inscription. At least one, if not two, of the Hindu invaders of Cambodia bore this name and we can hardly be wrong in supposing that members of the same great family became princes in different parts of the Far East. One explanation of their presence in Borneo would be that they went thither from Cambodia, but we have no record of expeditions from Cambodia, and if adventurers started thence, it is not clear why they went to the east coast of Borneo. It would be less strange if Kaundinyas emigrating from Java reached both Cambodia and Koite. It is noticeable that in Java, Koite, Champa, and Cambodia alike, royal names end in Varman. The architectural monuments of Java are remarkable for their size, their number, and their beauty. Geographically, they fall into two chief groups, the central, Borobudur, Prambanan, Diang Plateau, etc., in or near the kingdom of Mataram, and the eastern, Jandijago, Singasari, Panataran, etc., lying not at the extremity of the island, but chiefly to the south of Sorabaja. No relic of antiquity deserving to be called a monument has been found in western Java for the records left by Purnavarman, circa 400 AD, are merely rocks bearing inscriptions and two footprints, as a sign that the monarch's triumphal progress is compared to the three steps of Vishnu. The earliest dated monument in mid-Java, Jandi Kalasan, in 779 AD, is Buddhist and lies in the plain of Prambanan. It is dedicated to Tara and is of a type common both in Java and Champa, namely a chapel surmounted by a tower. In connection with it was erected the neighboring building called Jandi Sari, a two-storied monastery for Mahayanist monks. Not far distant is Jandi Sebu, which superficially resembles the 450 pagodas of Mandalay, for it consists of a central cruciform shrine surrounded by about 240 smaller separate chapels, every one of which, apparently, contained the statue of a Dhyani Buddha. Other Buddhist buildings in the same region are Jandi Plawasan and the beautiful chapel known as Jandi Mendut in which are gigantic seated images of the Buddha, Manjusri, and Avalokita. The face of the last named is perhaps the most exquisite piece of work ever wrought by the chisel of a Buddhist artist. It is not far from Mendut to Borobudur, which deserves to be included in any list of the wonders of the world. This celebrated stupa, for in essence it is a highly ornamented stupa, with galleries of sculpture rising one above the other on its sides, has been often described and can be described intelligibly only at considerable length. 
I will therefore not attempt to detail or criticize its beauties, but will merely state some points which are important for our purpose. It is generally agreed that it must have been built around 850 AD, but obviously the construction lasted a considerable time, and there are indications that the architects altered their original plan. The unknown founder must have been a powerful and prosperous king, for no one else could have commanded the necessary labour. The stupa shows no sign of Brahmanic influence. It is purely Buddhist and built for purposes of edification. The worshippers performed pradakshina by walking round the galleries one after the other, and as they did so, had an opportunity of inspecting some 2,000 reliefs depicting the previous births of Sakyamuni, his life on earth, and finally, the mysteries of Mahayanist theology, as in Indian pilgrim cities, temple guides were probably ready to explain the pictures. The selection of reliefs is not due to the artist's fancy, but aims at illustrating certain works. Thus, the scenes of the Buddha's life reproduce in stone, the story of the Lalita Vistara, and the Jataka pictures are based on the Divyadana. It is interesting to find that both these works are connected with the school of the Mula Saravas Divadins, which, according to Ai Ching, was the form of Buddhism prevalent in the archipelago. In the third gallery, the figure of Maitreya is prominent and often seems to be explaining something to a personage who accompanies him, as Maitreya is said to have revealed five important scriptures to Asanja, and as there is a tradition that the east of Asia was evangelized by the disciples of Asanja and Vasubandhu, it is possible that the delivery and progress of Maitreya's revelation is here depicted. The fourth gallery seems to deal with the five superhuman Buddhas, their paradises, and other supramundane matters, but the key to this series of sculptures has not yet been found. It is probable that the highest story proved to be too heavy in its original form, and that the central Dagova had to be reduced lest it should break the substructure but it is not known what image or relic was preserved in this Dagoba. Possibly it was dedicated to Vairokana, who is regarded as a supreme being and all-god by some Javanese Buddhists. The creed here depicted in stone seems to be a form of Mahayanism. Sakyamuni is abundantly honoured, but there is no representation of his death. This may be because the Lalita Vistara treats only of his early career, but still, the omission is noteworthy. In spite of the importance of Sakyamuni, a considerable if mysterious part is played by the five superhuman Buddhas and several bodhisattvas, especially Maitreya, Avalokita, and Manjusri. In the celestial scenes, we find numerous bodhisattvas, both male and female, yet the figures are hardly tantric, and there is no sign that any of the personages are Brahmanic deities. Yet the region was not wholly Buddhist. Not far from Borobudur, and apparently of about the same age, is the Sivaite temple of Banon, and the great temple group of Prambanan is close to Kalasan and to the other Buddhist shrines mentioned above. It consists of eight temples, of which four are dedicated to Brahma, Siva, Vishnu, and Nandi respectively, the purpose of the others being uncertain. The largest and most decorated is that dedicated to Siva, containing four shrines in which are images of the god as Mahadeva and as Guru of Ganesha and of Durga. The balustrade is ornamented with a series of reliefs illustrating the Ramayana. These temples, which appear to be entirely Brahmanic, approach in style the architecture of eastern Java and probably date from the 10th century, that is about a century later than the Buddhist monuments but there is no tradition or other evidence of a religious revolution. The temples on the Diang Plateau are also purely Brahmanic and probably older, for though we have no record of their foundation, an inscribed stone dated 800 AD has been found in this district. The plateau, which is 6,500 feet high, was approached by paved roads or flights of stairs on one of which about 4,000 steps still remain. Originally, there seems to have been about 40 buildings on the plateau, but of these only 8 now exist, 
besides several stone foundations which supported wooden structures. The place may have been a temple city analogous to Gurnar or Satrunjaya, but it appears to have been deserted in the 13th century, perhaps in consequence of volcanic activity. The Diang temples are named after the heroes of the Mahabharata, Jandi Arjuna, Jandi Bhimo, etc., but these appear to be late designations. They are rectangular tower-like shrines with porches and a single cellule within. Figures of Brahma, Siva, and Vishnu have been discovered, as well as spouts to carry off the libation water. Before leaving Mid-Java, I should perhaps mention the relatively modern temples of Suku, dated 1435 to 1440 AD. I have not seen these buildings, but they are said to be coarse in execution, and to indicate that they were used by a debased sect of Vishnuites. Their interest lies in the extraordinary resemblance which they bear to the temples of Mexico and Yucatan, a resemblance, quote, which no one can fail to observe, though no one has yet suggested any hypotheses to account for it, end quote. The best known and probably the most important monuments of eastern Java are Panataran, Jandi Jago, and Jadi Singasari. The first is considered to date from about 1150 AD. It is practically a three-storied pyramid with a flat top. The sides of the lower story are ornamented with a series of reliefs illustrating portions of the Ramayana, local legends, and perhaps the exploits of Krishna, but this last point is doubtful. This temple seems to indicate the same stage of belief as Prambanan. It shows no trace of Buddhism, and though Siva was probably the principal deity, the scenes represented in its sculptures are chiefly Vishnuite. Jandijago is in the province of Pasoroen. According to the Pararaton and the Nagarakretagama, Vishnu Vadrana, king of Tomapel, was buried there. As he died in 1272 or 1273 AD, and the temple was already in existence, we may infer that it dates from at least 1250. He was represented there in the form of Sugata, that is the Buddha, and at Waleri in the form of Siva. Here we have the custom known also in Champa and Cambodia of a deceased king being represented by a statue with his own features, but the attributes of his tutelary deity. It is strange that a king named after Vishnu should be portrayed in the guise of Siva and Buddha. But in spite of this impartiality, the cult practice at Jandijago seems to have been not a mixture but Buddhism of a late Mahayanist type. It was doubtless held that Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are identical with Brahmanic deities, but the fairly numerous pantheon discovered in or near the ruin consists of superhuman Buddhas and Bodhisattvas with their spouses. In form, Jandi Jago has somewhat the appearance of a three-storied pyramid, but the steps leading up to the top platform are at one end only, and the shrine, instead of standing in the center of the platform, is at the end opposite to the stairs. The figures in the reliefs are curiously square and clumsy and recall those of Central America. Jandi Singasari, also in the province of Pasoe Roen, is of a different form. It is erected on a single low platform and consists of a plain rectangular building surmounted by five towers such as are also found in Cambodian temples. Jandi Singasari, also in the province of Pasoe Roen, is of a different form. It is erected on a single low platform and consists of a plain rectangular building surmounted by five towers such as are also found in Cambodian temples. There is every reason to believe that it was erected in 1278 AD in the reign of Kretanagara, the last king of Tomapel, and that it is the temple known as Siva Buddhalaya, in which he was commemorated under the name of Siva Buddha. An inscription found close by relates that in 1351 AD, a shrine was erected on behalf of the royal family in memory of those who died with the king. The Nagara Kretagama represents this king as a devout Buddhist, but his very title, Siva Buddha, shows how completely Sivaism and Buddhism were fused in his religion. The same work mentions a temple in which the lower story was dedicated to Siva 
and the upper to Akshobhya. It also leads us to suppose that the king was honoured as an incarnation of Akshobhya, even during his life, and was consecrated as a Jina, under the name of Slichnana Badresvara. The Singasari temple is less ornamented with reliefs than the others described, but has furnished numerous statues of excellent workmanship, which illustrate the fusion of the Buddhist and Sivai pantheons. On the one side, we have Prajnaparamita, Manjusri, and Tara, and the other, Ganesa, the Linga, Siva in various forms, Guru, Nandisvara, Mahakala, etc., Durga, and Brahma. Not only is the Sivaite element predominant, but the Buddhist figures are concerned less with the veneration of the Buddha than with accessory mythology. Javanese architecture and sculpture are no doubt derived from India, but the imported style, whatever it may have been, was modified by local influences, and it seems impossible at present to determine whether its origin should be sought on the eastern or western side of India. The theory that the temples on the Diang and Plateau are Chalukyan buildings appears to be abandoned, but they and many others in Java show a striking resemblance to the shrines found in Champa. Javanese architecture is remarkable for the complete absence not only of radiating arches but of pillars, and consequently of large halls. This feature is no doubt due to the ever-present danger of earthquakes. Many reliefs, particularly those of Panataran, show the influence of a style which is not Indian and may be termed, though not very correctly, Polynesian. The great merit of Japanese sculpture lies in the refinement and beauty of the faces. Among figures executed in India, it would be hard to find anything equal in purity and delicacy to the Avalokita of Mendut, the Manjusri, now in the Berlin Museum, and the Prajna Paramita, now in Leiden. End of section number 10, Java and the Malay Archipelago, parts 1 to 5. Section 11 of Hinduism and Buddhism, an historical sketch, volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pink Row 7, Morganville, New Jersey. Hinduism and Buddhism, an historical sketch, volume 3, by Sir Charles Eliot. Java and the Malay Archipelago, Part 6. From the 11th century until the end of the Hindu period, Java can show a considerable body of literature, which is in part theological. It is unfortunate that no books dating from an earlier epoch should be extant. The sculptures of Prambanam and Brobodur clearly presuppose an acquaintance with the Ramayana, the Lalita Vistara, and other Buddhist works, but as in Cambodia, this literature was probably known only in the original Sanskrit and only to be learned. But it is not unlikely that the Javanese adaptations of the Indian epics, which have come down to us, were preceded by earlier attempts which have disappeared. The old literary language of Java is commonly known as Basa Kali, or Kali. That is the language of poetry. It is, however, simply the predecessor of modern Javanese, and many authorities prefer to describe the language of the island as Old Javanese before the Majapahit period, Middle Javanese during that period, and New ja Javanese after the fall of Majapahit. The greater part of this literature consists of free versions of Sanskrit works or of a substratum in S Sanskrit accompanied by a Javanese explanation. Only a few Javanese works are original, that is to say not obviously inspired by an Indian prototype, but on the other hand, nearly all of them handle their materials with freedom and adapt rather than translate what they know, what they borrow. One of the earliest works preserved appears to be on the Tanto Pangleran, a treatise on cosmology, in which Indian and native ideas are combined. It is supposed to have been written about 1000 AD, before the foundation of the Majapahit Javanese literature flourished especially in the reigns of Erlanga 
and Jaja Baja, that is in the 11th and 12th centuries, respectively, about the time of Erlanga, were produced the old prose version of the Mahabharata, in which certain episodes of that poem are rendered with great freedom, and the poem called Arjuna v. Vaha, or the marriage of Arjuna. The Baharat Yuda, which states that it was composed by Po Seda in 1157 by the order by order of Jab Jabaja, Prince of Kadiri, is even more than the prose version mentioned above, a free rendering of parts of the Mahabharata. It is perhaps based on an older translation preserved in Bali. The Kawi Ramayana was, in the opinion of Kern, composed about 1200 AD. It follows in essentials the story of the Ramayana, but it was apparently composed by a poet unacquainted with Sanskrit who drew his knowledge from some native source now unknown. He appears to have been a Sivite to the 11th century or or referred the Smart, Smaradana and the treatise on prosody called Rita Sanyaya. All this literature is based upon classical Sanskrit models and is not distinctly Buddhist, although the prose version of the Mahabharata states that it was written for Brahmins, Sivites, and Buddhists. Many other translations or adaptations of Sanskrit work are mentioned, such as the Niti Sastra, the Saras Mukhaya, the Tantri, in several editions, a prose translation of the Brahman Dampuruna. Together with grammars and dictionaries, the absence of dates make it e difficult to use the work, these works for the history of the Javanese thought. But it seems clear that during the Majapahit epoch, or perhaps even before it, a, a strong current of Buddhism permeated Javanese literature, somewhat in contrast with the tone of the works hitherto cited. Brand stated, that the Sutta Soma, the Ignot Sava, Kunjarakana, Sanghyan Kama Hayanikan, and Buddha Pamutus are purely Bu Buddhist works, and that the Janta Parva Arjuna Vijaya, Nagara Kretagama Variga, and Babush Babuksha show striking traces of Buddhism. Some of these works are inaccept inaccessible to me, but two of them deserve examination. The Sanghyang Kama Hayanikan and the story of Kunjarakarna. The first is tentatively assigned to the Majapahit epoch or earlier. The second with, some, with the same caution to the 11th century. I do not presume to criticize these dates, which depend partly on linguistic considerations. The Kama Hayanikan is a treatise or perhaps extracts from treatises on Mahayanism as understood in Java and presumably on the normal form of Mahayanism. The other work is an edifying legend, including an exposition of the faith by no one less than, than the Buddha Varokana. In essentials, it agrees with the Kamayanikan, but in details, it shows er either sect se sectarian influence or the idiosyncrasies of the author. The Kamahayanikan consists of Sanskrit verses explained by a commentary in Old Javanese and is partly in the form of questions and answers. The only authority whom it cites is Dignaga. It professes to teach the Ma Mahayana and Mantrayana, which is apparently a misspelling of Mantrayana. The emphasis laid on Vajra, that is Vajra or Dorje, Ganta, Mudra, Mandala, Mystic Syllables, and Devis marks it an offshoot of Tantrism, and it offers many parallels to Nepalese literature. On the other hand, it is curious that it uses the form Nibbana, not Nirvana. Its object is to teach a neophyte who has to receive initiation how to become a Buddha. In the second part, the pupil is addressed as Jinaputra, that is, son of the Buddha, or one of the household of faith. He is to be moderate, but not ascetic in food and clothing. He is not to cleave to the Puranas, 
and tantras, but to practice the paramitas. These are defined first as six, and then four others are added. Under prajna, paramita is given a somewhat obscure amount of the doctrine of sunyata. Then follows the exposition of paramaguya, the highest secret, and mahaguya, the great secret. The latter is defined as being yoga, the bhavanas, the four noble truths, and the ten paramitas. The former explains the embodiment of Bhattara Visesha, that is to say the way in which Buddhas, gods and the world of phenomena, are evolved from a primordial principle called Advaya, and apparently equivalent to the Nepalese Adi Buddha. Advaya is the father, father of Buddha, and Advaya Jnana, also called Barali Prajna Paramita, is his mother. But the Buddha principle at this stage is also called Divarupa. In the next stage, this Diparuva takes form as Sakyamuni, who is regarded as a superhuman form of Buddhahood rather than as a human teacher, for he produces from his right and left side respectively, Lokesvara and Bajrapani. These beings produce the first Akshobhya and Ratnams, Ratnams Vaha, Ratsnam Va, the second Amit, Amitabha and Amogha Siddhi, but Varakana springs directly from the face of Sakyamuni. The five superhuman Buddhas are thus accounted for. From Var Varakana spring Isvara, Siva, Brahma, and Vishnu. From them, the elements, the human body, and the whole world, a considerable part of the treatise is occupied with connecting these various emanations of the Advaya with mystic syllables and in showing how the five Buddhas correspond to the different skandhas, elements, senses, etc. Finally, we are told that there are five Devis, or female counterparts, corresponding in the same order to the Buddhas, named above and called Lakana, Mamaki, Pandaravasini, Tara, and Datvisvari. But it is declared that the first and last of these are the same, and therefore there are really only four Devis. The legend of Kunjarakarna relates how a devout Yaksha of that name went to Bodhika and asked of Varukana instruction in the Holy Law and more especially as to the mysteries of rebirth. Varukana did not refuse, but bade his would-be pupil first visit the realms of Yama, god of the dead. Kunjarakarna did so, saw the punishments of the underworld including the torments prepared for a friend of his, whom he was able to warn on his return. Yama gave him some explanations respecting the alternation of life and death, and he was subsequently privileged to receive a brief but more general exposition of doctrine from Varukana himself. This doctrine is essentially a variety of Indian pantheism, but peculiar in its terminology inasmuch as Varukana like Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, proclaims himself to be the old god and not merely the chief of the five Buddhas. He quotes with approval the saying, You are I, I am you, and affirms the identity of Buddhism and Sivaism. Among the monks, there are no muktas, i.e. none who have attained liberation, because they all consider as two what is really one. The Buddhas say, we are Bodhas, for the Lord Buddha is our highest deity. We are not the same as the Sivites, for the Lord Siva is for them the highest deity. The Sivites are represented as saying that the five Kusikas are development or incarnations of the five Buddhas. Well, my son, this is the conclusion. These are all one. We are Siva. We are Buddha. In this curious exposition, exposition, the author seems to imply that his doctrine is different from that of ordinary Buddhists, and to reprimand them more decidedly than Sivites. He several times used the phrase, Namo Bhattara, Namo Sa Sivaya, Hail Lord, Hail to Siva, yet he can hardly be said to favor the Sivites on the whole, 
for his old goddess Virakana, who once, but only once, receives the title of Buddha. The doctrine attributed to the Sivites that the five Kusikas are identical with the superhuman Buddhas remains obscure. These five personages are said to be are said to be often mentioned in old Javanese literature, but to be variously enumerated. They are identified with the five Indras, but these again are said to be the five senses, Indriyas. Hence, we can find a parallel to this doctrine in the teaching of the Kamahayanikan that the five Buddhas correspond to the five senses. Two other special theses are announced in the story of Kunjarakarna. The first is Vairakana's analysis of a human being, which makes it consist of five Atmans, or souls, called respectively Atman, Setanman, Paratman, Niratman, and Antaratman, which somehow correspond to the five elements, five senses, and five skandhas. The singular list suggests that the author was imperfectly acquainted with the meaning of the Sanskrit words employed, and the whole terminology is strange in a Buddhist writer. Still in the later Upanishads, the epithet Pankatmaka is applied to the human body, especially in the Garbha Upanishad, which, like the passage here, under consideration, gives a psychophysiological explanation of the development of an embryo into a human being. The second thesis is put in the mouth of Yama. He states that when a being has finished his term in purgatory, he returns to life in this world first as a worm or insect, then successively as a higher animal and a human being, first diseased or maimed, and finally perfect. No parallel has yet been quoted to this account of metempsychosis. Thus, the Kunjara Karna contains peculiar views, which are probably sectarian or individual. On the other hand, their apparent singularity may be due to our small knowledge of old Javanese literature. Though other writings are not known to extol Vairakana as being Siva and Buddha in one, yet they have no scruple in identifying Buddhist and Brahmanic deities or connecting them by some system of emanations, as we have already seen in the Kamahayanikan. Such an identity is still more definitely proclaimed in the old Javanese version of the Sudasoma Jataka. It is called Pur Purushara Santa and was composed by Tantilar, who lived at Majapahi in the reign of Raja Sanagara, 1350-1389 to AD. In the Indian original Sura Soma is one of the previous births of Gotama, but the Javanese writer describes him as an avatara of the Buddha, who is Brahma, Vishnu, and Isvara, and he states that the Lord Buddha is not different from Siva, the king of the gods, they are distinct, and they are one. In the law is no dualism. The superhuman Buddhas are identified with various Hindu gods, and also with five senses. Thus, Amitabha is Mahadeva, and Amokasiddhi is Vishnu. This is only a slight variation on the teaching in the Kamahayanikan. There, Brahmanic deities emanate from Sakyamuni through various Bodhis, bodhisattvas and Buddhas. Here, the Buddha sphere is regarded as equivalent to the Hindu Trimurti, and the various aspects of the spirit can be described in either Brahmanic or Buddhistic terminology, though in reality, all Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and gods are one. But like the other authors quoted, Tantalar appears to learn to the Buddhist side of these equations, especially for didactic purposes. For instance, he says that meditation should be guided by Lokesvara's word and Sakayumi's Sakyamuni spirit. Part 7 Thus, it will be seen that if we take Javanese epigraphy, monuments and literature together with Chinese notices, they do some extent 
and confirm one another and enable us to form an outline picture, though with many gaps of the history of thought and religion in the island, Fa Xian tells us that in 41880, Brahmanism flourished, as is testified by the inscriptions of Purnavarman, but the Buddhists were not worth mentioning. Immediately afterwards, probably in 423, Gunavarman is said to have converted Shepo, if that be Java, to Buddhism, and as he came from Kashmir, he was probably a Sarvastivadin. Other monks are mentioned as having visited the southern seas. About 690, I Ching says that Buddhism of the Mula Sarvastivadin school was flourishing in Sumatra, which he visited, and in the other islands of the archipelago, the remarkable series of Buddhist monuments in mid-Java extending from about 779 to 980 confirm confirms his statement. But two questions arise. Firstly, is there any explanation of this sudden efflorescence of Buddhism in the archipelago? And next, what was its doctrinal character? If, as Taranatha says, the disciples of Vasu Bandhu evangelized the countries of the East. Their influence might well have been productive about the time of I Ching's visit. But in any case, during the 6th and 7th centuries, religious travelers must have been continually journeying between India and China in both directions. And some of them must have landed in the archipelago. At the beginning of the 6th century, Buddhism has not yet decadent in India and was all the fashion in China. It is not therefore surprising if it was planted in the islands lying on the route. It may be as indicated above that some specially powerful body of Hindus coming from the region of Gujarat and professing Buddhism founded in Java a new state. As to the character of his early Javanese Buddhism, we have the testimony of I Ching that it was of Mula, Mula Sarvasti Vadin school and Hinayanist. He wrote that he wrote of what he had seen in Sumatra, but of what we but of what he knew only by hearsay in Java, and a statement offers some difficulties. Probably Hinayanism was introduced by Gunavarman, but was superseded by other teachings which were important from time to time after they had won for themselves a position in India. For the Temple of Kalasan, AD 779, is dedicated to Tara, and the inscription found there speaks of the Mahayana with veneration. The late, later Buddhism of Java, Java has literary records, which, so far as I know, are unreservedly Mahayanas but probably the sculptures of Borobodor are the most definite expression which we shall ever have of its earlier phases. Since they contain images of the five superhuman Buddhas and numerous bodhisattvas, they can hardly be called anything but Mahayanist, but on the other hand, the personality of Sakyamuni is emphasized. His life and previous births are pictured in a long series of sculptures, in Maitreya is duly honored. Similar collections of pictures and images may be seen in Burma, which differ doctrinally from those in Java, chiefly by substituting the four human Buddhas and Maitreya for the superhuman Buddhas. But Mahayana's teaching declares that these human Buddhas are reflexes of counterparts of the superhuman Buddhas, so that the difference is not great. Mahayanist Buddhism in Cambodia, and at a later period in Java itself, was inextricably combined with Hinduism, Buddha being either directly identified with Siva or regarded as the primordial spirit from which Siva and all gods spring, but the sculptures of Borobodor do not indicate that the artist knew of any such amalgamation, nor have inscriptions been found there. As in Cambodia, which explained this compound theology, 
it would seem that Buddhism and Brahmanism coexisted in the same districts, but had not yet begun to fuse doctrinally. The same condition seems to have prevailed in Western India during the 7th and 8th centuries. For the Buddhist caves of Ellora, though situated in the neighborhood of Brahmanic buildings and approximating to them in style, contain sculptures which indicate a purely Buddhist cultus and not a mixed pantheon. Our meager knowledge of Javanese history makes it difficult to estimate the spheres and relative strength of the two religions. In the plains, the Buddhist monuments are more numerous and also more ancient, and we might suppose that the temples of Prambanan indicate the beginning of some change in belief. But the temples on the Dieng Plateau seem to be of about the same age as the oldest Buddhist monuments. Thus, nothing refutes this supposition that Brahmanism existed in Java from the time of the first Hindu colonists and that Buddhism was introduced after 400 AD. It may be that Borobudur and the Dieng Plateau represent the, the religious centers of two different kingdoms, but this supposition is not necessary for in India. Once the Javanese received their ideas, groups of temples are found of the same age but belonging to different sects. Thus, in the Kadraho group, some shrines are Jain, and of the rest, some are dedicated to Siva and some to Vishnu. The earliest records of Javanese Brahmanism, the inscriptions of Purnavarman, are Vishnuite, but the Brahmanism, which prevailed in the 8th and 9th centuries, was in the main Sivite, Though not of a strongly sectarian type, Brahma, Vishnu, and Siva were all worshipped both at Prampanan and on the Dieng, but Siva, together with Ganes, Ganesa, Durga, and Nandi, is evidently the chief deity. An image of Siva in the form of Batara Guru or Maha Guru is installed in one of the shrines at Prampanan. This deity is characteristic of Javanese Hinduism and apparently peculiar to it. He is represented as an elderly bearded man wearing a richly ornamented costume. There is something in the pose and drapery which recalls Chinese art, and I think the figure is due to Chinese influence. For at the present day, many of the images found in the temples of Bali are clearly imitated from Chinese models, or perhaps made by Chinese artists, and this may have been happened in earlier times. The Chinese annals record several instances of religious objects being presented by the emperors to Javanese princes. Though Batara Guru is only an aspect of Siva, he is currently distinct personality to have a shrine of his own like Ganesa and Durga, in temples where the principal image of Siva is of another kind. The same type of Brahmanism lasted at least until the erection of Panataran, circa 1150. The temple appears to have been dedicated to Siva, but like Prambanan, it is ornamented with scenes from the Ramayana and from Vishnuite Puranas. The literature, which can be definitely assigned to the reigns of Jab Jajabaja, and Erlanga is Brahmanic in tone, but both literature and monuments indicate that somewhat later there was a revival of Buddhism. Something similar appears to have happened in other countries. In Cambodia, the inscriptions of Jaya Varman, the 7th, circa 1185 AD, are more definitely Buddhist than those of his predecessors. And in 1296, Cho Taklan regarded the country as mainly Buddhist. Parakrama Bahu Ceylon, 1153 to 1186, was zealous for the faith, and so were several kings of Siam. Siam. I am inclined to think that this movement was a consequence of the flourishing condition of Buddhism at Pagan in Burma from 1050 to 1250. Pagan certainly simulated religion both Siam and Ceylon. 
and Siam reacted strongly on Cambodia. It is true that the later Buddhism of Java was by no means of the Siamese type, but probably the idea was current and that the great kings of the world were pious Buddhists and consequently, in most countries, the local form of Buddhism, whatever it was, began to be held in esteem. Java had constant communication with Cambodia and Champa, and a king of Majapahit married a princess of the latter country. It is also possible that a direct stimulus may have been received from India for the statement of Taranatha that when Bihar was sacked by the Mohammedans, the Buddhist teachers fled to other regions and that some of them went to Cambodia is not improbable. But though the prestige of Buddhism increased in the 13th century, no rupture with Brahmanism took place, and Pali Buddhism does not appear to have entered Java. The unity of the two religions is proclaimed. Buddha and Siva are one. But the Kama Hayanikan, while admitting the Trimurti, makes it a dry derivative, and not even a primary derivative. Of the original Buddha spirit. It has been stated that the religion of Java in the Majapahit epoch was Sivaism, with a little Buddhism thrown in. On the understanding that it was merely another method of formulating the same doctrine, it is very likely that the bulk of the population worshipped Hindu deities, for they are the gods of this world and dispense its good things. Yet the natives still speak of the old religion as Buddha Gama, the old times, or Buddha times. And even the flights of stairs leading up to the Dieng Plateau are called Buddha steps. This would hardly be so if in the Majapai epoch, Buddha had not seemed to be the most striking figure in the non Mohammedan religion. Also, the majority of religious works which have been survived from this period are Buddhist. It is true that we have the Ramayana, the Bharata Yuta, and many other specimens of Brahmanic literature. But these, especially in their Javanese dress, are be belle lettre rather than theology, whereas Kamahayanikan and Kunjarakarna are dogmatic treatises. Hence, it would appear that the religious life of Majapahit was rooted in Buddhism but a most tolerant Buddhism, which had no desire to repudiate Brahmanism. <clears throat> I have already briefly analyzed the Sankhyang Kamahayanikan, which seems to be the most authoritative exposition of this creed. The learned editor has collected many parallels from Tibetan and Nepalese works, and similar parallels between Javanese and Tibetan Iconograph iconography, which have been indicated by Plate and others. The explanation must be that the late forms of Buddhist art and doctrine, which nourished in Mag Magadha, spread to Tibet and Nepal, but were also introduced into Java. The Kamaha Yanikan appears to be a paraphrase of a Sanskrit original, perhaps distorted and mutilated. This original has not been identified with any work known to exist in India. Might as well be a Mahayana's catechism compared there are about the 11th, composed there are about the 11th century. The terminology of the treatise is peculiar, particularly in calling the ultimate principle Advaya and the more personal manifest, manifestation of it Divarupa. The former term may be paralleled in Himakandra and the Amara Kosha, which give respectively as synonyms for Buddha, Advaya, in whom is no duality, and Advayavadin, who preaches no duality, but Divarupa has not been found in any other work.
It is remarkable that the Kamahayanikan does not teach the doctrine of the three bodies of Buddha. It clearly states that the Deva Rupa is identical with the highest being worshipped by various sects. With Paramasunya, Paramasiva, the Purusha of the followers of Kapila, the near Guna of the Vishnuites, etc. Many names of sects and doctrines are mentioned which remained obscure, but the desire to represent them all as essentially identical is obvious. <clears throat> The Kamahayanikan recognizes the theoretical identity of the highest principles in Buddhism and Vishnuism, but it does not appear that Vishnu Buddha was ever a popular conception like Siva Buddha or that the compound deity called Siva Vishnu, Harihara, Sankara, Narayana, etc., so well known in Cambodia, enjoyed much honor in Java. Vishnu is relegated to a distinctly secondary position. And the Javanese version of the Mahabharata is more distinctly Sivite than the Sanskrit text. Still, he has a shine at Prambanan. The story of the Ramayana is depicted there. And at Panataran, in various unedited manuscripts, contain allusions to his worship, more especially to his incarnation as Narasimha and the Garuda on which he rides. <coughs> Part 8. At present, nearly all the inhabitants of Java profess Islam, although the religion of a few tribes, such as the Tengaris, is still a mixture of Hinduism with, indi with indigenous beliefs. But even among nominal Muslims, some traces of the older creeds survive. On festival days, such monuments as Borobudur and Prambanan are frequent are frequented by crowds who, if they offer no worship, at least take pleasure in examining the ancient statues. <clears throat> Some of these, however, receive more definite honors. They are painted red, and modest offerings of flowers and fruit are laid before them. Yet the respect shown to particular images seems due not to old tradition, but to modern and wrong-headed interpretations of their meaning. Thus, at Borobodor, the relief, which represents the good tortoise saving a shipwrecked crew, receives offerings from women because the small figures on the tortoise's back are supposed to be children. The minor forms of Indian mythology still flourish. All classes believe in the existence of Raksasas. Bodhas, Buddhas, and Viradharis, Vidyadharis, who are regarded as spirits similar to the jinns of the Arabs. Lakshmi survives in the female genius believed even by rigid Mohammedans to preside over the culta cultiva cultivation of rice and the somewhat disreputable sect known as Santri Virahis are said to adore Devas and the forces of nature. Less obvious, but more important as more deeply affecting the national character is the tendency towards mysticism and asceticism. What is known as Gemmo plays a considerable part in religious life of the modern Javanese. The word is simply the Arabic in or knowledge used in the sense of secret science. It sometimes signifies mere magic, but the higher forms of it, such as the Gilmo Peling, are said to teach that the contemplative life is the way to the knowledge of God and the attainment of supernatural powers. With such Gilmo, it is, is often connected a belief in metempsychosis, in the illusion, in the illusory nature of the world and in the efficiency of regulating the breath, asceticism is still known under the name of tapa. And it is said 
that there are many recluses who live on alms and spend their time in meditation. The affinity of all this to Indian religion is obvious, although the Javanese have no idea that it is in any way incompatible with Orthodox Islam. Indian religion, which in Java is represented merely by the influence of the past on the present, is not dead in Bali, where, though much mixed with aboriginal superstitions, it is still a distinct and national faith able to behold its own against Mohammedanism and Christianity. The island of Bali is divided from the east coast of Java only by a narrow strait but the inhabitants possess certain characters of their own. They are more robust in build. Their language is distinct from Javanese, though belonging to the same group, and even the alphabet presents idiosyncrasies. Their laws, social institutions, customs, and calendar show many peculiarities, explicable on the supp supposition that they have preserved the ancient usages of pre mohammedan Java. At present, the population is divided into the Bali Agas, or Aborigines, and the Wong Majapahi, who profess to have immigrated from that kingdom. The Chinese references to Bali seem uncertain, but, if accepted, indicate that it was known in the Middle Ages as a religious center. It was probably a colony and dependency of Majapahi, and when Majapahi fell, it became a refuge for those who are not willing to accept Islam. <clears throat> Caste is still a social institution in Bali, five classes being recognized, namely Brahmans, Kshatriyas, Satriyas, Vaisyas, Visyas, Sudras, and Pariyas. These distinctions are rigidly observed <clears throat> and though intermarriage, which in former times was often punished with death, is now permitted, <clears throat> the offspring are not recognized as belonging to the caste of the superior parent. The bodies of the dead are burned, and sati, which was formerly frequent, is believed still to take place in noble families. Pork is the only meat used. And as in other Hindu countries, oxen are never slaughtered. An idea of the Balinese religion may perhaps be given the most easily by describing some of the temples. These are very abundant. In the neighborhood of Boileling, the capital, alone, I have seen more than ten of considerable size. As buildings, they are not ancient, for the stone used in soft and does not last much more than 50 years. But when the edifices are rebuilt, the ancient shape is preserved, and what we see in Bali today probably represents the style of the Middle Ages. The temples consist of two or more courts surrounded by high walls. Worship is performed in the open air. There are various pyramids, seats, and small shrines like dovacots but no halls or rooms. The gates are ornamented with the heads of monsters, especially lions with large ears and wing-like expansions at the side. The outermost gate has a characteristic shape. It somewhat resembles an Indian gopuram divided into two parts by a sharp, clean cut in the middle. In tradition quotes and explanation, the story of a king who was refused entrance to heaven but cleft a passage through the portal with his sword. In the outer court stand various sheds and hollow wooden cylinders, which when struck give a sound like bells. Another ornamented doorway leads to the second court, or are found some or all of the following objects. A. Sacred trees, especially ficus elastica. B. Sheds with seats for human beings. It is said that on certain occasions, they are used by mediums, who become inspired by the gods, and then give oracles. C. Seats for the gods. 
generally under sheds there are various various kinds there is usually one conspicuous chair with an ornamental back and a scroll hanging behind it which bears some such inscription as this is the chair of the bahatara bahatara any deity may be invited to take the seat and receive worship sometimes a stone linga is placed upon it in some temples a stone chair called padmasana is set apart for surya d small shrines two or three feet high sit on posts or pedestals when well executed they are similar to the cabinets used in japanese temples as shrines for images but when as often happens they are roughly made they are curiously like dove cots. On them are hung strips of dried palm leaves and bunches like the Japanese gohai. gohei. As a rule, the shrines contain no image, but only a small seat and some objects said and some objects said to be stones which are wrapped in a cloth and called arje. In some temples, example given the Bali Agung at Singa, Singaraja, there are erections called Meru, supposed to represent the sacred mountain where the gods reside. They consist of a stout pedestal or bases of brick on which is erected a cabinet shrine as already described. Above this are a large round disc made of straw and wood, which may be described as curved roofs or umbrellas. They are from three to five in number and rise one above the other, with slight intervals between them. E. In many temples, for instance at Sangsi and Sawan, pyramidal erections are found either in addition to the merus or instead of them. At the end of the second court is a pyramid in four stages or terraces, often with prolongations at the side of the main structure or at right angles to it. It is ascended by several staircases, consisting of about 25 steps, and at the top are rows of cabinet shrines. Daily worship is not performed in these temples, but offerings are laid before the shrines from time to time by those who need the help of the gods, and there are several annual festivals. The object of the ritual is not to honor any image or object habitually kept in the temple, but to induce the gods, who are supposed to be hovering round like birds, to seat themselves in the chair provided or to enter into some sacred object, and then receive homage and offerings. Thus, both the ideas and ceremonial are different from those which prevail in Hindu temples, and have more affinity with Polynesian beliefs. The deities are called Dewa, but many of them are indigenous nature spirits, especially mountain spirits, such as Dewa Gunung Agung, or sometimes identified with Indian gods. Somewhat different are the Durga temples. These are dedicated to the spirits of the dead, but the images of Durga and her tenant Kaliki receive veneration in them, much as in Hindu temples. But on the whole, the Malay or Pol Polynesian element seemed to me to be in practice stronger than Hinduism in the religion of the Balinese, and this is borne out by the fact that the Pemanku, or priest of indigenous gods, ranks higher than the Pedanda, or Brahman priest. But by talking to Balinese, one may obtain a different impression, for they are proud of their connection with Majapahit and Hinduism. They willingly speak of such subjects and Hindu deities are constantly represented in works of art, Ganesha, Indra, Vishnu, Krishna, Surya, Garuda, and Siva, as well as the heroes of the Mahabharata, are well known, but I have not heard of well-known Indian gods for those who care to order them. Many Indian works such as the Veda, Mahabharata, Ramayana, Ramapurana, and Nidhi Sastra are known by name and are said to exist not in the original Sanskrit but in Kawi. I fancy that there are rarely read by the present generation.
but any knowledge of them is much respected. The Balinese, though confused in their theology, are greatly attached to their religion, and I believe it is the ancient faith of Majapahi. I was unable to discover in the neighborhood of Singaraja even such faint traces of Buddhism as have been reported by previous authors, but they may exist elsewhere. The expression Siva Buddha was known to the Pedandas, but seemed to have no living significance. And perhaps certain families have a traditional and purely nominal connection with Buddhism. In Durga temples, however, I have seen figures described as Pusa, the Chinese equivalent of Bodhisattva, and it seems the Chinese artists have reintroduced into this miscell miscellaneous pantheon an element of corrupt Buddhism, though the natives do not recognize it as such. The art of Bali is more fantastic than that of ancient Java. The carved work, whether in stone or wood, is generally polychromatic. Figures are piled on the top of another, as in the sculptures of Central America, and there is a marked tendency to emphasize projections. Leaves and flowers are very deeply carved, and such features as ears, tongues, and teeth are monstrously prolonged. Thus, Balinese statues and reliefs have a curiously bristling and scaly appearance and are apt to seem barbaric, especially if taken separately. Yet the general aspect of the temples is not unpleasing. The brilliant colors and fantastic outlines harmonize with the tropical vegetation which surrounds them and suggest that the guardian deities take shape as gorgeous insects. Such bizarre figures are not unknown in Indian mythology, but in Balinese art, Chinese influence is perhaps stronger than Indian. The Chinese probably frequented the island as early as the Hindus, and are now found there in abundance. Besides, the statues called Pusa already mentioned, Chinese landscapes are often painted behind the seats of the Divas, and in the temple of the volcano Batur, where special places assigned to all the Balinese tribes, the Chinese have their own shrine. It is said that the temples in southern Bali, which are older and larger than those in the north, show even more decided signs of Chinese influence and are surrounded by stone figures of Chinese as guardians. End of section 11. Recording by Pink Rose 7. Morganville, New Jersey.